the live stream or just hit the gavel and I'm good to go. Good morning, everyone. I call to order the May 8, 2023 special meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. I am delighted to be at the interview stage of the interim president search. Welcome back to our fourth meeting in the West Committee room. A reminder that this room has room wide microphones. They allow any speaker to be heard both in the room and on the live stream. As such, please take care with side conversations. The Zoom audio feed will pick up all audio from the room. That said, if you are a soft talker or speaker, please be sure to speak up so those across the room can easily hear you. I will note that Regent Turner is connected via Zoom. Good morning, Regent Turner. And Regent Talrabi will be joining us in the afternoon, but will be watching videos of this morning's interviews so that she is ready for our deliberations. I initially want to thank everyone who uh, sent in emails, letters uh, into either our portal or to us directly or made uh, left voicemails for us in the board office. That input is critical to us and so much appreciated by all of us. So thank you very much to the community at large for participating with us in this process. I recognize it's not the process that we will use with the permanent search where we will have various constituencies and stakeholders specifically on the search committee and representing their particular interests. But I think in this situation, we did what we could do to gather your input and it's appreciated by everyone. I know that I listened to everything, read everything, and I'm confident that my colleagues did as well. Today we will interview four finalists selected by the board for the position of the interim president. Vice Chairs Hipsch and Kenyanya, and I appreciate your input on the interview questions we will use today. We will ask, we will each ask one of the prepared questions. If others who are not the questioner on a particular question would like further clarification on a finalist response to a question or have a brief follow-up I would ask that you raise your hand and I will call on you. As we learned during our training with OHR staff on Thursday, it is important that we follow the guide, the interview guide to ensure fairness and consistency among all of our candidates. When it comes to the questions we would like the finalists to address, now is not the time for paraphrasing or ad-libbing. It is also critically important that each of us listen closely and that we take careful notes throughout the interviews and not simply rely on generalizations or our memory. As you will see, I believe our notes will be very helpful to all of us in focusing and informing our deliberations later this afternoon. During our discussions later this afternoon, I'd encourage you to frame your thoughts in terms of affirmative attributes that draw you to a particular finalist over another. I say this in recognition of the highly public nature of this process. Ultimately, we want to be respectful to the tremendous pool of finalists who have offered to lead the university during this critical time. We've allocated 90 minutes to interview each finalist, and it's important that we adhere to that limit. Our schedule gives us 15 minutes after each interview to summarize our notes and to prepare for the next candidate. The first finalist is Jeff Ettinger, followed by Myron Franz, then Mary Holtz Claus, and then E. Thomas Sullivan. After the first two interviews, we will recess for a brief lunch break. And then after lunch, we will reconvene to interview the remaining two finalists. We will then debrief the interviews as a group. Hopefully our discussion will find us coalescing around a lead finalist. At that point, I will entertain a motion that that finalist be our next interim president using the language of the resolution in our docket. With that, are there any questions by my colleagues here today before we begin the interview? Yes, 
Regent Birkin. Madam Chair, as uh, Regent Tagliarabe is not here until this afternoon, will you be asking her questions? Yes, I will. Great. I will be asking her questions. And let me also say, uh, at the end of our interview uh, using our questions, hopefully there will be time to allow the candidate to ask us questions. And initially, I will, I'm going to manage that process. So I may take a stab at it, or I may say, would somebody else like to respond to the question? Not knowing what it is, I, it's hard to know who it would be best directed to. But in any event, we'll start with me managing it and then go from there. And hopefully, we will have time. But just so for everyone's um, sake, we are on a tight time schedule. And if we end up using all 90 minutes, with the candidate answering our questions, then we will not have time to answer theirs. So time is keeping time is important. And our executive director will be here to assist me in that. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, then if we could bring in our first candidate who is Jeffrey Ettinger. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I just want to thank you all for inviting me this morning, but also for this process. I mean, I know you had to kind of make it up on the fly, but it's been very professional. And I really appreciate the interaction I've had with the staff. They've been just so on the ball with any questions we've had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. The board has a series of questions prepared for our time together today. Each uh, candidate received the same set of questions from the board. And as you know, if there's sufficient time at the end of, end of the interview, we will give you an opportunity to ask questions. And I understand we also made those questions available to you over the weekend, so there shouldn't be any surprises as to what it is we want to ask. We want to give each candidate the opportunity to think about it and give us their best response and certainly not on the fly. So with that, I will get us started with the very first question. And that is this. Jeff, if you can tell us what specifically interests you about the interim president role at this moment, and what do you see as one key strength that you would bring to this role? Oh, very good. I mean, I'll start with the fact that our family has deep ties to the university. We're really a gopher family, I think. My wife's parents attended here in the 1950s. Uh, my wife Leanne is a graduate in 1980. All four of our children have degrees from the institution here, three undergrad and one law degree. Both of our son-in-laws graduated from the University of Minnesota. Indeed, when Dean Zahir called me back in 2016 when I was approaching retirement from Hormel Foods and offered me the chance to be an executive fellow in the, at the Carlson School, I kind of jumped at the opportunity because it gave me a chance to at least have a little bit of credit within the family that I have a University of Minnesota connection there. And, and I really enjoyed being able to do that. Since retiring, what I've tried to focus on is looking for ways to provide service to our community, to our state in various aspects. And clearly the Carlson experience is one way to have done that. Had the opportunity to co-teach with Professor Mark Bergen over a four year time frame, two years of which that we created a food and agribusiness course for MBA students and the other two within his pricing class. I did that on a volunteer basis. Uh, as we were all confronted with the COVID challenges, um, I was asked by the governor's office to work in a couple of areas. One related to right off the bat to food supply chain security, to making sure that, you know, in this unprecedented challenge that we maintained the flow of groceries to, to consumers. And I think we were able to do that. Uh, I was then asked to serve on the hospitality roundtable. So to work with folks from the restaurant industry, bar, hotel, resorts, and so forth. And that was a very challenging time. And sometimes those are very contentious discussions. And I, I tried to be a, a middle person, tried to be somebody trying to find moderate solutions to those challenges. Uh, and then the governor asked me to be the co-chair of his uh, economic expansion council. And that was another chance. I would love in this respect to be have a chance to be of service to the U. I think the interim president role clearly is a bridge role. And I think I could bring some skills and talents to that bridge role. I was really interested as I listened to your meetings, the whole dialogue on caretaker versus change agent that you discussed. And 
totally understand that you're not looking for a change agent, particularly in an interim role. But I wanted to think about the caretaker aspect of it when I think about what would be confronting us over the next several months. Clearly, there is the whole keep the train running aspect of it, and that, I think, is more of a caretaker role. I have ran a big, complex organization. Uh, our, we had over 20,000 employees and an annual budget of $9 billion, which are not far off from where the university's numbers are in that regard. I dealt with sensitive personnel matters. I, I've had lots of experience talking with the media of all different types. I've reported to a board for years, and I've been involved in government relations in those roles. Uh, I think it was also pointed out by a couple of the regions that, okay, no matter how much you just kind of want to keep the train running, there are going to be challenges that occur over the next 12 month period that we don't anticipate right now and we, and we need to be able to address. I would like to be an agent of continuity and progress toward the university's impact 2025 goals. Uh, I recognize that when you're dealing with a big organization that big ships turn slowly. <laughs> And so it's an ocean liner, not a jet ski. And so you, you've set the course and we need to keep heading toward the course. There may be things that come up where we need to tap the wheel a little bit over the next 12 months and I'd be prepared to do that. There is one area though that I do think the university would benefit from more of a reset. And this is a reset with the public. I, I think the public does not fully understand all the great things that are going on at the university. And I'm certainly prepared to be a proponent of telling that story as often as possible. I think we all need to understand, however, that's not just a one-way PR role. Going out and talking to people means listening to people and understanding what their side is as well. And I would offer that I think that would be easier for a person who's outside of the current university environment to do. I think people might have a little more trust or open, open themselves up more to someone who comes from outside. The key strength I would offer in this area is that I think I'm a bridge builder. Um, at Hormel Foods, I worked obviously with multiple stakeholders over the years. Um, and one particular area that I, I focused on in terms of bridge building when I was at Hormel Foods related to our union relationships. I mean, for a long time, Hormel is sort of known as the company with from the, of the 1980s strike. I arrived in Austin in 1989. Uh, so after the, the strike was over from a standpoint of, okay, it had been resolved from a worker standpoint, but it was not resolved within the community of Austin. It, it is, was still you know, brother versus brother. That's a union pizza place. That's a management pizza place. And that backdrop, I mean, it just really made an impression on me and was something that if I ever had a leadership chance in the company, that I was going to make sure we were not going to be back in those modes. And so when I was offered the position of CEO of Hormel Foods in 2006, I really made an effort to build bridges with the USCW, with the, their leadership and with the workers. And I think I was able to do that. Um, it came up quite a bit during my congressional campaign last year. You go through screening interviews and I, I was endorsed ultimately by a number of the unions, Education Minnesota, the Minnesota AFL-CIO, the National Farmers Union, the Sheet Metal Workers. And one of the articles about the campaign, uh, the UFCW representative was quoted as saying, Jeff was always responsive to the workers in the town. And I'm proud that that's the net impression that I was, was left. As the Hormel Foundation, um, I certainly try to lead the board from a broad participation standpoint. Our board literally are the agencies of the community, and so I ask them to go out and make sure they're hearing from other folks. And then as a candidate I had mentioned earlier, I really ran as somebody looking to reduce polarization, looking to work across the aisle and get results. I also think finally that the duration of this role would lend itself to this area of emphasis. I think we can move the needle quite a bit in 12 months in this regard. Thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to ask my colleague, Regent Davenport, to ask the next question. Good morning, Mr. Ettinger. As a large, complex organization, the university faces many complicated and multifaceted issues, including such things as the cost of attendance, employee wages and benefits, public safety, and many others. At times, a solution for one issue puts pressure on another. Please provide an example of where you had to address a complex issue. What was it? What made it complex? And how did you approach it? And what was the outcome? 
Well, I mean, it, it, it's very reminiscent to me of some of the things I I'd had the opportunity to go through in the, in the business environment. I mean, you're, you are making trade-offs with, okay, consumers or customers want low prices. Our employees want better wages and benefits. Our shareholders want higher profits. And oh, by the way, in all during that, you need to be a good corporate citizen. You need to be watching, looking for sustainability. You need to be looking for safety and those types of things. I think the question does raise some important challenges facing the U right now. Uh, affordability to me is critical for maintaining inclusivity. Uh, I also would point out though that affordability really to me relates to value. So it's not just the cost, it's what they're getting for the cost and, and to make sure the university continues to deliver well in that regard. I think the University of Minnesota is not alone in being under pressure to maintain a sustainable economic model. And there may well be things we need to look at over the next 12 months that relate to against maybe steering a ship slowly in a different direction toward making sure that monetarily the university survives. And I'm really glad to see, for example, the peak initiative that's already in place that was put in place by the regents here. Employee wages and benefits are always an important area, especially honestly in this area of inflation, this inflationary environment we're in. So all the more reason that needs to be addressed. And safety clearly needs to be at the forefront. We, we owe that to our students. Their parents are very keenly interested in this as well. I know there's initiatives already in place and would, would love to make sure we continue to make progress in those. Uh, you asked for the example. So the example I'm gonna provide was uh, when I, Went up to Genio at Wilmer back in 2000. I was named the president of the organization. And about a year into it, we ended up making an acquisition of a company called the Turkey Store in Barra in Wisconsin. Um, we were involved in assessing the deal from a kind of a strategy standpoint, but otherwise that was sort of a corporate thing. It went by, it was Hormel was doing the negotiating. We really weren't even sure how it was going. And then one day kind of got the phone call, okay, the deal's done. Um, you're, you're, you're coming together, it's going to be a blend. We're going to merge these two cultures and there really isn't an integration plan. That's up to you guys to figure out the integration plan. And you're now going to be the co-CEO with the head of the turkey store. So those were you know, different things to, to, to relate to. And, and, but honestly, I think we went at it with a great spirit of, it's not, it's not about the old Genio, it's not about the old turkey store, it's about the new Genio turkey store and what can we do to make it the strongest as possible. How do you blend two organizations and cultures? Uh, we tried to be fast, fair, and frugal. We had a whole laundry list of things we were going to address, and very early on had to make a shift in course because we realized, you know, for, we had decided, okay, we have to make some personnel decisions. We had a head of sales of a certain area for both companies. We had a head of R&D for both companies. And we had initially put that, you know, maybe that would be the sixth or seventh thing we were going to get to. Well, what we found was there was like complete paralysis that set in. I mean, if people don't know, you know what, if they're on board or what their role is going to be, it's just very difficult to get things done. So we accelerated that, we moved that up, we made those decisions and we tried to make them on a fair basis. We worked extensively with the communities of both Wilmer and Barron to really let them know, okay, well, here's, here's how this is gonna sort out and what would be the impact to your communities. Ultimately, I think the outcome was excellent. We, we created a collegial team. We became the leading player in the turkey industry by leveraging what was really the best of both. Um, Jerry Jerome, who was my co-CEO, ended up retiring after a couple of years. And so for my last couple of years at now Genio Turkey Store, I became, was back to being the sole leader. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Regent Farnsworth, if you would ask the third question. Yes, good morning. Good morning. The president delegates a significant portion of the strategic management of the university to a team of senior leaders and others. Tell us about a time when you successfully developed and convened a team of leaders or experts to implement a strategic objective. What was the objective? Who were the leaders involved? Describe how you developed the team as well as any challenges you faced and what steps did you take to overcome those challenges and what was the outcome of their work? I promise I'm not going to use only Hormel examples, but I do need to use another one here. Um, so what? So during my time as CEO at Hormel Foods, uh, the team and I looked at the company and felt that, you know, we needed to kind of consider a strategic change in direction for Hormel Foods to position it as a contemporary food company. And we kind of had, we were a meat packer. That was our heritage and certainly was still an important element of the company. But when you looked at our product line, we were known by consumers for processed meats and canned foods, and those were gonna to continue to be part of 
the portfolio, but where else could we logically branch and serve consumers? So we, you know, we felt we needed to grow through innovation. We needed to grow through acquisitions. On the innovation side, what we we ended up we established measurements. I did that first at Genio and then also at Hormel, where, okay, how much are our sales each year of new products? What's what kind of goals should we have in place? We had not measured those previously, and it really helps, honestly, to measure and set goals and hold yourself against goals. At least we found. We thought it was also important to have both centralized in addition to divisional capabilities when it came to innovation. So if you're a product manager, yes, you, you need to be thinking about that also. But we had a company-wide group that would maybe be looking into new areas that weren't right down the, the, the center of where somebody already was working. We assembled multifunctional teams. We had consumer insights involved. We had our, our D group. We had operations and engineering looking at what was capable. We had our marketing group, accounting, obviously, in terms of those measurements as well. And innovation required investments. We invested in a new pilot plant at Genio and new R&D capabilities at Hormel as well. In the area of growing through acquisitions, we were confronted you know, fairly early on with the notion that there was a, a fairly major portfolio. The Sarah Lee company was breaking into pieces, and they had this entity called Hilshire Brands that had Jimmy Dean and Hilshire and Ballpark and some of those items. And, Armel was being listed, oh, this should be a logical, you should be a logical company to be a buyer of this. And we decided, no, we're not, we're not even going to participate in that. Because to us, that was more of the same. That was going to be more traditional process meat items. So instead, we created an internal team that had attorneys, accountants, financial experts, R&D, brought in some outside consultants as well, and really thought about logical areas that we could extend our protein world to, to get and to get into other food areas. One other thing when we started working on M&A projects that we also realized in terms of utilizing your team properly is there's you need to have a balance between confidentiality and doing a thorough job on due diligence. And I think in the early days, we kind of erred toward the confidentiality. We better only four people better know about this. But we found we made a couple of mistakes in terms of things we should have found out by not having the right expert involved during the due diligence process. So it's still not, it can't be a free for all. You can't have absolutely everybody involved, but you do need to have more people involved in that regard. Um, a couple of the major deals we did, we ended up uh, buying the Skippy brand. Uh, that was a complex deal in that they had business in China as well as in the US and plants in both locations. We felt that that was a great chance to get into value-added protein that was non-meat-based and, and ex expand our, our portfolio in the consumer area. And then we and that was a $700 million transaction. Uh, we also acquired the Applegate Farms business, so uh, organic, natural, antibiotic-free products in a very different culture, a very different consumer proposition. We were very careful in talking. I, I had personal meetings with the founder to talk about, okay, what do we need to safeguard to make sure that what you built here and the consumer trust that you built is maintained? Because there's going to be maybe some suspicion or, or concern that, oh, Hormel, this, this big, more traditional ag company would own that. And I think we were able to do that. We also restructured a joint venture we had uh, in the Mexican food area. We now have two partners from Mexico there, and that led to significant growth. Ultimately, all these items were you know, reasonably successful. Our, our company did do well during the tenure of our team. Um, our stock ended up tripling, and we shared in that growth with all of our employees through profit sharing each year and through a universal stock option grant. Uh, I would conclude by tying this in, I think, to what you have going on with the Fairview Sanford uh, transaction, that again, that's an area that you really, we probably can't just be a caretaker. Something has to give, it seems like, over this next 12 months. But I understand that the role of a president in these kind of deals and the same role I played in transactions at Hormel is you're not the point person. You are a steady behind the scenes force. There may be times you're asked to talk to someone else on the other side or weigh that with the team potential trade-offs, but you just you don't come in and take over. There is a great professional group who knows that area best to do that. Thank you very much. Our next question uh, is by uh, Regent Gully. Thank you. Good morning. The president leads a public institution that relies on deep legislative and community relationships. Describe a time when you had to navigate complex legislative or community issues. How did you go about building relationships with key legislative or community stakeholders to ensure the outcome met your organization's 
I'd like, if, I, if I can, I think I can fit it in. I'll, I'll try to give you an example both in the legislative area and in the community area. On the legislative side, um, clearly as part of my general duties, I, I was in St. Paul and DC, in Washington, D.C. frequently um, representing the company. I've testified before Congress before. The example I want to provide, though, is with the Hormel Foundation and, and specifically with the Hormel Institute. Um, a lot of folks, even within our community of Austin, get tangled up in all, all these Hormel names and which is which. It's like, okay, there's the company, Hormel Foods. There is an entity called the Hormel Foundation that our founders created in the early 1940s to safeguard the company from outside takeovers, but also most primarily to benefit the local community, to provide a source of funds for projects within the community. And one of the very primary sources for that was, is an entity called the Hormel Institute. Basic research conducted that has over the years shifted to a cancer research emphasis and that has always been a wonderful partnership with the University of Minnesota. Our, the employees within that facility that right next door to the corporate office in Austin are University of Minnesota employees. Uh, we had a good work going on in the, in the place. We had an older facility. And so back in the late 2000s, we undertook the notion of trying, let's see if we can expand this. And it's complicated. It's, you know, we needed to work with the university. We needed to work with the state government. We needed to work with the federal side. We ended up getting Mayo Clinic involved with, as a partner, at least for part of a few of the labs within the facilities. And so over the years, we've ended up with two uh, expansions of the facility. Uh, the board was invited down there. I'm not sure if any of the current board members were on the board at that time. I think it's five or six years ago that the board actually was in Austin and had a chance to have one of their meetings at the Hormel Institute. But ultimately, working with all those different players, we were able to put the Institute in a much stronger position as a research pillar for the university and for our community. On the community side, um, I led a group early on when I became CEO of the company on a trip to DC, uh, you know, not as an advocate for specific Hormel issues, but as an advocate for immigration reform. I, I traveled with our former mayor, a priest, the head of our welcome center, and the head of our diversity program at our community college. And it was at a little window, honestly, when it looked like it actually might happen. I mean, it was we were talking to senators from both sides of the aisle and getting good receptions on it. At that time, the president was ready to sign legislation, but as happened as has happened so many times, it, it got blocked in the House and, and, not, and sadly didn't end up going anywhere. The other specific uh, example I want to provide, uh, Regent Gully, would be the Austin Community Understanding. And I did write about this in my materials, but for the benefit of those looking, uh, watching today, and just to kind of reiterate it to the board. So in the aftermath of the terrible tragedy with George Floyd, and then three months later, in the town of Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is a nuts, town of 20,000, small town, very similar to Austin. And you had the, the incident that night with the vigilante taking uh, three people's lives. And we looked at that and said, you know, these are terrible things that are happening. Are there things that we can do as a community when you're not in the middle of something, when you're not in the middle of the incident, when you can, can you get ahead of it and think about how would we want to handle this? And so, you know, in our, as, as chair of the Hormel Foundation, that's one of the roles we have is we can be a convener, we can be a listener. And so we established listening sessions within the community, invited folks of all different ages and backgrounds and, and asked to be the listeners, the police chief, the sheriff, the mayor, the head of our welcome center. And I think we, we ended up having very productive sessions, back and forth drafts with, with the group and ultimately came up with the Austin community understanding, which is that we support the right of people to protest. We don't support the right of people to riot and injure others and injure property. And we need to make those distinctions when, 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 you know, in ahead, ahead of time that we expect our law enforcement professionals to have a plan in place that would not rely on armed citizens, not rely on vigilantes, but would rely on neighboring communities, and they indeed do have that in place. And that ultimately, the key is mutual respect. It's that the, our law enforcement professionals need in their encounters with people to be respectful, and that we need to be respectful of the difficult job that our law enforcement professionals have. Ultimately, these were adopted by both the Austin City Council and the county board on, on a unanimous basis. So it's an iterative process of listening. And to me, I, I, that's how I see the interim president position working. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Ettinger. Our fifth question will be uh, directed to you by Regent Hipsch. Uh, good morning, Mr. Ettinger. The university senior leaders rarely act unilaterally. How do you ensure that those on a team or across an organization feel heard and valued during the decision-making process? And could you share an example of a situation where you effectively incorporated multiple perspectives to arrive at a successful outcome? I think honestly, you develop a reputation for being a listener or not. And I think this is especially true if you're in a senior role, because I think it's easy for senior people to shut people down or to have a very narrow set of people that everyone knows, okay, that's the group that that person listens to. Uh, as a leader in my business role jobs, I specifically asked for senior team input outside of their own area. I said, look, you're, you're not here in our team to be the secretary of like a cabinet, secretary of HR, or secretary of R&D, where the only time you talk is if an R&D topic comes up. I want everyone to weigh in on a broad array. We need to be doing this together. I, I, you certainly are seeking consensus, and we I think most of the time we're able to reach that. The, where decisions have to be made, but where not everybody agrees. I think it's also, you need to be careful not to only listen to the senior leaders, but in doing that, you need to be sensitive that there is a hierarchy within any organization, that if, if I go and talk to one of Robin's employees, that I need, to, I need to let her know I'm doing it, I need to let her know that it's fine if she checks in on that, but that I do wanna be out and hearing other points of views. I do, I, honestly, as I head into think about this the job of interim president, to me, it would be very helpful, the fact that the university has a shared governance perspective, because I think that provides avenues of that input on, on a very regular basis. And I'll speak a little more about that, because we have a later question that specifically asks about shared governance. The example I'm going to provide is the Governor's Council on Economic Expansion. Um, I served as the co-chair on that organization with Paul Williams. Uh, there were 15 members selected, very diverse group in terms of backgrounds, professional areas, and so forth. And we also had three of the commissioners who met with us on a regular basis. Um, we were assigned with, we had nine months total, <laughs> and there were two parts to the project, both with tight timelines. Uh, for both parts, we did extensive outreach. We had we had listening sessions that, that really devoted exclusively in the early parts of the meetings to making sure we were hearing from community leaders, making sure we we're hearing from experts and other folks. As you have with your portal, we had a portal system that the state put up as well, where we were able to attain that kind of input. Um, for the first part of it, it was really the full board did that. By the time we had kind of had our feet under us and had time to, to get going for the second part, we were able to kind of create some more subcommittees and drive some of the results that way. Uh, Paul and I met often with the three commissioners and the very talented staff that the state had offered us outside of the meetings to make sure that we're making progress, that we're using experts on facilitation, and that we're not pushing for votes within our group until everyone is heard. Uh, ultimately, the outcome was that we met both of the goals within the timelines. Our initial December was to prioritize budget recommendations for ARP funds for the government, and we did provide those. And ultimately, we provided a roadmap for equitable economic expansion, uh, also within the time frame. All right, thank you very much. Our next question uh, will be from Regent Ruth Johnson. Good morning, Mr. Edinger. Ask you about boards. Tell us about your experience working with boards, particularly a public board. What is your understanding of how a public and private boards and their organizations uh, and the organizations they serve differ? And what steps have you taken to develop and maintain a good working relationship with the board? Give us an example when you introduced a concept or proposal to a board and the board was not supportive and what steps did you take? You. I mean, I've had extensive experience, honestly, on many kinds of boards, so public corporations, uh, which are subject to SEC and New York Stock Exchange rules in many cases. I've been on trade association boards where your role as a board member, you have to kind of sort through, well, okay, I'm there to represent the entity I came from, but you also need to be thinking about the industry more at large and, and trade those off. I've been on private entity boards, our local nursing home board, the Hormel Foundation up here in the cities with Better Futures, Minnesota. 
uh, there to me, you're, you're representing the cause as much as anything. Um, the University of Minnesota board, the regents here is really is different from those boards I've served on. And I recognize that it's, it's really more what, like my wife, Leanne, when she served on the school board in New London Spicer, when we lived up in that community, you were doing the work of the public. You were appointed by the public. She was elected directly, but you, you know, with, with our system here in the state of Minnesota, it's not just one elected official, the governor that put you in place. It is the breadth of the legislature that weighed in and put each one of you in place. So you, so you definitely have that responsibility to the public. And just even your meetings, as I've listened in on the sessions, you know, since this process has began, it, I mean, it creates some interesting challenges. So you have to talk about candidates with letters and, and just making sure what, what you're doing is really, you know, everybody understands it. And I think on top of that, the regent's role with an interim president will be different as well. But I think all the more it's going to need to be a partnership over the next 12 or whatever months it turns out to be between your interim president choice and what goes on with this board. The example I wanna give you is I served on a board for an arts organization in the Twin Cities. Um, I was asked to serve on the board. I was really quite new to the board actually when this particular incident occurred. But So I show up to a board meeting one day and about 15 minutes into the meeting, the board chair has invited the management team to leave the room and close the doors and is saying, we're going to fire the executive director. And I asked, I mean, I thought, okay, I'm kind of the new guy, but I, I know it doesn't really feel right to me. So I'm going to speak up. I'm say, I, to me, I don't know all the issues behind it. Apparently there's a group of directors that do know the issues behind it. There really wasn't any notice about this being a topic. And this is a pretty important topic. We're missing several of our board members today. They're not, they didn't know this was coming. They're not here today. And so to me, it would be improper to proceed forward on this basis. Um, so th they did listen to that and they did delay. I have to tell you, the outcome ultimately was the same 10 days later when they did reconvene. And so what, I, what did I learn? Um, I learned on an executive, from an executive standpoint that that executive did not have, understand the pulse of the board. Didn't, had not been obviously talking to board members, did not understand where, they're, where they stood with the, that board. And I get it that it's hard in a board setting to really know the views always of all the members. I mean, you have a tight agenda, you have lots of things to cover. So I've made it a practice as an executive, as a board member, as a lead director of a board to seek ways to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with all of the board members, not on a, typical, a certain topic, not to lobby for a given vote, but just to give them a chance to talk about what's on their mind. And, and I would intend to try to do that here as well. Thank you. Our next question will be directed to you from Regent Todd Johnson. Ed Johnson. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, going, Mr. Essen, sure. Uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion are extremely important to our university. With that in mind, could you describe a couple of how you have fostered a culture of diversity and inclusion in your current or previous role. And as part of your answer, describe the programs or policies you have implemented and some challenges you have faced when promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you. I mean, I've really sought to be a proponent of diversity and inclusion all my life. Um, I grew up in Southern California. My dad was Jewish, my mother was Catholic, and they were married in the 1950s when that was not a common occurrence. Uh, we deliberately moved to the community of Pasadena because it was an integrated community with a much more welcoming, broad mindset. Uh, I went to a racially diverse public high school in Pasadena. When I came to Austin in 1990, it was kind of a shock to me because it was not what I was used to. It, at that time, it was a very homogenous, Caucasian community. But fairly soon after that, the community started changing in my view for the better. And I really tried to be part of the welcoming <coughs> effort in that regard. I've met for years with a group at Tienda Guerrero, one of our, our, our local restaurants and, and markets with Miguel Garate and, and others, uh, even from a regional basis to make sure we're doing the right thing to make our communities welcoming. At Hormel Foods, I was part of recruiting one of the most diverse boards in the United States. 
I created and chaired our first diversity and inclusion council and stayed as the chair until I retired from the company and found as many opportunities as possible to be a mentor. When I became the chair of Hormel Foundation, after retiring from Hormel Foods, uh, I looked at our board and we have 19 members and there were two women and one person of color. And so that was an immediate priority to me was that's not representing our community. We're not doing ourselves a favor in terms of the quality of information and decisions we're gonna make as a board. And so we made a priority to address that way and we have. Um, a couple of scholarship programs that I've been involved with in different roles also really are aimed at this notion of being inclusive and making sure everyone in society has a chance to participate. Uh, the Austin Assurance Scholarship created at Riverland Community College is every high school grad from Austin community has a chance to, to gain that scholarship and it really creates broadened ac access to college. And then Leanne and I have been involved with the Wallen Scholarship Program. Uh, initially here in the Twin Cities, uh, in fact, two of our first four scholars were University of Minnesota grads and, and great young people. And we had such a great experience with that. Not only are they good at you know, helping students become students at college, they have excellent counseling resources to help those students through college. And so their graduation rate is close to 90%, which is pretty outstanding for many audience. And we asked fairly early on, hey, is there any way we could bring this wall and scholarship program to our community in Austin to, to get it out to outstate Minnesota? And they agreed after we talked through the program with them uh, to, to bring it on that basis. And we've had the chance now to be involved with over 40 young men and women from our Austin community gaining those four year scholarships. The challenges, you asked about challenges, uh, Regent Johnson, and, and yes, I think we have to recognize those. Clearly, you do hear from folks who are concerned about whether promoting diversity will hurt their chances of advancing or of getting a certain job. I think it's very important to have an environment where you know, the jump, to me, the jump ball should go to the diverse candidate. It's not a matter of picking somebody who's unqualified over someone who is qualified. There are lots of people with lots of qualifications. And so that's what we would try to reemphasize back is. And, and I also point out, I mean, for all the advancements we make, I could cite all sorts of numbers within the company, within the foundation of improving. It's not like Caucasian males stopped having any opportunities. <laughs> there were plenty of uh, folks getting opportunities in that regard as well. Uh, I also would raise the concern that there, I mean, there's times the issue of when it comes to diversity can clash with free speech elements that, okay, you kind of, people can complain that, oh, I have to have this certain point of view. And I, you know, I think you have to kind of weigh that on a case by case basis. I think it's fine to have an opinion of something, but that doesn't mean that that's what the organization should do. I would offer two more points before I conclude on this question. It's the right thing to do to provide opportunities for everyone, regardless of their background. But I mean, if you look at the numbers demographically, Minnesota will not continue to thrive unless we get this right. If we don't continue to do a better job in shrinking opportunity gaps in this state in 10, 20 years, we are gonna be in, a, in big trouble. And so it, all the more reason to be supporting these types of initiatives. And then lastly, I really recognize that the university's relationship with the Native American community warrants particular attention. Thank you very much. The next question will be from our Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Mr. Edinger. Um, building and maintaining strong relationships with faculty, staff, and students is essential for a president of a large, complex, decentralized university um, that values shared governance. With that in mind, please share examples of how you've approached building relationships with various groups and stakeholders. How did you engage with each to, understands, to understand their needs and concerns? Um, there was a op-ed piece in the Star Tribune this weekend from the uh, faculty consultative committee that the headline was, the new U president should follow path on power sharing. Yes, <laughs> they absolutely, absolutely that is priority. I think it will be particularly essential for a, an interim president to act on that basis. Your mission of teaching, research, and outreach are all 
the, the faculty is central to all of those. And so, you know, a, a path forward that does not include vigorous conversations and significant input from a faculty group would, would just not be successful. I'm also excited about the opportunity to interact with students, student leaders, students just in general. That's really honestly what, what thing I probably enjoyed the most about teaching with Professor Bergen. Uh, we tried to create a very interactive class and we did receive good marks from the students in terms of you know, their reactions to our class. And also, I mean, I understand it's just one example. Uh, you know, people have a lot broader backgrounds than that. But I mean, we had, it was kind of interesting over the four years we did it. I mean, we were in person for a couple. We were fully remote. We did a we were part of the high flex hybrid classrooms at Carlson one year where half the students are on, on the screen and half of them are present. And so, you know, it, it's interesting just in terms of the continued challenges going forward. Um, in terms of examples, I'll, I'll give I'll go back to the two scholarship programs that I mentioned here a minute ago. First of all, the creation of the Austin Assurance Scholarship by the Hormel Foundation in collaboration with Riverland Community College. I mean, it seems easy, right? Just give the students money. But we spent two, three years making sure that we did this right. We worked with Riverland Community College that they were ready for the students, that they had advising resources in place. That if they, you know, that they knew what the influx would be. We work with Austin High School and Pacelli High School on the application process, on how early in a student's progress should we be telling them about this program. And indeed, you want them as soon as they hit high school to know that hey, you have a chance to go to the college here. It's going to be cost is going to be covered. You know, here are the requirements of it. Uh, the Austin Assurance Scholarship has a volunteering component as well. And so we worked with nonprofits in town. We worked with employers in town. We ultimately set up the United Way as sort of the clearinghouse for these opportunities and created an online portal so that students can, you know, students sometimes wanted to work in pairs. They want to go with their friend to something. And so we were able to, to kind of create that process. So you know, after a couple of years of making sure the thing was in place, we've launched the scholarship program. We're three years into it now. and. and Someday with our, our interest in looking at potential two plus twos out of that, that maybe some of the students who graduate from that, who were not looking for just the, the technical degree that they could get out of that, but are looking for ultimately a four year degree, could use that as their jumping off point and go from there. But the second one was uh, the talking with Wallen about expanding the outstate Minnesota. Because again, I mean, it's easy to just say, okay, just make the money available, but you, you need to work with the local schools. You need to work with their counseling staffs. You need to make sure, okay, what's the best way to reach the students so they understand what this opportunity is about. Uh, the Wallen program focuses on students who are first generation and their families. So in many cases, it, they need some added assistance in terms of filling out financial aid and knowing what the options are. And so ultimately we were able to kind of create that program and move forward on that basis. I have a follow-up question that I wanted to ask you, Mr. Enger. Um, the question that was put to you by Regent Kenyatta also addressed the, um, talked about working relationships for, with faculty, staff, and students, and to give examples. And you talked about uh, faculty and you talked about students. Um, then we have, we have an enormous uh, number of employees who fall within what we would call staff or civil service employees who support the university and without whose assistance and work, to be honest, this ship would not run. So can you give any examples where you've had, you have developed, you've de dealt with those constituencies as well? Sure. Yeah, thank you for, for the chance to expand on that. One example I can give you, um, so at Hormel Foods, I was in the product management area, um, brand manager, and then was asked to go attend an executive education program and come back to a, a job that was at that point undefined. It was like, okay, well, don't worry, there will be something here for you. The job turned out to be treasurer. Uh, so in a financial area, I had never worked in the financial area. I had never managed other managers at that point in my career. And so, you know, to me, it was going to be very important and it will be would be very important in the center and president role to get out and talk to the, the people who are day to day managing those areas to understand that they are the subject matter experts in many cases, not you. Um, one thing you can provide, though, you can sometimes be a voice for them. You can articulate and argue and push points for them on a broader basis. 
Um, so I would just try to methodically with each of the areas, get to know the people who are the incumbents in place, get to know what their priorities have been and try to figure out where I can be an advocate and, and move the ball forward with them. Thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya has a follow-up question. Yes, Regent thank, Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Edinger. Um, yeah, I appreciated the examples, you know, relating to the scholarships, you know, Riverland and, and the high school. And I think you kind of touched on this on answering the, the chair's um, question, but um, do, seeing that the breadth of your experience was at Hormel, um, do you have examples in, in, in that position of, you know, building relationships and, um, allowing staff to, to have um, input and whatnot as, as you kind of endorse the, the op-ed idea and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, I've had a career where I'm off, I've had the chance in many cases to be kind of the new person in an area. I was a lawyer who became a marketer and who then, okay, where most of the marketers were from sales and marketing. So where am I weak? sales and marketing. So I spent lots of time in the sales field. I would go, I traveled, remember going on a trip to the Southeast where my luggage never caught up with me all six days I was out. And, and so, you know, you have the chance to, to really go and try to, to do that on that basis. Uh, I mentioned moving into the financial areas, treasure, really working with the professionals in credit management and in tax and in receivables to, okay, what, what are we lacking? What can we do to be an advocate in your area? When I was offered a general management position uh, up at Genial, so that was my first general management position, I was new to the people, was new to general management, was new to that entity. I remember at times thinking, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy who grew up in Southern California and now I'm walking through turkey barns in, in rural Minnesota. Uh, and, but I, I think by working with people on a side-by-side -side basis, you, you'd have the chance to, you know, move things forward with them. And then Hormel Foods, obviously running a public company was a different role as well. And there are my areas that I didn't know as well were dealing with a board and dealing with the investment community. And so I think you, you know, I, I mentioned in my, my letter that I submitted a, a recent conversation I had with students at St. Cloud and I gave you one aspect of, of the lesson I gave them, which is kind of know the role and embrace your role. Another lesson I gave them was you really need to Address, you know, shore up and identify your weaknesses and make sure you don't know, don't ignore them, rely on others. But I think you can also do a lot with accentuating your strengths by, okay, what, what do I bring to the party here? What, what are things that I can be stronger at? And so that's how I would try to approach it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Tell Robbie would normally ask this question, but because she is tied up this morning, I'm standing in for her. Please describe a time when you were faced with an ethical dilemma in your professional career. Why was it an ethical dilemma and how did you arrive at your decision on how to handle it? What was the outcome? So I'm gonna talk about the area of animal welfare. Um, we would almost every year have requests from shareholders, specifically asking shareholders to make you know, pass certain resolutions that tended to be sponsored by entities such as PETA or the Humane Society of the United States that were, you know, not particularly friendly toward animal agriculture and had ultimately, a, you know, a vegan philosophy that would, was not totally consistent with Hormel Foods had. You know, in looking at those, however, I would talk with the team that, okay, look, we need to separate what you might think about the group with what they're asking about. And in the, when they got into the area of animal welfare, it's like, our consumers and we should be concerned about animal welfare as well. And so the fact that they're the ones that brought it up doesn't mean that's a disqualifying thing. But there are sometimes dilemmas in terms of whether certain husbandry practices, which have efficiency advantages for the farmers, may or may not be the best for the animal. There, there can be some times where scientists weigh in and say it's, that's a perfectly fine practice, and there's other times where they say, I think that's a questionable practice. We consulted on a regular basis with Dr. Temple Grandin in the areas of animal welfare. Um, she really has very unique uh, ways of, of addressing that, and we found it very helpful. There were many ways in terms of you know input areas and lights and noise and, and just how you handle animals in, in the process. In the areas of gestation stalls, so for example, uh, Dr. Grandin had articulated a position that really those were not good for animals. That was too confining. It was too difficult. 
And so a lot of our folks kind of said, yeah, but, you know, there's all these good economic reasons and we do have some <coughs> on, the, on the professor side that say, hey, this is fine. And I ultimately, I think we took the position, it's like, well, why, why are we listening to her in general, but we're going to ignore her on this one because it, we don't like her answer. And so ultimately, we did make the investment to change within our system and move away from gestation stalls. Related, okay, what about the independent farmers that we buy from? I mean, those are not our operations. We don't own their facilities. And ultimately, we try to just, okay, we're going to encourage them to consider changing. We're going to share data. We're going to offer consultative series. We're going to say, here's what's happened in our organization. A second example in that regard was California passed a law, oh, it's been about a dozen years ago by now, related to handling of hogs coming into the plant. And it was, from my perspective, an understandable reaction to some terrible video incidents that had happened in the industry in general. But in, our, in crafting their law, they created a law ultimately that was in conflict with federal law. And we are inspected by federal processing authorities. And so when I talk to our team on site, they're, they're saying, I, I can't. If I follow this new state law, I'm going to violate the federal law. If I follow, follow the federal law, I'm going to violate the state law. And so we said, okay, that's not, we're not going to put you in that position. We need on our basis to put take this through the court system and make sure we get you an answer so you're not at risk. And so we were able to succeed in getting injunctions. The case actually went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we ended up winning in the Supreme Court and getting the clear decision in terms of which law to follow. One final point I'll, I'll raise is I, mean, I did run for Congress last year. I was new to the world of politics. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I won my primary, I lost by a small margin in the special election, I lost by a larger margin in the general election. But ultimately, what was most important to me is I maintained my integrity, I maintained my values, and we were noted in, in a number of articles as having run a civil and issues-based campaign, and which was kind of different from what you see a lot of times these days. Thank you very much. Next question uh, will be by Regent Turner, who is on Zoom. Regent Turner, take it away. Yeah, good morning. You can, guys can hear me? Perfectly. Thank you. There Thank you. you go. The president has to navigate political realities and external pressures in managing controversial issues. Please give an example when you had to make a tough decision on a controversial or high profile issue. How did you handle it? What approach did you take managing that issue that was polarizing or divisive among different groups? Thank you. I'm going to talk about the issue of same-sex marriage and partner benefits early in the 2010 decade. So in 2010, uh, a couple of major corporations in our state ended up angering their consumers by making a donation to what was a new political action group. And that group was formed basically for the intention of backing a leading voice against gay marriage for Congress here in Minnesota. And we're part of business organizations, business trade associations as well. And so we were certainly asked, okay, will you join in on this effort? And we looked at it and said, look, I mean, this trade association arm that you're providing does not have a history of bipartisan support. And to us, that is a key element of ever considering to do that kind of an effort. We thought it had a questionable business connection. It seemed like they were interceding in an area that maybe they didn't belong. And so Hormel did not do it. And ultimately that did kind of blow up on those companies. And, and I think it was the right decision to, to not do that. It did prompt us, however, to give more thought on the underlying issue, and not just about gay marriage, but about same-sex benefits. I mean, Hormel had been a very traditional company indeed. I mean, we if we had travel events related to the company, you know, contest trip that somebody won, we, we had a strict rule that only, your guest could only be a spouse. That No one else was allowed in, in, as a guest. So we, we undertook a listening regimen of going out and talking with our team members, looking at what other companies did, and ultimately did decide to create a domestic partner program. Um, we approved that program in 2013, uh, the same year that Minnesota improved same-sex marriage, and at that time was still one of the few states that had done that. Um, to the other part of the question, we definitely did get some backlash. Um, there were customer boycott threats. 
there were internal concerns. I had all, I've always had a policy in any of the positions I've had that you can talk to me anytime in any way that's comfortable for you. You can send me an email, you can use the official portals, you can stop by at my office, you can call me on the phone. And I had some conversations in that regard. I believe in you talk to everyone and you hear them out and you, you give them a chance to articulate their view. And I tried to explain why the company uh, took the position it did. You can't satisfy everyone, but to me, it's important to be accessible. Thank you. Next question will be asked by Regent Erhalen. Good morning. Good morning. The president is charged with leading one of the world's largest public research universities. In your experience, what is the role of the chief executive in sustaining and growing the university's $1 billion research portfolio? I mean, I, I think the role would be to be supportive. I, I don't see the president as being the chief scientist. Um, the university has a great research team and has enviable status in the research areas. I think particularly for an interim president, I mean, by definition, research is multi-year. And so the notion that somebody coming in on a 12 month basis would make radical changes or, or try to do something precipitous in the research area to me would, would not make sense. I do think there are roles in terms of finding partners for research. Uh, we're involved in one right now in Austin. So we we're trying to be partners with the university on the farm project. We've worked with Dr. Brian Burr on that project. Um, we think that's a, a good example of, of an area where it's going to benefit not only the university, but our region and the state as a whole. I've also served for many years on the Hormel Institute Advisory Board. Uh, the Institute is one of the university's largest historical, the foundation is one of the university's largest historical supporters. Oh, indeed, we just got a letter not long ago from the regents thanking us for the support we provide in that regard. And again, the role as an advisory member is not to be the research person, but is to understand what they're doing, to be supportive, to ask questions in the right way um, and, and move forward on that basis. So the university, for example, I, so sadly, I, I'm missing that meeting today. They, they are, they're meeting right now. And Dr. Shashank Priya and Dr. Brian Burr are the representatives from the university who do go on a regular basis. Mayo has representatives. And so I, I would be certainly working to advocate for those as well. I've worked over the years also on animal ag issues with Dr. Burr and with Dr. Osterholm. Uh, they've been very helpful. The university is, has a national reputation in many of these areas as our industries have been challenged with things such as avian influenza. The U is at the forefront and I would certainly look to support that kind of effort. And then I, I think I mentioned earlier, you know, at Hormel we did no, we have R and D. I mean, we we definitely get involved with not only we, we kind of call it offense and defense. Offense being new product innovation and having pilot plants that, that you can create those kind of items, but defense being food safety that you you need to be protecting consumers at all times and making sure that your products uh, have that kind of quality. And then there's times, honestly, where you can kind of do a little bit of both. So we were pioneers, for example, in introducing high pressure pasteurization to sliced meat product lines that provide a, a really mu much heightened area of food safety um, and, and created a new consumer brand. And then just lastly, I mean, I, my wife and I have been taken advantage of and we're very thankful for the research-based veterinary clinic that you have here on the St. Paul campus. To me, it's a, it's a nice example of uh, the UN action and being outreach to the community. Um, I guess the last thing I, I'll, I'll reiterate, I mentioned a little earlier, I mean, I. I recognize that my background in academia is, is, is limited compared to some of the other folks that you're going to be talking with today. I do think I've demonstrated throughout my career an ability to transfer my skill set to new challenges, moving from law to marketing, moving from finance to treasure, uh, even in the area of running for Congress. I mean, I, I quickly built a team and, and we hit the ground running and we're able to be uh, competitive in that area as well. I, I think. I have an ability to attain a level of understanding fairly quickly, but that needs to always be coupled with a good, real healthy reliance on the professional team that's in place. All right, our last question uh, will be by Regent Wheeler. Yeah, good morning. 
Uh, that brings us to the end of our list of questions. We're wondering if you have any questions for us or what else you might want us to know. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, sure. And you can you tell me when my time's up. And you're doing. We, we are doing great. You are doing great on time. So okay. feel great. free to ask away. We're we're it's 9:15 and we're going. You, the time slot we have is until 9:45. Okay. So great. Um, thank you. Go ahead. I'm interested in the region's experience in addressing the unique aspects of the Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses. Well, there's a good question for us. Thank you. Uh, let me see if any regent would like to weigh in on this issue. All right, I'm going to take a stab at it, Do, and but I'm going to ask you to repeat it. Sure. This is in my, in my role as a of judge. I get to ask people to repeat the That's question. That's very fair. I'm interested in the region's experience in addressing the unique aspects of the Crookston, Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses. Well, I can say, having been on the board here for four years, um, that I think we have evolved as a, the university has evolved in terms of its focus on the system campuses, and we as a board have evolved as well. Uh, there has always been so much focus on the Twin City campus and as separate from the other system campuses around the state. And I think that the um, what the regents are now doing and where we're seeing the administration is doing is seeing that we are a whole system made up with five different geographic locations and with each there's a lot of overlap, but at the same time, each one has a very separate identity uh, that is important to that particular campus and that our goal is to make sure that we are playing to those strengths of each of those campuses um, and not trying to make it be one size fits all. So I think we have evolved as a board, as the administration has, to look at it the entire whole, to look at our system holistically and not one campus versus another campus. And I think we're still in that education process. We've certainly changed our marketing, or we've been working on that so that when we're promoting the university, we're promoting it as a system all over the state, but with entities or uh, uh, schools, colleges that have particular uh, strengths that a particular student may be interested in versus another. So I would say it's it's been evolving. Regent Davenport, thank you. Thank you. I'll just piggyback on that and say that in terms of leadership, looking at the system as a whole across the country, people call it systemness or whatever. It might also be called enterprise leadership. So that how do we build on the strengths so that the whole is, as as you um, mentioned, you know, the quality institution that we are and it's reflected to the public. Uh, Regent Johnson, Tad Johnson. Thank you for that question because it's very <clears throat> important uh, a lot of us went to some of those <laughs> schools or I taught at UMD and sent my daughter, my daughter went to Morris where she had a very nice experience, but um, we visited a lot of those campuses as regents and um, got a lot of information from them. They're interested in seeing additional marketing, additional focus on their campus. So when you Google the University of Minnesota, you don't just get this campus, you also could get the others listed and their strengths and uh, uh, other aspects. Um, I think uh, they all feel like uh, this campus is sort of like the center of the universe, whereas they are out there in outstate Minnesota uh, serving a lot of important students and a lot of us went to these schools, so they're very important. Thank you. Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thanks for the question. Um, you know, I agree with what my colleagues have said, and as we're interviewing you, I guess you're interviewing us too, um, and, and it might be fair to say that, you know, we haven't fully addressed, um, you know, the challenges on, on some of those campuses, and I think my colleagues have articulated, um, articulated some of those points well, um, but you know, especially when when you when we 
especially when we visit campuses, Morris was the last one we were at, and I think some of my colleagues were elsewhere for commencement. I know Regent Halen was in Duluth over the weekend. Um, the, the value is, is very clear. I mean, it, when you're on campus, it's very clear, but we're obviously seeing we're having challenges translating that um, to, to, to students, to potential students, and I think that's an area that we probably could uh, benefit from um, an, an outside perspective. But I, I think um, to summarize that we haven't <laughs> fully addressed those, I think would be fair to say. I think you're hearing we're a work in progress on this issue, but very open to it. Well, thank you. I mean, as a person who's lived in outstate Minnesota my whole time in Minnesota, I'm, I'm definitely interested in those campuses and pleased to hear what you what you offered. Uh, another question. Are there particular of your impact 2025 goals that you feel would requ require the most attention from an interim president over the next 12 months? All right. Anybody want to take a stab at this? <coughs> oh, thanks, Jim. I, I don't know what what goal it is, but you know, back to that last question, I think one of the biggest uh, the biggest areas is in terms of enrollment with streaking high school populations and trying to get a fair number of students. We can't really meet our mission unless we have students on campuses. So to me, that would be one of the my top priorities as far as the next 12 months goes. Regent Davenport. Thank you. I would add um, the whole picture of financial sustainability in the sense of the in, with, with low enrollment or the enrollment declines, cost of living increases, um, all these factors that then drive to cost of attendance to a student. And how can we build um, build on our strengths so that we are a lo the long-term viable higher ed institution we are well into the future, benefiting the access issues and the um, affordability to our students. And I, I would just note that your question is raising um, uh, an issue of questions that this whole board will be discussing in terms of what is going to be most important over the next year. Um, clearly, we will be, once we select the interim president, sitting down with the, that in individual and identifying what are the priorities that, that we need to attend to in the next year. Uh, in, partnership with our interim president is exactly a dialogue we will be having very shortly with whoever is selected. But you've 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 hit a very important issue um, for all of us. I received a phone call on my phone machine over the weekend from a reporter uh, asking whether, you know, seeing that I was a finalist and asking whether I wanted to comment on what my vision would be as the interim president. And I, I first of all I declined and said I want to have the chance to talk to the regents about those things and not talk to it you know, ahead of time in the press. I'll be happy to talk to the press anytime if, I, if I'm ultimately selected for the role. But one thing I would say is it's really not going to be about my vision. <laughs> the, the regents have a, a very strong vision in place. It's about execution toward that vision. So, And the impact is right there. Other uh, input before you ask your next question. Yes, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I would just add, you know, um, upcoming at our regularly scheduled um, board meetings this week is a presentation um, directly related to a tenant of the MPAC 2025 strategic plan um, around um, some innovation and strategy with tuition um, pricing models. Uh, and I think, you know, we haven't had that discussion yet, so I think it's going to be really, really fruitful um, and important for the regions, but that's something, you know, that's very much uh, directly tied to it's specifically named out in this MPAC 2025 strategic plan um, that would certainly you know have some activity that we're going to learn more about um, in the next year and so um, that's just something that I would highlight it's a pretty significant deliverable speaks to what Regent Davenport was talking about um, around cost of attendance and affordability uh, and so that's something that's in our very immediate uh, future that will certainly have activity with it um, within the next year. Thank you. Further questions? Sure. Um, and I don't mean to put any particular region on the spot. If they choose not to answer, that's fine. But I, I am curious from the new regents who just went through the process of, of being elected, <clears throat> three brand new, and Regent Johnson who went you know, through it on this thorough basis. Um, 
What did you hear from legislators from both sides of the aisle about what they'd like to see from the U? All right, new, new regents, weigh in. Regent Gulley. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, the biggest thing that I heard over and over from legislators was that they wanted to improve the relationship between legislators and the regents and um, that there were better connections between the regents and legislators um, before COVID and that that has, um, that, that it's been uh, less since then and that they want more connections. Um, and the other thing, and this is really related, but was that I think they all had this sense that there were really great things happening at the U, um, but that they weren't always aware of what was going on and also that there were a lot of um, big missteps that sort of tarnished the reputation of the university and made it look bad and made them look bad and that they wanted to see the university making just better sort of choices in, in the public. Thank you so much. Regent Wheeler. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I'll just build on what Regent Gully said um, as well. Um, I think there was uh, almost a bipartisan lack of complete trust in the direction of the university and where it was going. Um, I think that that, you know, some, and it was because of, uh, you know, that lack of visibility as to what glorious things are going on here, which are many, um, and, and the relationship forming that exists there. And then there was a, a large um, voice of needing to be accountable. So that's, uh, that's some of what we heard. And also, you know, that there was an extreme engagement too, which tells me that there's a whole lot of people who care very much about this institution, what it does and what it means to not only the student it serves, but also the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, Regent Turner. I now see your hand is up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Evans, I appreciate that um, question, and this is why. When I was approached by our state AFL-CIO president to, um, if I was interested in in running for a region position. It was the understanding that I would be um, actually one of two uh, labor um, candidates or labor regions that we haven't had the voice of labor on the board of regions for many years, probably over, a, well over a decade or so. And so, and one comment that was a couple comments that were made to me by legislatures was that they would love to see um, the the contract campaigns that go on and the negotiations that go on with the workers here in the university system that it does not come to the point where they have to they are potentially going to go on strike that there should be a smoother path to um, to uh, bringing about resolution of new contracts. And um, I think that that's, having been a in a lot of these kind of contract negotiations, there is no reason that um, it should come to that point where, where workers feel like they need to walk the line. Thank you. Uh, uh, Regent Tad Johnson. So I, I served uh, for, for about 10 months uh, before this, this term started, but I was still new to going through the legislative process. So, uh, so I spent like three months pounding the stairs over there and hearing a lot of the same stuff everybody else heard, but they wanted uh, better communication from us, particularly the leadership, particularly the president. They wanted somebody to come over to answer their questions on a regular basis, especially the higher ed committee. They also said several times, I got this from several people, that we only see regents, uh, we see new ones every two years. Uh, you come up, you, uh, and then we never see you again. Uh, so they wanted to see more of, of us. Um, and uh, more transparency, more, I, I don't know how you get more transparent than this, but uh, they wanted more of that. Um, 
so uh, essentially the same thing the other folks heard. Um, so I, I just think we need to um, focus on uh, our ability to communicate with the public, the legislators, and our accountability, as somebody pointed out. I kept getting that a lot. And holding the, the uh, administration accountable. Any other questions that you have? I just have one other one. Uh, I, I wanted to have, take the opportunity to maybe clarify the start time for this job. So the, the application itself only mentions the date July 1st. But in watching the meetings and hearing the dialogue, I, I've heard quite a bit about an interest in making sure that a person is available previous to that. Uh, whether that availability is in a full, okay, you're the operating president role or more of just a chance to overlap and, and, and attend and learn things, either one is fine. But I also wanted to clarify because I, I put an item since I didn't really know the answer to that. In my application, I had mentioned, oh, I have a couple of things scheduled on my calendar that are prior to the July 1 date. And I just wanted to assure the board that if the board deems that the interim president needs to be involved tomorrow, I'll be involved tomorrow, that, that I'll, I'll make the changes necessary. I, I just will ultimately we look for the clarity of that. So. I thank you for that clarification. We certainly, we did put July 1 as the start date and at the same time, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, we talked about uh, the desirability for overlap and onboarding, but we will, no matter who the candidate is, we will work with their schedules. We recognize uh, this position uh, came up very last minute and we expect every candidate has prior commitments and we will work with to honor that uh, so that it works for everybody, but appreciate the clarification. Thank you very much. I, I'm just deeply honored to have had the opportunity to talk with you today. I just want to let you know how proud I would be to have the opportunity to serve as interim president. Thank, Thank you, you very time. much. We will uh, take a recess until 10 a.m. Uh, when our next candidate will be coming forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Edinger. Really appreciate the Thank opportunity you. to dialogue with you.
<laughs> All right, we are resuming our special meeting here today. At this time, we will welcome Myron Franz. Good morning, Myron. Good morning. The board has a series of questions prepared for our time with you today. As you know, each candidate has received the same set of questions from the board and you were provided them over the weekend so that you would have an opportunity to reflect on the questions we're going to ask. If it, there is sufficient time at the end of the interview, then we are going to give you an opportunity to ask questions of us, which we have had no opportunity to prepare. So bear with us. With that, I'd like to get started with the first question, and I will ask you that myself, and that is as follows. What specifically interests you about the interim president role at this moment in time, and what do you see as the one key strength you would bring to this role? Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, members of the Board of Regents. Thank you for inviting me here today. I'm honored to be considered for the position of interim president. I want to congratulate Regent John, Tad Johnson for his election to the board. I want to congratulate Regent Turner, Regent Gully, and Regent Wheeler for their election to the Board of Regents. Congratulations to co-vice chairs Kenyanya and Hips on your selection to board leadership. Thank you to Speaker Hortman and Senate Majority Leader Dietzik for their leadership. <clears throat> and thank you to the legislature for, for fulfilling their constitutional duties one, day, one week ago. And thank you to all the interim president candidates for their interest in supporting the university. I want to thank this board for appointing me as senior vice president in 2020. I've been honored to work at the university. And last of all, I want to most importantly thank my wife, lovely wife Susan, and my two boys, Isaac and Nathan, and my soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Mary Ellen, for their support and humor at times, which is always helpful in situations like this. But to answer your question, Madam Chair, uh, I come before the governing body of the Board of Regents to advocate on my behalf for the interim president position at the university. I do so with the conviction that I have demonstrated that I have worked well with and supported the Board of Regents as the governing body at the university, that I understand and have made progress on many of the priorities of the board, and that my connection to our communities and to our elect elected leaders is unmatched. I believe that under my leadership, the university will not miss a step and delivering on its priorities throughout this next transition year, and will strategically at the same time position ourselves for the new president. This university has many strengths and accomplishments. For example, this last fall, the University of Minnesota enrolled the largest class of Minnesota high school graduates as freshmen, while setting a record for four-year graduation rates. The four-year graduation rates at the Twin Cities campus now exceed 75%. Our system-wide career outcome rates are up almost 10% over the national average. The university achieved two consecutive record-setting years with over a billion dollars in research awards. We've embarked on a targeted model of distributed education with the launch of NextGen Med and NextGen Ag. The medical school is ranked among the best in the nation. We have record startup and patent creation at the university. We've been recognized <laughs> in the top 25 among national research universities. I'm proud of all the focused and coordinated work to achieve so many world-class outcomes by the University of Minnesota. But we also know that we have work to do in our connection and engagement with our state. For sure, we need greater engagement with the legislature, state and local leaders, our donors and alumni, parents, prospective students, tribal leaders, and leaders, leaders from across the state. We, we need greater engagement with the people also in Minnesota. We need for them to listen. We need to listen to them about their concerns and their uh, proposed outcomes for the university. And we also need to make sure that we inform them of what we're doing on behalf of Minnesota every single day. In addition to working with this board and our community leaders, I would closely collaborate with our senior leadership at the university. You all know we have an extremely talented group of leaders on all five of our campuses. Collectively, these leaders are simply the best and can provide tremendous support and guidance to the interim president and to the new president. At the University of Minnesota, we are fortunate to have a very strong shared governance process that includes faculty, staff, and students from all five campuses. 
On May 6, Professors Flaherty Manchester, Patterson, Buhlman, and Pittenger wrote a strong letter urging this board to select an interim president and future new president who will support shared governance as a critical part of the university. The professors wrote, and I quote, shared governance isn't always easy, and it doesn't mean everyone agrees with every decision made, but ultimately, better decisions are made when all voices contribute to the discussion. I agree with their sentiment, and I will discuss this more later in my comments, but the point here is that I see the current university leadership and shared governance in place at the university as providing guidance this next year to the interim president. The key is for the interim president to effectively listen to these leaders and voices around the university, which I pledge to do. I believe there are a series of questions that you must ask as you enter into a position such as the one that you're considering now. And I've mentioned the importance of my connections and relationships, but the key strength that I think that I bring to leadership roles is my ability to get things done. Now, I know that doesn't sound very academic, but, I, but to deliver on goals, I think you need to make sure that you can demonstrate a set of skills, not just one. And, and the, the series of questions that I think you need to ask yourself as a leader when you're uh, tackling new issues and new problems is, how as a leader are you going to make this new decision? Who do you involve and listen to? How do you make sure all voices and views are heard? How do you define the problem or opportunity in front of you? How do you make sure that things go through to completion? How do you lead transparently? How do you communicate? How do you build trust? I always endeavor to ask these questions when facing new problems or challenges or decisions. And I th as I think about the current students, uh, our, our um, alumni and our future students, I'm optimistic that the University of Minnesota can continue to fulfill its mission of teaching, research, and service to the state. We all have our individual reasons for supporting this university and higher education in general. My individual reasons begin with a higher, how higher education has provided me with wonderful opportunities in my life, not the least of which is sitting here today in front of you all. I was supported, encouraged, pushed, cajoled, challenged by teachers throughout my education experience. Thank you to all my teachers. So I have my individual reasons to support higher education, but I also support specifically the University of Minnesota. And I think we must all work together to figure out how to support all learners, and I emphasize the word all. At this moment, the university is facing a unique challenge, in part because of the current times we live in but also because of the time of transition at the university. My belief is that the interim president position must be focused on two overarching goals. First is setting the table for our next new president, for which I am not a candidate. I am uniquely qualified to continue and build upon our process of engagement with our students, faculty, staff, parents, alumni, donors, neighbors, and communities, tribal leaders, state and local government leaders, we need to make sure that we listen and engage this next year so we are prepared to advance the next big initiative with strong relationships and a new president. The second part, I think, is not losing a step. I believe that my understanding of current university initiative and the board initiatives and my involvement in many of them will help ensure that we do not lose a step in progress on important goals that we have as a community. I just want to briefly mention the five pillars of the impact 2025 capital or um, strategic plan that this board adopted in June of 2020. I know that I've seen many strategic plans. I know many of you have too. And so many of them are really well drafted and end up on a bookshelf somewhere collecting dust. This one is, that's not true of this one. We've been engaged throughout this university community in working with the board and with all of our leaders on endeavoring to make sure that we deliver on the demands of the 2025 plan. It's been crucial for prioritizing what work we should do, how to allocate resources. We've made many decisions with this board along the way with the 2025 plan as our guide. The first one, a pillar of that is student success, making sure that we meet all students where they are and maximizing their skills, potential and well-being in this really dramatically changing world. The second one is discovery, innovation, and impact, where we really want to make sure that we channel the curiosity and we invest in discovery for the future of our students and research, uh, really trying to make sure that we serve Minnesota and society as a whole. The third pillar is intersections, where we really are inspired by our state to improve on health outcomes, deliver on sustainable goals, 
innovative food, farming, and natural resources, all at world-class levels. The fourth pillar being community and belonging, fostering a welcoming community that values belonging, equity, diversity, and dignity in people and ideas. And the final one is fiscal stewardship, where we really make sure that we promote access, efficiency, trust, and collaboration with our state partners, our students, faculty, staff, and parents. These are the goals that I think will help drive us collectively in this next year as we not only prepare for the next president, but we make sure that we continue delivering on these goals. And that's my, that's my answer to number one. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Franz. At this time, Mary Davenport will put the second question to you. Good morning, Mr. Franz. As a large, complex organization, the university faces many complicated and multifaceted issues, including such things as cost of attendance, employee wages and benefits, public safety, and many others. At times, a solution for one issue puts pressure on another. Please provide an example of where you had to address a complex issue, what was it, what made it complex, and how did you approach it, and what was the outcome? Thank you, uh, Regent. Um, I think one of the things I'll use at this point is to talk about our sustainability goals. <clears throat> As you all know, sustainability is a broad area and applied across the, an inst institution the size of the university is quite complex. We have sustainability goals and we, it requires bold action to take those. We have a system-wide co coordinated approach to sustainability, but we've seen some success in terms of positive rankings hitting goals and making progress on our plans. But I want to talk a little bit about this area because I think it's a great opportunity to explain the complexity that we face on some of our issues here. Uh, right now, I currently oversee the work in the Office of Sustainability. And Vice President Shashank Priya and I serve as co-chairs of the University of Minnesota System Sustainability Committee. Now, in Impact 2025, the university was committed to building a fully sustainable future. And we all have our definitions of what that means. That's partly why this is such a complex area. There's so much good work being done and there are so many different ideas that are developing. But one of the things that, some of the goals we've been asked to achieve are demonstrating state and worldwide leadership in sustainability and environmental teaching, research and convening power. And another one is to develop system leadership and governance coordination for sustainability initiatives. And the last one from Impact 2025 is establishing a next generation system-wide climate action plan. All very important goals. And at the May board meeting this, later this week, we will be presenting the annual sustainability report to the board and the Twin Cities Climate Action Plan. The action plan is a tremendous body of work and represents an ambitious amount of research. The scale impact of university sustainability program really shines throughout our uh, our university and some of the sustainability ratings we've been receiving lately. The university's Twin Cities and Morris campuses received gold ratings from the Association of the Advancement of Sustainability and Higher Education Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System, or the STARS system. Uh, also, the university system was rated among the top institutions in the world on the sustainable development goals related to hunger and health in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings. But because climate change is so significant and so broad, in order to achieve the bold vision outlined in the, in the Impact 2025, each campus, each university campus is working on their own strategic plan to promote and ideas to eliminate green gas pollution, pollution and making campus more resilient to the effects of climate change. While we have clear goals, achieving them takes leadership, resources, creative thinking, and an unwavering commitment to solving very complex problems. Our solutions at the university have ranged from green roofs to highly energy efficient buildings and sophisticated stormwater reclamation systems. For example, the university has installed two megawatts of solar panels on the Twin Cities campus in both Minneapolis and St. Paul at nine locations. Though we are an urban campus, we make use of space such as parking lot, uh, the parking lot at the law school as one place to install the solar panels. Another example is that we apply our sustainability lens to all of our finances. We have a plan to reduce our overall exposure to fossil fuel investments. The uh, 
the Office of Investment and Banking will be presenting to the board that later this week some recommended policy changes for the board on our on our plans to reduce our exposure to fossil fuels. The university's endowment proposal that they present in May is a phased reduction regarding its overall exposure to fossil fuels. In addition, the university's endowment has prioritized allocating capital in the innovative technologies that are transforming different industry sectors. Innovations within these sectors are addressing greenhouse gas emissions and clean energy production, responsible water utilization and recovery, clean transportation, and industry efficiencies that reduce power usage. We will also continue our resources and expertise to drive change to address environmental changes. Uh, for example, the university became a signatory to the United Nations Principles for Responsing <coughs> Responsible Investing. Uh, half my time is going to be taken up just talking about the names that I'm delivering today. We are now one of only seven higher education institutions in the U.S. to endorse the UNPRI that I just mentioned, standards for commitment to ESG objectives and greater transparency in reporting outcomes and progress. We committed $3 million recently to the venture capital firm DCVC. They have a climate select fund which promotes groundbreaking environmental technology. During the past year, the Office of Investments and Banking committed 43% of the university's new private partnerships managers who are classified as emerging, minority, or women-owned. We continue to, pre to prepare and push the envelope to make sure that sustainability issues are not just something we do on certain parts of the, the day or the week. They've become a central part of our planning, both financially and programmatically, around the university. And I think that in terms of the complexity of that issue, it will never, the complexity is just going to get more intense as we get more uh, in uh, research and results from our students and faculty and in the, res the research they're composing, we look forward to new ideas and new suggestions to do even more in sustainability. Thank you, Regent Bell. Uh, Mr. Franz, just a follow-up question. You've identified, obviously, an incredibly complex issue for the university. What's your role been in addressing this very complex issue of sustainability? And how did you... How, how have you approached it? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the first way is through being uh, the, the uh, co-chair with uh, Vice President uh, Shashank Priya on the system-wide sustainability uh, committee. One of the things we do is convene a lot of uh, folks and listen to suggestions about how to allocate the resources we have available to research projects. So a, a large part of my engagement is through the system-wide sustainability committee uh, with uh, Vice President Shashank Priya. And the other part is in uh, overseeing the Office of Sustainability. As you know, we just added this last year the uh, first the Director of Sustainability at the University of Minnesota. And so we are working with, uh, supervi I'm supervising in that area to make sure that we use that position to be out there and supporting and connecting uh, all, the, all the different activities. This is a huge effort in coordinating and connecting people who have different ideas to make sure that we come together and we make use our resources and we, we strategize and, and use resources effectively as a university. Thank you. All right, the third question uh, will be put to you by Regent Farnsworth. Good morning. Um, the president delegates a significant portion of the strategic management of the university to a team of senior leaders and others. Tell us, a, tell us about a time when you successfully developed and convened a team of leaders or experts to implement a strategic objective. What was the objective? Who were the leaders involved? Describe how you developed the team as well as any challenges you faced. What steps did you take to overcome those challenges and what was the outcome of their work? Very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm going to take you back in time to answer this one. I'm going to go back to the time where I was the Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. At that time, we were facing a pension uh, liability of about $16 billion, an unfunded pension liability of about $16 billion. And I started working on that when I was uh, first became Commissioner in 2015. So but let me back up a little bit and sort of outline where, we're, where I'm going with this. So the goal here was to convene the right group of uh, policymakers and experts to uh, come up with the right solutions. This is not an easy area to solve. 
uh, and then the objective was to develop a pension reform plan that could be adopted by the state. Now, the leaders that were involved were the legislators. We had a blue ribbon panel that I'll describe in a moment, employees, retirees, a lot of state staff. We developed a team of experts to put the, all this together. Uh, the challenge was to make sure that we could get the policy uh, folks at the legislature and the public and the media to support this idea of pension reform. Uh, the, it worked, and I'll tell you about the result in just a moment, but I think one of the keys that we started working on was trying to figure out who can talk about this area in a way that's accessible. Uh, any as you know, anytime we get into some of these financial areas, you, part of the key is being able to communicate uh, the challenge so that the uh, so everyone can understand that. So we started putting together a team of experts. We started at MMB, Minnesota Management Budget, with those folks. We expanded to other state agencies. Then we went to the Minnesota State Retirement System. who They have experts, the Public Employee Retirement Association, the Teachers Retirement Association, the St. Paul Teachers Retirement Association. We collected all those experts, and then we went to the Legislative Commission on Pensions and, and uh, Retirements and engaged, I personally engaged with the National State organization of state treasurers as uh, I was attending some of those meetings because there was a lot of effort around the country at that time in 2015, 2016, to start dealing with this pension liability issue because it was growing in a lot of states at that time. I do remember when I started uh, uh, commission, I asked, well, how's the, our current pension situation? And someone said, well, we're better off than than Illinois. I just laughed. Everybody's better off in Illinois. So the key was to really make meaningful reform that would make sure that these pensions were there for the, for the folks that earned them. And, and we made a promise. We needed to deliver on that promise. Uh, so we started working uh, with a group of pi bipartisan uh, legislators, I should say, Senator Julie Rosen, Senator Sandy Pappas, Representative Mary Murphy, and Representative Tim O'Driscoll were the main leaders that I worked with across the aisle, we worked together to put together this package. Now, we came up with the plan in 2017, but it didn't make it through. It was vetoed because of some other problems with the bill. So everyone was in 2017 thinking, well, this is just a bridge too far. It's too hard. Let's just give up, and we're still better than Illinois. And I said, well, we can't just stop there. So we, so that fall, the fall of 2017, leading into the legislative session in 2018, we sort of got the band back together, as you might say. We got all those experts back together. We started working together. And I got a promise from the governor that if we could put together a proposal, he would include it in his budget in 2018, which had never been done before for a pension proposal. So my strategy at that point was put together a blue ribbon panel to help convince everyone that from all walks of uh, business and, and, and different points of view, this was the right thing to do. Uh, in fact, one of the Blue Ribbon panel members was Professor Colleen Manche Flaherty Manchester from the Carlson School of Management. But we had lawyers, we had bankers, we had investors, uh, and, we, and we had retired uh, financial uh, advisors. The goal was to put together a package, but we had about six weeks to do it. And if you've ever worked with a panel of experts, they don't actually move that fast generally. And so our goal was to quickly assemble the facts so that they could independently assess the and then come to their, we gave them some options to consider that made sense, and then made, they obviously made their choices, and we put that together in a report and made it in time to get into the governor's budget for 2018. And then in 2018, we continued that work throughout the session to make sure that we engaged the, um, the retiree co uh, communities, the different pension funds, the different uh, labor unions to make sure they understand, they understood that the commitment the state was making to add uh, more uh, con contrib contributing support for their pension, um, uh, for their pension payments. So all this was that we wanted support from the state, we wanted support uh, from all of the different leaders in this area to get this done. And actually the, the bill finally passed on the last day of session in 2018, 131 to zero in the House and 67 to zero in the Senate. This is the final day of the session. I will say, though, one of the happiest days I've ever been in the state of Tundra was that after that, uh, the signing of the bill by the, by the governor, uh, Governor Dayton, because people were so were so thrilled by that change. The reform immediately eliminated 3.4 billion dollar of future debt and set set the state to save up to six billion in future costs and fully fund pensions in 30 years. 
Now, I know there's some uh, more pension work that needs to be done this year at the legislature. You might have heard about some of that. Pensions always need a little tinkering with. You're never done with the pension. You always have to make sure that you look at the actuarial tables and you keep up to date. But that, uh, that experience was one of the most challenging I've ever had, uh, Regent Farnsworth, to put a team together, come up with a plan, and take years uh, for it to finally work. But it, it, su it succeeded, and i um, uh, happy to be able to tell you about that one. Thank you. Thank you. Question four will be directed to you from Regent Tully. Good morning. Um, the president leads a public institution that relies on deep legislative and community relationships. Describe a time when you had to navigate complex legislative or community issues. How did you go about building relationships with key legislators or community stakeholders to ensure the outcome that the organization's need? Like you just answered this question. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. But yeah, this is that was Monday, I think, or Tuesday maybe. Um, let me let me give you another example from the state though, because I think, and this goes back a little bit further in time, uh, because this one really uh, deals a little bit with some of the comments I made at the beginning about the connections to the state and and being engaged. Um, so, and this is, I hope this comes across as apolitical, because uh, as the budget commissioner or the finance commissioner and the revenue commissioner at the time, uh, I was worried about the bottom line. In fact, I'm going to give you um, the best financial indicator tool you could ever have, and this will get you through a lot of, a lot of issues. So um, when you look at financial statements, look at the revenue line, and then you look at the expenditure line. If the expenditure line exceeds the revenue line, you have a problem. <laughs> and you should fix that first. <laughs> Always a good rule of thumb. And, uh, and but you know, in the, we'd had a, we'd experienced like nine or 10 years, or nine out of 11 years of budget deficits in the state leading up to 2011. And, and remember, when, when I started as revenue commissioner in 2011, we had a $6.2 billion deficit, none of this $17 billion surplus stuff, a $6.2 billion deficit. And clearly, our revenues were not keeping track with our expenditures. So the idea was to launch a statewide program to to talk to the public and the press about the budget deficits, and really to, to talk about it not with a proposal in mind. The idea was to go out and say, this is the situation we have. We have property tax at the highest levels they've ever been, which is a very non, uh, uh, it's a very regressive tax, as you know, uh, and the income tax was hadn't been changed in a long time. And so we talked to people about the structure of the system. Did they see the same problem we did? And we listened to people and we and went around the state. And the goal wasn't to try to sell a particular uh, budget reform or a tax reform. The goal was, we have a problem. Do you all agree? And if so, what do you think? And then and, and to get ideas from people. Um, the, the conversation was really well received everywhere we went. We didn't just pick from certain locations to go. We went all over the state. I had over 160 meetings with over 7,000 people in 50 different cities across the state. And the engagement was one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one meetings with leg legislators in their districts, meetings with local officials, business leaders, editorial boards. Um, I mean, if someone would listen to me, I would talk to them. Town halls, county fairs, even press conferences. Can you imagine someone in a county fair wanting to talk about budget reform? Well, they did. So uh, it was pretty amazing. The outreach was unique because we went, <clears throat> we went everywhere. We had a group of mayors that were supporting us. And so that was in 2012. And the next year, we did pass a budget bill, a tax reform bill in 2013. And since passing that tax bill, the state has had positive budget balances ever since, where the revenues exceed the expenditures. Remember that little tool. There's only been one exception. That was during the COVID. That was for a brief moment. Uh, so as, as MMB commissioner uh, and the revenue commissioner at that time, the goal was to engage people in the process and there was there was no defined set of who to engage the goal was to engage everyone and get and get people talking about this as a joint problem in terms of the budget issues not a political problem one way or the other and uh, and it worked in the sense that we had a lot of support a lot of people uh, uh, agreed with us and got the bill passed and actually that summer after we passed that bill, the um, one of the credit rating agencies increased, restored our AAA credit rating to the state because they could see the balance that had been restored. And so that's my uh, 
attempted answering your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franz. Mr. Hipsch, do you want to direct the next question to Mr. Franz? Uh, good morning, Senior Vice President Franz. So the senior or the university's uh, senior leaders rarely act unilaterally. How do you ensure that those on a team or across an organization feel heard and valued during the decision-making process? Share an example of a situation where you effectively incorporated multiple perspectives <coughs> to arrive at a successful outcome. Thank you, Regent Hipp. So I'm going to uh, tell a story about selling our $500 million interest-only bonds. That this, uh, many of the people on this board uh, wrestled with that uh, challenge. So. Uh, You'll all recall, some of you will recall back in 2020, uh, we, you know, we were coming to the end, and we now know the end of a very long period of very low, uh, unusually low uh, interest rates. And the Federal Reserve constantly was concerned about the effect of having those, long inter those low interest rates uh, that low. Um, and so one of the things that we, we knew in 2020 that the, the um, in 2021, I should say, as we went into 2021, we knew that the in low interest rate period was going to end at some point. The end was in sight. Turns out we now know it was 2022, and uh, but we didn't know that in 2021. So we started working on a concept to bring to the board about uh, selling a century bond. Now, a century bond is a bond that literally lasts for 100 years, and it's designed by those institutions that kind of that can have the confidence to buy them because there aren't that many people you think will be around in 100 years, but universities and colleges are some of those. And so universities and colleges have been issuing century bonds for a while now, and they really provide only interest payments for the first 100 years, and then the, the, the principal is due at the end of 100 years. The, the opportunity is to lock in those low interest rates for the long term and to make sure that you invest some money at that same time so that you're investing in a a fund that will can pay off the balance that's due in 100 years, which is what our plan was. We came to the board and the board approved that. Uh, but it turned out that things started changing even faster than we assumed. In early 22, as we were preparing to go to market, uh, we found that um, the market was becoming much more fluid and volatile than it had previously been done. You know, we have a credit rating of AA1 by Moody's and AA by Standard & Poor's, and there's a lot of interest in University debt around the country. University of Minnesota has always had a great, uh, a great reputation for selling bonds and people buying that. But we were, we were concerned that we were, were going to be too late. Uh, the interest rates were starting to tick up to three, and then four percent. And as a group, we came to to this the board and had, we had a target of under four percent. I think was the first target that we had. Um, but uh, as a as the market became much more volatile, that was moving around and it became clear to us that we might not be able to sell the 100 year century bonds. And we proposed to the board instead, maybe selling 30 year interest only bonds because those rates were low enough. They were still below the around the 4% that we were targeting and the, the century bonds were getting up toward 5%. So we, we got the approval of the board to add some tools to our toolbox and we began that preparation uh, to sell. But as we, as we were going into that, um, and to the uh, sale, I have to say that the number of people that we had involved uh, to work on that uh, was pretty amazing. We had our bond council, we had the credit rating agencies were looking at the bond offering, we had uh, our financial advisors, we had of course the board and the president. We tried to keep you all uh, up to date as we went through that process and at the very end we were able to pick a day and we sold the bonds, a successful bond offering and uh, we had over a billion dollars in, in, in purchase orders for our bonds for $500 million, which shows you that there was high demand for the University of Minnesota's bond offering. The final interest rate was set at 4.048%, and, uh, and we were able to avoid the higher interest bonds, uh, probably around 4.8 or 4.9% for the century bonds. So um, that was a case where we assembled a number of teams, had to work constantly collectively with one another communicating with the uh, the go no go decision it's it's a delicate decision because you just cannot predict the, the market volatility on any particular day as some of you will remember that's when the war in ukraine began which just added to the volatility on any particular day so we were able to go to uh, manage that collectively as a group with all these 
uh, talented people working together. And uh, one of the things that I think um, we were really proud of was to make that decision uh, with not total certainty on the night before, because once you enter a bond sale, it's really not good form to pull it back the next day and you're pretty much committed. But thanks to the flexibility and the board, I believe we called a special board meeting for uh, uh, at that time for uh, some of this decision making. So we, we worked fast, we worked hard, and we, we collaborated with all those who needed to know. And we, the outcome was a really great opportunity. We've already uh, allocated almost $300 million of that $500 million to current projects we have, and we still have $200 million more dollars in order to allocate into the future projects. So it's fulfilling exactly the kind of purpose we wanted it to, to invest in long-term strategic um, investments around the university. Thank you, Regent Hamm. Thank you. Uh, Regent Ruth Johnson. Good morning, Senior Vice President Franz. Tell us about your experience working with boards, particularly a public board. What is your understanding of how public and private boards and the organizations they serve differ? What steps have you taken to develop and maintain a good working relationship with the board? Give us an example when you introduced a concept or proposal to a board that was board was not supportive. And what steps did you take to overcome these challenges? Thank you, uh, Regent Johnson. This is not a uh, employee review session, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, working with this board has been a tremendous opportunity. I worked with a lot of public boards uh, in the past. As you can see from my resume, when I was at the state, I was on a lot of, number of public boards. And uh, I've also served on some private boards. I think one of the things I want to talk a little bit about today to give you a sort of a sense of how all that works for me is to talk about the Fairview board that I'm on. Um, first of all, let me just speak a little bit more directly about my uh, working with this board as a public board. I, I think uh, sometimes people forget how hard it is to, to do everything in public. It's not wrong, it's just challenging. And, it, and, and in order to be accurate and transparent and make sure the public has access to what you're doing and how you're doing it, uh, it requires a lot of a lot of work, and I think it's very rewarding though because you literally put everything in, in front of the, the public to see, and they get a chance to understand what was the rationale for what you're doing. And I think the public mission of uh, like the Board of Regents, for example, is a great example of a public board as a governing board, a constitutional governing board. I mean, you have more sort of authority than, than most boards as a constitutional uh, uh, governing board. Uh, it's important that, the, that people understand what decisions you make and why and how you go about that process. There's this whole process you've used to make the selection of the interim president is a good example of the kind of transparency that I think people appreciate and understand and, and want to see more of. Uh, I think the key to, to, uh, and some of the challenges, frankly, going forward for this new board, as a collectively you're a little bit different now, is to make sure that this board works as a, as a board to decide how to engage with the administration, how to engage with the public, how do you all do it in a way that promotes your ability as, a, as individuals, bringing the talents you all have collectively to this board and making sure that they all uh, form part of, part of your overall uh, agreed mission. It's not easy and it takes a lot of work. One of the things I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that can happen. I've never, I don't recall ever having an unsupported a board decision since I've been here at the University of Minnesota, so I can't give that as an example, but I will give another example, and uh, that one's pretty public, and that's the Fairview Board. So Dr. Toller, Dr. Geller, and myself serve as university-designated members of the Fairview uh, Health System Board, and as such, that's a private 501c3 board. And so I will be careful today in what I say because I don't have the authority to simply uh, discuss matters that are um, confidential to that board. But I can discuss a lot of things because some of the letters we've written back and forth, some of you have seen and, and read in the paper. Um, but this is a situation where we've had a disagreement. I and Dr. Toller and Dr. Geller have had a disagreement with the direction of that, that board. And we made it very public, and that is the proposed merger that uh, Sanford has made to Fairview was brought to the board uh, without the uh, understanding or knowledge of the university designated board members, which I found to be problematic. But 
also uh, with the idea of being a business deal. I, I think we all can understand that with Fairview's financial situation, wanting to uh, partner with someone who could help provide more resources is, is not a good thing. Going back to my original tool, their revenues are not exceeding their, their expenditures right now, and they want to solve that. That's a smart business thing to do. And Sanford made a dis business decision to want to be in this market. It's a great market. Who wouldn't want to be in this market? Uh, they're, you know, they're all around South Dakota, North Dakota, um, and Western Minnesota, and I think Iowa. So certainly understand that. But part of the disagreement that I voiced, you know, publicly and to the board uh, was that um, when Fairview. And, and the university reached its agreement in 1997. That was the origination of a academic health system. Fairview changed its mission to include support for the university's health and academic mission. And at that time, uh, there was an agreement that the university would provide representatives on the board and we would advocate on behalf of the university, which was in the best interest of Fairview which is a kind of unique role for a board member to have. Um, so at the forming of that um, relationship in 1997 and the academic health system, it's our belief that any merger needed to make sure that it also dealt with the public mission nature of that academic health center, the university, and that the merging of two private 501c3 entities without uh, regard to uh, and taking into account the need for the academic health center to be front and center, part of that discussion was something that I disagreed with with that board. I've done so in public and at the legislature. But I think it, it shows uh, part of the challenge in being in that situation is making sure that you speak, you know, with clarity about what you're doing and, and you speak with clarity about my representation on that board is not as Myron Franz, it's as the senior vice president of the University of Minnesota. In that role, I have a duty to advise you all about the appropriateness or lack thereof for different positions that they may take that involve the university. So as you know, we're continuing to work through that disagreement and we are continuing to promote uh, our five point plan, which we, which for the academic health system, which would require that the academic health center at the University of Minnesota be front and center to uh, to what we do going forward, that we uh, transfer some of the governance of some of these university assets or facilities to Minnesota University of Minnesota governance, that we develop a new partnership with Fairview or whomever going forward because we know as a university system we cannot stand alone. We have to be a partner with some other health system. And number three is, or four, I guess, is to uh, to work on the development of a, ultimately a new hospital that would replace the East Bank Hospital in the medical district, the health district that we already have bought the land for. And then the final one is to make sure that we invest in these current facilities to get us to that replacement hospital. So we've been very uh, uh, upfront and, and uh, honest about our disagreements with that with that uh, board. Uh, and, and you know, being obviously a member of the, uh, supporting this public board, uh, we the senior leadership, uh, the university have tried to do that as openly and as clearly as we can, and yet still honoring some of the discussions we're having as a private board with the Fairview board system. So it's a complex, it's a complex situation. But I think I just want to end on talking a little bit about how important it is that we get this right in terms of the future. Of the University of Minnesota Medical Center, and and your role as as a board of regents will continue to be a critical part of this as we bring suggestions or ideas to you about making sure that the academic health mission of the University of Minnesota is governed by, directed by the University of Minnesota. That the University of Minnesota physicians is an independent group, not an employee group of any academic health system. That we support the medical center, which has attained new recognition recently, that we believe that that is in the best interest of the state of Minnesota for for our health care, for our family's health care. And, you know, when you look at the doctors and the researchers that we have here in Minnesota, you, you realize they come here to be a part of the academic health system. They come to be 
uh, professors at the university and engage in research and engage in clinical care. And it's that clinical care uh, where we are able to deliver on that mission about taking research and turning it into enhancing or improving the standard of care in the community. We all know that treatments have changed over time. They change over time in part because research is brought to the clinician, to the doctor, and, and that's delivered to the patient. And so it's that constant uh, need to improve and enhance our standard of care through research at, at the University of Minnesota. So that's sort of the nature of the of the um, conflict that we have, that I have with the uh, with the board that I'm serving on now with, with Fairview. And I think it's, it's, um, it's, it can be challenging. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this board has, has been able to, you know, go through a lot of tough issues and resolve those issues. We're going to be bringing to you a budget proposal for fiscal 24, which will provide an opportunity for this board to, uh, to wrestle with, you know, public issues. So, uh, the, the working with private and, and public boards is a challenge, and I think that uh, the key is, is being transparent and being open and honest so people know what is the disagreement, what are the facts that support the different views, and uh, it keeps every day interesting. Uh, Regent Johnson, thank you. Thank you. Regent Tad Johnson. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Vice President Franz. Uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion are extremely important to our university. With that in mind, could you describe examples of how you have fostered a culture of diversity and inclusion in your current or previous role? As part of your answer, describe the program or policies you have implemented and some challenges you have faced when promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Uh, I think one of the I mean, the question's great, and it's one of the things that we, we all have to uh, wrestle with. And once again, this is not just something you do at certain parts of the day or parts of the week. This has to become a, a really important part of how we work together. I want to talk a little bit about some of the hiring practices and work I did at, at Management and Budget, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we've been doing here at the university. One of the things that I discovered um, when I was at Management and Budget was that state's workforce diversity uh, was below that reflecting what the, the community of Minnesota reflected. And uh, we needed, we knew that we needed to make really significant changes in our recruiting and our training and promotion to make sure that we were much better at identifying persons with disabilities, veterans, racial minorities, and women. So one of the things that I did at MMB was I led one of the largest revisions of the state employment practices in over a decade. At, Management budget, I was uh, both the CFO to the state and the uh, charge of all human relations, uh, human resources. I like to kid, kid with my friend, uh, Vice President Horseman, that at that time, 80% uh, of my time was working on finance and the other 80% was working on HR, <laughs> which I think he appreciates. You cannot ignore HR, it's, it's, and you shouldn't. And I think that, uh, so what we tried to do at, at MMB was to uh, challenge, challenge ourselves to make sure that the statewide workforce reflected the population of Minnesota. So people could see in the state workforce exactly the, the representation that we had in, in, the, uh, in the population. In the area of talent development, for example, one of our strategies was to centralize the delivery of all employee training so all the employees across the state, 30 some thousand, uh, got the same uh, kind of um, uh, training when it came to, uh, uh, to training and development, uh, making sure that when we were hiring, we had hiring committees, we had hiring practices that required the development of diverse pools. I mean, you, you just can't expect diverse outcomes to change if you don't start at the very beginning of the process and make sure that the pool to begin with is diverse. Um, one of the things we showed that uh, we were able to, we saw retention rates go up. As you, I think as you improve training, as you improve opportunities for people, you improve, you enhance retention. And retention is a big, big cost, not only uh, administratively, but financially, to lose talented people and have to replace them. Um, we had about, on 2015, about 9% of our employees uh, identified as a racial minority at MMB, and just two years, we had over 17% of 
identifying as racial or ethnic minorities. In, in the MMB um, leadership roles, we had about 5% that identified that way, and we had over 10% after just several years. So we tried to develop teams that would recruit, hire, train, and retain our talent. Uh, we, we, we created a new statewide recruiter. Uh, we wanted to recruit specifically for the top 1,000 positions in state government. We wanted to enhance not only the pipeline to bring on people, but we wanted to make sure from the top down we were looking at ways to, to increase diversity because those are the people who are making the hires so many times. So it was really, it was really coming at this from both ends that we think we made the real, the real changes that were so substantive and really helped, uh, I think, people uh, integrate into our system in a much more profound way. The other, th some of the things that we've done here that I've been able to do at the university, especially with UMPD, the University of Minnesota Police Department, and that is to make sure that we work with uh, uh, training for implicit bias training for our officers. We have diversity recruitment. We we participate in the Pathways to Policing program. And this is a program that recruits candidates who did not start out in the law enforcement <coughs> path. We get them, we get them in another pathway. A very diverse group of. Um, of folks, you know, one of the things that we've been working on is is uh, the Cloquet Forestry Center and looking at ways to return uh, some of those lands uh, to the Fond du Lac Band at some point to promote uh, justice and diversity with our tribal natives. You know, one of the things we we did in the capital request this year that some of you saw was that we asked to improve the multi multi ethnic resource center on the Morse campus. We specifically asked for money to fund that project. Many times, smaller projects like that, it was only about $3.3 million, are just part of our HEPR uh, funding. But we wanted to make a point and, and to let people know that we were concerned about investment in our other campuses, and in particular at the Morse campus at that particular facility. Um, uh, we have UMPD partners with People Incorporated to provide trauma-informed response training to officers. Our DPS and community engagement team uh, provide work through the annual student summit in the spring and the leadership summit in the fall. We really want to make sure that the students interact with our police officers and understand where they're coming from and that our officers are really well trained to respect and understand the different uh, traditions that come to the university every single day. I mean, our goal, when you talk about safety as, as uh, this focus right now, I'm, I'm talking a little bit more about safety than in general, and that's partly because, you know, we believe safety is everybody's responsibility, and we believe safety includes being respected. And, and to the extent you have a, a, a climate where people respect one another, it, it enhances safety. And I think one of the things we continue to do is to support our training um, throughout the UMPD force to make sure that they, they have that contact. You know, we lost contact, frankly during COVID with some of our officers and the way they connected with students. And we're trying to make sure we get that back. Uh, you're going to be approving, approving, I should say, you're going to be, re I'm going to be recommending to your, for your approval on Thursday uh, at the Finance and Operations Committee, a, a new hire uh, for uh, Vice President of University Service, Alice Roberts Davis, a really talented new diverse hire that we were really excited about. So I think one of the things that um, we try to do is to make sure that we are engaged in DEI activities in a meaningful way. And again, it's, it's something we bring every day to the table, not just you know, on planning for planning purposes. Thank, Thank you. you. Regent Tignanya. Thank you. Um, building and maintaining strong relationships with faculty, staff, and students is essential we're a president of a large, complex, decentralized university with a shared governance model. With that in mind, please share examples of how you have approached building relationships with various groups and stakeholders. How did you engage with each to understand their needs and concerns? Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, this, using an example here and how that worked for me been with the uh, safety issues uh, and going back to that theme. Um, as you know, uh, in 2020, uh, Cedric Alexander came to the university, provided uh, his analysis and report on the challenges that we were facing as a university community uh, in a community where George Floyd was murdered. 
forced to, to reckon with some of those uh, reactions and, and concerns about, about safety for all of our community members. And it was really an important time for us to to take that look. And he provided a lot, you know, I forget the number of recommendations, 60. I mean, there are a lot of recommendations and we've implemented a lot of those. But part of that process though, that report helped us uh, go through the consultative process in ways that I don't think we would have done but for that project. And you may recall during that time, the, uh, the uh, University Senate uh, proposed and adopted a new campus safety committee, which was kind of unusual to have a new committee added at that point. And, it, and, and so that was added at that time. And we also engaged in the MSAFE implementation process with several professors um, to help us you know, walk through that process and let people know what we were doing. I'm trying to think if I can, um, Professor Kathy Quick and um, uh, Professor Mylene Colberth were the uh, leaders of that MSAFE implementation. And so what they did was they took a wide group of uh, wide um, mix of folks around the university community and it got engaged with these recommendations that Cedric Alexander made to our university. And it was through that process that helped us get connected to different views about concern, about respect, about safety, about how do we relate uh, to people. And I think, I think it was through that process that I became, was some of the better learning processes I had for the consultative committee. I had not, work exactly with a consultative committee like this. And I mean, the legislature is sort of a consultative committee, except they always think they're right and the administration always thinks they're right. So it's not always, you know, um, consultative, right? It's sometimes a hand-to-hand -hand combat. But it, um, but, uh, but here at the university, it's really an opportunity for people to listen and share and get to the uh, get to the right decision through through that sharing. And then this MSAFE implementation team helped us tremendously with that. We put together a report uh, the administration did based on that and presented that to, to different committees. And right now, with uh, Chair uh, Edgar Ariaga, who's the chair of the Campus Safety Committee, we're continuing to work through these issues in a way that draws people from all across all of our campuses, across all of our faculty, staff, uh, and uh, employees around the university. So it provides a really great way to engage about public safety, because as you, we all know, everyone's got their concerns and views about public safety, and there's no necessarily right or wrong answer. What there is, is the need to make sure you listen to and respect other people. So part of that ha process led us to form the President's Strategic Safety Advisory Committee. Some of you know that that's an ongoing committee where we bring together students, parents, faculty, and staff, the city of Minneapolis, the MPD, UMPD, and we, what we try to do is make sure that there's a regular form so those folks can talk to and be engaged with uh, the, um, the university at all kinds of different levels. And it's been very helpful in making sure that we get suggestions and comments. I mean, the Dinky Town concerns that we've heard about this weekend, uh, you'll be getting more information about that as we go forward. But th this uh, safety advisory committee has been really helpful in providing that insight and in and to those folks. We began hosting public safety forums. Once again, that was supported by our uh, consultative process folks. They really wanted to make sure that we were engaged with the local community so people could hear directly from us. Um, we launched our gopher safety strategy as part of this process uh, to make sure that we have uh, plans to reduce on-campus and off-campus off um, crime and, and safety issues. As you know, the uh, the crime level, the crime activity level at the universe, on the university proper has been relatively stable, maybe even down over the last several years. It's clearly those areas right off of campus, the Dinky Town area and other areas that we've been experiencing this increase in, in, uh, in, in crime and, and unacceptable behavior. So we will continue to support the Minneapolis Police Department uh, some of you may have seen over the weekend that Chief O'Hara and Chief Clark, our UMPD uh, Chief of Police and the Minneapolis Chief of Police talked to the public and, and explained the efforts that we're making to, to confront these issues. But public safety has been one of those issues that has really worked well for me to engage in this consultative process to understand uh, around the university, 
concerns that people have uh, that we might not otherwise hear otherwise. And I think uh, the, the, the letter that I mentioned earlier from the professors about the shared governance model is, is, is really a vital one that we need to make sure we figure out ways to keep connected to and follow those lead and the learnings that we get from that process. And I think one of the things that, that I've learned is that the more we can let people know in advance of what we're thinking. For example, let me give you an example of how the consultative process wasn't matching very well with our with our budget process. So so on a budget year like last year, our budget to the to MMB is due to October 15th. So that means we need to have our budget prepared in mid-August to present to the board in September for review and action in October. Well, if you're going to have it done in pretty well done in mid-August, then that means you need to start like today. And we actually are starting the process now for the uh, uh, whatever request we might make to the legislature, whether it's capital or or a budget request for next year. And so we were talking about how that just didn't line up this, because so much of that work needs to be done during the summer. And I was meeting with student leaders about a month ago and we were talking about that. And I said, well, you know, really the best thing is to work on it this summer together. And they, they all immediately volunteered to be a part of that. And so I, we, last year we increased the, uh, the, the number of people that we engaged in that budget process. And it was really helpful. Uh, you know, there, as you know, a large chunks of the budget don't change. It's just that little, the little change item, not just a little, but the change items we propose. So we're really focused on a very, very, very small part of the $4 billion budget. But we need to, we need to I think, figure out ways to, this, this summer, for example, figure out more ways to get more people engaged, give their opinion about the, the budget um, that we want to propose. Because this one's critical. We, we will be proposing a uh, capital a bonding bill because it's, Next year, in 2024, the legislature will probably take up a big, a larger bonding bill than, than usual, and we want to make sure that we have our bonding uh, capital request prepared this summer because actually the, the legislature will start coming around and looking at these projects late summer or early fall, so we don't have much time to uh, to to waste on getting ready for that. So I think that by looking through the consultative process, we've we've been able to contact and connect with a number of the faculty and students and staff to make sure that we make these connections that work for their schedules, not just our schedules. Um, and, and let me just uh, end on the public safety note by, by mentioning that I think the uh, one of the things that we'll be doing in the uh, in the uh, June meeting is giving an update on public safety and then in July providing a long term effect or proposal about what we're going to do for the next year. But there's a lot, there's a lot of um, issues to be dealt with that we need engagement on because uh, public safety is one of those areas that, uh, that you really want to make sure you listen to people, you have their views, their concerns are expressed. Um, but we'll be dealing with that uh, I think more and more as we go as we go through this process. But I think um, the consultative process I find to be helpful. Uh, you know, it, it takes time, and you simply have to kind of make time and make sure that the schedule permits it, which, which could be a challenge. Thank you. All right, the next question uh, would normally come to you from Regent Telrabi, but she is not here this morning, so I'm going to take up her question, Senior Vice President Franz. Please describe a time when you were faced with an ethical dilemma in your professional career. Why was it an ethical dilemma, and how did you arrive at your decision on how to handle it? What was the outcome? Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I think what I'll do, uh, give an example of this one is uh, go back to the beginning of COVID-19 uh, because uh, it seemed like every day during COVID-19 was an ethical dilemma. Uh, if you all, I hate to take us back to that point, but if you remember in March of 2020 and April of 2020, we were facing unprecedented challenges and uh, you know, literally uh, life and death decisions needed to be made. And as you may recall, one of the things that happened uh, was the federal government did provide some funds. In fact, we, the state of Minnesota received about $1.8 billion uh, at one time on a wire transfer uh, in, I think it was March or April of 2020. And I immediately looked at that and said, well, first thing we're going to do is set up an accounting process so that our auditors track these dollars spent 
every single penny throughout because there will be a reckoning and this just should be but you know when you're in a when you're in a panic situation not panic but when you're in an emergency situation you start th thinking about spending it before you start accounting for it but we set up a process to do that but the other thing that was really challenging at that time was we didn't know exactly what to do i mean how do you how do you best spend 1.8 billion dollars i mean do you how much how many masks do you buy how many uh, protective equipments do you, uh, things do you buy for people and so um it was not easy and and at that time uh part of the challenge in in dealing with uh the ethical dilemma is what everybody was understandably at the table so we had divided government at the time so the house and senate were under different political control, but we, in order to spend the money from MMB, we had to go through a process where we informed a, a legislative committee about our proposal, what we wanted to do, and how we were going to spend it, and listen, and we'd get their feedback, which was great, but it required a lot of, a, a lot of coordination and a lot of meetings, and there was not a lot of agreement on what to do. Um, one of those early decisions that, that was difficult is, remember, we didn't have testing to begin with. One of the challenges that we had to figure out was how in the world are we going to develop? Well, the goal was to have like 20,000 tests a day uh, back in, in March and April of 2020. And there, there was not an agreement on what were the best tests or how to go about testing. And so uh, uh, we wanted to take some of the money that we had. We had not only the $1.8 billion from the uh, federal government, we also had hundreds of millions of dollars from state government too. And one of the things we had to decide was how do we how can we engage in, in um, selecting the right entities and the right course of action to develop the best possible test as soon as we can? And so uh, I was given like five days to do that and uh, because the governor really wanted to make sure that we started hitting this, these goals quickly. So with the cooperation of the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic, we came up with a proposal uh, in that time period that both entities would work together to solve this problem. It was a great, it was a great example of wonderful minds, talented people coming together for a common cause, but it wasn't a sure thing. And so we were making a commitment um, and it might not work out. And uh, if it didn't work out, we, then we were going to be in out the money and we were going to be a month delayed. So uh, those kind of ethical dilemmas seem to pop up like every day for about six months at the, at the state. But I think, that once again, those, um, the way that I think the way I was able for me to handle those kind of challenges is to talk to a lot of people, listen to other voices. Uh, you, you, I think the key is to re remembering that other people are going to view ethical situations differently than you are, and they're going to bring different concerns that you might have. And I, and I found that to be very rewarding uh, to, to listen uh, to different people about what was the right thing. And, and our legislative committee with them that had different voices on there um, were really critical for us to figure out what was the right, what was the right thing to do. Another, another dilemma was, I don't mean to be morbid, but we were running out of places for bodies at that time. All the uh, funeral homes were full. And uh, we all saw those pictures of what happened in New York. And uh, we didn't want that to happen here in, in Minnesota. And so we proposed buying a warehouse and potentially turning it into a morgue if we needed one. And uh, there's a lot of disagreement about that. And uh, uh, we finally did it. And, and but the, the goal was that, well, we simply have to treat our, uh, our, our folks with respect and, and, and make sure we have these resources available. And, uh, and then in the long run, if we didn't use it, we could sell the property back and, and make money, which we did. Uh, but thank goodness we didn't need it. But it was just, you know, how do you decide that do you buy a warehouse with the possibility of turning it into a, a state work? So there are these kind of challenges uh, that we all face from time to time are best uh, best dealt with, um, listening to other people, getting good advice, and making sure that you um, make a decision that's best, based on the best advice you can get. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Regent Turner. First of all, um, Senior Vice President Franz, I just would, as a COVID ICU nurse, I, I appreciated listening to um, some of the decisions that had to be made. 
other than what I had to make in the ICU. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And I appreciate your perspective. Um, my question is, the president has to navigate political realities and external pressures in managing con controversial issues. Please give an example when you had to make a tough decision on a controversial or high profile issue. How did you handle it? What approach did you take managing that issue that was polarizing or divisive among different groups? Thank you, uh, Regent Turner. What I'd like to do here is talk a little bit about our peak initiative, the uh, position for excellence, alignment, and knowledge. Um, some of you, many of you know a lot about it. Some of you probably haven't heard that much about it. Um, but this is, this is one that has a lot of different pressures from different groups about how to go about doing it. It's, it, it can be controversial, and, and uh, we've been working on it now for several years. This board has been, uh, we've been in front of this board many times explaining kind of where we are, but uh, the, the importance of this and, and the delicacy of this is, I think, important, and it can be polarizing. And I think one of the things that uh, my colleague in this, uh, Vice President uh, Ken Horseman, and I have learned is that communication is the key. So let me tell you a little bit about um, how we how we started using this peak initiative and why. It really began in 2020. Um, uh, the, the initial thoughts about doing this, and it was in 2020, 2021, that we did the study to figure out an assessment really of can we really uh, reduce administrative expenses? You all have to remember that wasn't that long ago that the Wall Street Journal article, what was it, 2013? I can never remember the exact year. Criticized the university for being one of those universities that had way too high of administrative costs. And so, and there's, as you all, we all know, we get criticized from time to time from uh, our friends in the legislature and other folk, other places that we spend too much money on administrative costs, not enough on teaching, research, and service. And clearly our goal, the mission, is to spend every penny we can out of every dollar we can on teaching, research, and service. So how do you do that? And, you know, the University of Minnesota is a very decentralized university with uh, a lot of the different functions, uh, HR functions, finance functions, uh, IT functions uh, delegated around to the different colleges and campuses. So that when that happens, what you find is you, you and which is what we found during the assessment, that people were uh, recreating work around the system. Sometimes the work processes were unclear. Uh, sometimes people were forced to do two, three, four different things and never getting the training and recognition of doing those things. But uh, And so it was, it was confusing. Accountability was unclear. Uh, so what we were doing was creating a system uh, where our employees weren't given clear signals, weren't given clear guidance, clear training, and clear promotional opportunities to be experts and to deliver the services that we want. So a key piece of what we wanted to do was to find those areas that we felt um, we could centralize and have more uh, central uh, responsibility in the area of human resources, finance, marketing communications, and information technologies. So now the roles can vary differently, greatly across different units, but one of the things we wanted to focus on was how can we bring uh, the training and the these folks together so that they all perform at the same level. They all have the same opportunities, they all get paid the same, and they all have the same promotional opportunities. One of the things that we found was that um, uh, in, in order to be consistent, we needed to make sure that, uh, that we had some centralized uh, control over some of this. So we tried to develop consistent responsibilities across the institutions for the same title, for example. We, had, we brought together a community of specialists who worked together that allowed for network and, and efficient backup support. We wanted to make sure we had the opportunity, opportunity to train and develop expertise in areas of focus. But it's really been people-centered. The primary goal of, of this is to become more efficient, but to do so by providing opportunities for our employees to have better career paths, better training, and be recognized for the talented work that they do. Um, so, what we, so what we're in the process of doing now is the implementation phase where we're able to um, in, we're able to bring some of these uh, activities in finance, human resources, university branding, and other functions to a more central location. 
And I think one of the things that we want to do is by focusing on certain units we have about, I forget the number now, nine or 10 units in the first phase of implementation. So we're being very methodical, very careful in how we go about this process to make sure that people have an opportunity to sign up for or express their interest in doing something different or in doing a, in a different uh, location. It doesn't mean physical location, it just means that the reporting structure might change. So I think one of the things that We've worked across all the different system campuses. Uh, we want to make sure that all the units have the same degree of services available. I mean, one of the things right now that we find is that some units don't have the same ability, the same uh, resources to have the, the same kind of HR that they would like to have or the same kind of finance or IT that we, they like to have. We want to make sure that all the units, all the colleges, all the different divisions of the, of the university have access to the same level of communications and, and IT. So um, we, we were concerned about limited resources in the future, and we were concerned that people would seek, continue to criticize universities for spending too much money on our administrative costs. One of the things that we've done is, to, as I mentioned, to make PK a, a uh, people-centric program is we believe we can be more efficient, but we also can provide better opportunities for our employees. We are not looking to reduce our employee count. In fact, we're below, historically, we're at a low employee count level right now. And we don't, we need more employees. We don't need fewer employees. And what we need to do is make sure that we retain the current talent that we have. We bring on a new, we recruit new talent to fill up these positions that we have open. And then we do so in a way that's strategic and people are engaged in, in roles that are recognized and both financially and promotion wise and give them an opportunity to perform at the level that they're capable of. So we are continuing to uh, work through that implementation process. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of communication. Uh, I just want to say that the teams that we have working on this have been tremendous. The, the leadership and the different units have been really helpful. The chancellors of the, of the system campuses have been engaged in working through this with us, as well as some of the local units at the um, university. We plan to phase this in over time. Uh, we'll do the units, uh, we're doing some units this year, we'll do some more in the next three years till we get to the to the point where we've uh, implemented this around around the university. But it's a, it's a commitment that's been made uh, to, to make sure that we deliver on our mission and we do it in a way that retains talent, attracts talent, and does so in an efficient manner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Fairhill, and, and just so you know, uh, Senior Vice President Franz, we have 13 minutes left. Uh, this will be the last question that we will direct to you, and then with what time is left over, you'll have an opportunity to ask us questions. Go ahead, Regent Fairhill. Good morning. Uh, the President is charged with leading one of the world's largest public research universities. In your experience, what is the role of the Chief Executive in sustaining and growing the university's $1 billion research portfolio? Thank you. Uh, Regent Verhalen, I'm sure you all uh, received the letter, I hope you did, from uh, Vice President Shashank Priya about as he uh, had a research here at the university, his, his um, wanting to make sure that we support research. And I couldn't agree more with him. Uh, in fact, um, about a month ago, I had an opportunity to go with uh, 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 Vice President Priya to uh, Penn State, to Johns Hopkins and the Pentagon to look at more opportunities for the university to increase and enhance its um, research portfolio. So I want to just, before I forget about this one idea that I have, you know, one of the things that I noticed this last year working at the legislature much more than I normally would because of the, uh, the, the, the opportunities that, that I had to participate, um, one of the things I learned was how many different research components the university is in, or, projects that the university is engaged with at the state. All There's so many different state agencies where we've got a project going or a research, we're supporting a research component, but they're like scattered everywhere. And they're, I don't know if anyone actually knows all of them at, at, collectively. And I think one of the things that we could partner with the state to develop a joint uh, coordinated science working group, because I, I do think that one of the things that we need to do as a state is to make sure that we spend our research dollars wisely and uh, get and frankly get some of the recognition 
the work that we, the university, is doing around this state to support state research. So that's one idea that I, I sort of throw out there as something we can work on. But one of the things that I've learned uh, through um, Vice President Priya and the other folks and, and some of the deans in the research area is how important it is to provide, I mean, it, we all know it provides economic benefit to the state. I mean, there's jobs. There's the, the, the economic rollout from research is dramatic for the state of Minnesota. But it also provides wonderful opportunities for our students to be engaged in research as undergraduates, but then also for our graduate students and PhD students. I mean, we have just an incredibly talented group of people. I mean, this university brought us the pacemaker, the retractable seat belts, which I didn't know about, I thought it was fascinating. The world's first successful open heart surgery, disease resistant, resistant crops that, that have fed billions. We've had so many successes at the university and we're continuing to do that. I think one of the things we've got some, we're working on invasive species protection for across our state, <clears throat> new cancer treatments, innovations in MRI scanning, more sustainable and renewable materials to make plastics, mining and mineral processing. Uh, there are so many things, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm at the end here. Oops. We're doing so much in this research area at, uh, that is, that's not only important uh, just for the dollar amount that we get in terms of over a billion dollars, but it, it connects us with the state so well. It, and it really does make Minnesotan lives better. I mean, I think we sometimes forget we actually do save lives. We actually do improve lives. We improve many things around. I, I want to end on an example. Um, um, it just turns out to be my neighbor, uh, Dr. Margaret McMillan at the university. She is the uh, uh, pediatric blood and marrow trans transplantation and cellular therapy physician at the Univ University of Minnesota. Um, one of the things that um, she's been working on has been a, about 20 years ago, 25% of the children with a disease called uh, Fakoni an anemia is a rare genetic blood disease with no known cure. And uh, it's, it causes bone marrow, bone marrow failure and cancer. So about 25% of the children with this disease um, only survived three years ago, uh, for three years, I'm sorry, after the transplant. That was about 20 years ago. Now, thanks to the research that she's done, uh, the life expectancy has gone from the teenage years to the mid 30s. And with the ongoing research that she's doing, she expects that to increase even even further in, into the future. It just it just underscores the tremendous value that research in general, in this particular case, healthcare research and treatment uh, research, cancer treatment research, is so vitally important to our state and to make sure that we uh, deliver service and, and, and stuff to the and, and opportunities for the state that, we're, that we've been asked to do. I mean, it's an honor for all of us, I think, to serve the University of Minnesota to make sure that our strategic plan continues to support this kind of activity, this kind of health care delivery, as well, as well as the other areas that I mentioned before. So I'm excited about the opportunities uh, here in research. Healthcare and otherwise, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to supporting that in the best way that I can. I think one of the things that Dr. Toller has taught me, uh, dean of our medical school, is the the interest and the uh, vibrancy that his people bring to the research, to the clinical opportunities at the university, and how they are so ready to take on this next challenge. And that's why we're so excited about this opportunity to make sure we get the healthcare right. I mean, as you know, we're still in the, in the processes of trying to figure out what's the next best step for the university uh, with our relationships going forward. But the key is to lean into that, I think, and to lean into it in a way that makes sure that we at the university maintain our position as a leader for helping the people in Minnesota to live healthy lives and to save lives. Thank you, Regent. Regent Wheeler. Yeah, thank you. I guess we have, uh, let's see, in our six minutes remaining, um, that ends our list of questions. Um, and what questions do you have for us? Or what else would you like us to know? Oh, this is fun. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so so I, would, I think one of the keys, in fact, you know, as you all have been deliberating in the last several weeks uh, and talking about some of your goals and ideas, I think one of the, one of the, um, Real questions that I would have is, 
to the extent, what you think are the priorities for the interim president? I mean, I know we're all looking, ultimately, um, I think we're all looking for how does this position help us get to the next president? But what do you think are some of the priorities that you can uh, describe for the interim president in the immediate future? Let me, let me tr take a first stab at this and then open it up. Let me say that our expectation is once the uh, interim president is selected and is on board is that the board will meet with that individual to develop the priorities for the next year as a board. It'll be a board discussion with that president. But that said, uh, my colleagues may have individual opinions here as to what they think are the priorities that need to be attended to in the next year. And I think it would be appropriate for them to share them with you. But we look forward to having that as a group discussion and a group decision with the interim president. So with that caveat, anybody want to weigh in? Oh, yeah. All right, <laughs> Regent Hipsch. Um. Like uh, Chair Mayeron said, the, the goals, the board goals will be handled in July or whatever at a retreat. But for me, I, I think one of the big goals is public opinion and uh, to change. Uh, I mean, we really do so many good things here. and But the public opinion seems to weigh in on some of the not so good things. And I, I just think we have to change that. We have to change that narrative. We have to change how people feel about the U. Um, that for me, that's the most vital thing that we could do in the next year. So we get uh, good candidates to become the permanent president that want to come here and, and want to lead us long term. So thank you, Regent Hipsch. Anybody else wish to weigh in? Yes, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, system enrollment will be one. All right. Uh, Regent Turner, I see that hand. <laughs> thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Senior Vice President Franz, I'm uh, glad you brought up, um, you know, how you discussed with some of us uh, things, how we can expand and help with what, um, guys, I'm really tired, so sorry, I've been up all night. Um, Regent Heapsh had just said, how can we help? collectively as a board to uh, bring about a, a better um, a better way of portraying us to the public. I, I, I hear in, in your words that you are on board with, especially, uh, you know, some of our new, uh, newer ones, you know, myself included, that are more than up to the task and more than willing to help out in this endeavor to, uh, show the public just how wonderful University of Minnesota system is. And um, so anything that you can do to allow us to be partners and to really do some active work would be really appreciated if, if I'm hearing you right. Well, <laughs> Regent Turner, you are. And I think, uh, and I like what, what you said and what uh, uh, Chair Mayron said, I think the key is working as a group. So I, as you suggested, um, Chair Mayron, as the board coming together and deciding what is our focus, because people like to hear from students. I mean, I'll just, I'll take the legislature, for example. They like to hear from students. They like to hear from regions. They like to hear, obviously, from the president and others. So, but I think the key is how can we do this effectively so that we're all on, you know, we have different voices, we have different areas of interest. But I think the key will be coming together as a group and deciding how do we deploy the best resources. And not just the folks in this room. There are a lot of other folks out there too, right, that we can deploy in ways that can really make those connections. So, yeah, I think engagement and, and connection is, that's what it's all about. It's a, it's a uh, what do they call it? It's a contact sport for this next year. <laughs> other comments or answers to Senior Vice President France? All right, not seeing any, you're off the hot seat. Thank you very much for spending the morning with us here. We really appreciate it. Thank you all very Thank much. you very much. Thank you. That will conclude our morning session. We will resume at 12.15. Thank you.
The special meeting of the Board of Regents is reconvened. Welcome back, everyone. We will now welcome Mary Holtz Clause. Close by. So okay. Good afternoon. Have a seat. You. You're welcome. You. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity to be with you today and congratulations to our new regents. So I look forward to working with you and continuing working with uh, all of you. So wonderful. Thank wonderful. You. Mary, the board has a series of questions that are we've prepared for our time here today. I know you've had an opportunity to review them in advance. Uh, each, just so you know, each candidate has received the exact same set of questions from the board. And our intention is to walk through all 11 of them. And the 12th question then is the question where we turn it over to you to see if you have any questions of us, providing there's sufficient time during the interview for us to entertain those questions. We have 90 minutes to spend with you, so we will all be efficient with our time. With that, uh, let's get started with our first question, which I, I'm going to put to you. What specifically interests you about the interim president role at this moment in time? And what do you see as one key strength you would bring to this role? Thank you. Well, uh, today I have a few stories that'll be ten, uh, really kind of give you a background about who I am. And I hope the tenets of leadership that I would bring to this role. You know, I've been at the University of Minnesota now for six years, and it has been phenomenal. If you think about, we have a billion dollars of research dollars, four billion dollar campaign. And this past year, welcomed the most diverse group of freshmen uh, what we've ever welcomed across the whole system. So this university is a magnet for all who want to grow and pro progress. And I believe in the University of Minnesota because I know it transforms lives. We just had our commencement at Crookston and I saw those transformations. So, and this position really reflects my values, my values of access and the power of education. So my experiences as a champion, as an advocate, and kind of calming the waters as I recently did as we went through a leadership transition are some of the reasons that I'm here today. I care very deeply about our mission and have lots of years of experience, which you'll hear about today, in higher education and managing organizations. And I know together that we can make this wonderful university even better and even stronger. So thank you for the chance to be with you today. And the second part of that question, you said you have 11 questions. Actually, most of them have two or three parts. So it's closer to 22 or All 33. All right. <laughs> Somebody was counting. <laughs> so that question is, what strength, singular, do you bring to this position? And that is relationships. Developing and strengthening diverse relationships, relationships across many audiences and many publics. And you know, you're going to hear a lot of this from me today, but I'm about outcomes. And the outcome of an effective relationship is met when other voices are speaking for you and for your goals. And so with the Minnesota legislature in this coming year, we can't miss a beat. We must continue to grow our relationships with all of our organizations, external, and of course, our internal relationships with our faculty and staff so that they can continue to thrive and excel at what they do. And of course, the relationships with our students and their organizations. I don't know if any of you have ever sat in this seat before and somebody asked you, describe yourself in one word or two words. Well, I got the one word answer or question one time. I said, I'm a grower. I'm a grower of relationships. I'm a grower of organizations. I'm a grower of people trying to help them grow and succeed a grower of opportunities. 
And I'm also literally a grower because I'm a farmer and have that third, that next probably fifth generation of farmers um, in another state. So as I reflect upon why, these are the reasons why I put my name in to be considered. And thank you for the opportunity to sit here with you today. Thank you. At this time, I will ask my colleague to the left, uh, Regent Davenport, to put the next question. Thank you, Mrs. Good afternoon, Chancellor Post Class. As a large, complex organization, the university faces many complicated and multifaceted issues, including such things as the cost of attendance, employee wages and benefits, public safety, and many others. At times, a solution for one issue puts pressure on another. Please provide an example of where you had to address a complex issue. What was it? What made it complex? And how did you approach it? And what was the outcome? Well, I think we've probably all had our kind of dark and stormy nights, both professionally and, and personally. And one of my dark and stormy nights was um, uh, starting in January, February of 2009. Those of you remember, that was a financial crisis. And at that time, I was the number two position for the Iowa State University Extension Program. The individual who was in charge of that program had his own dark and stormy nights because he was in charge of the APOU organization at that time. And so much of our situation in uh, in Iowa at that time in 2009, most of it was under my, my shoulders and the leadership team that I had underneath me. So at that time, starting in February of 2009, I'll give you a timeline. Um, uh, we started to see that the state budget was tanking. It, had, it was hemorrhaging badly. And at that time, Iowa State received a fourth of their um, total budget for extension from the state. And the other very important partner were our counties, our county offices. And they also gave and very important partners to that. And the way the, the way the organization was organized at that time is the counties remitted their monies to the state and then we gave them back to them. So incredibly important partners. So as February and March continues, it looks like things are not going to go well. I immediately started to convene and try to get input. So we asked our 1,000 employees. We asked our 10,000 members of our extension council. I went to legislators, went to people to try to find out both their ideas and thoughts that they had if we had to make draconian measures, what we could and should be doing. And through that input process then, began to hear from the individuals Extension touched one out of three people in the state of Iowa. So it had a very significant impact on all of those individuals. And as the time went on into March, it became very apparent that we need to start to plan. So it convened a group of senior administrators. I always say the usual suspects, but the directors of finance, your strategic initiatives, and some of our county partners to scenario plan. We didn't know if our budget cut was going to be 5% or 50%. I said, let's not plan beyond 50 because an organization has to be strong and viable. And at that time we set our tenets. What are those elements that we must honor and respect in um, our organization as we plan to go forward? First and foremost was to ensure that there was a presence in every county, that extension had the ability as it had done since 1918 to impact individuals and to help people in the community. And I remember somebody said, well, we can probably handle this by just you know, doing incremental things here and there. And I said, no, we have to do this strategically. We're not gonna die of a thousand cuts. An organization has to make sometimes very difficult decisions. And I'll be sharing with you later on a few others of those that I've had to make. Because we need to make sure that it's sure that we're resourcing the institution going forward so it is strong and can strategically meet the future needs, not the past needs that we've been meeting. So we went through this process. We went through scenario planning. And uh, suddenly it came down that uh, in a couple of days, the legislature is going to tell you what your uh, cut is going to be. And by the way, you need to give us your plan uh, to the Board of Regents um, you know, within a day or two after that and have this all executed and ready to go. And so as the end of April, we got that information, it's a 25% cut. 
but we had done the planning. We had really based our plan upon those tenants that we held dear to ensure that the counties continue to have a voice, that they continue to be represented. And um, so since we had done that scenario planning, we presented three days later. First of all, we told because we were going to have to be making um, personnel decisions and cutting positions, I made sure that everybody who was affected knew before everybody else in the public knew. So we did that and then went to the Board of Regents and gave our plan about how we were going to do that. And from there, then 60 days later, uh, July 1st, um, we had to make sure that that plan was in place. So what I did and what we ended up doing is we eliminated a, a 100 county extension positions. We had 100 counties or 99 counties, 100 offices, but we gave the money back to the counties so that they continue to have resources. Because of the way extension funding at the county level was based upon property taxes, there were some areas that had higher property tax bases than others. Mm. So when we came back with a regional approach, we ensured that those areas that didn't have as many resources had more regional directors. Those regions were smaller and we put off, we put individuals who could be of assistance with them. They kept their county directors. We had a strong regional group as we went forward. And uh, from that part, we've made that very difficult decision, but it was based upon listening, understanding multiple partners. And when we cut, of course, that affected the partnership with the counties. And so we had to find a way to make it right to them. After we had made this public uh, announcement to the Board of Regents, and actually prior to that, prior to that, I remember um, I'd always put about 60 or 70,000 miles on my car as I went across Iowa. And so prior to that, we did listening sessions. And after that, we came out and met, I remember about 50 community and regional and town meetings to explain to people why we had done what we had done after we had taken their initial input back in February and March. So sometimes decisions have to be very quickly this is one we had time to prepare. And as we go forward, I was gonna say, that's a very important part of, of board leadership and presenting to the board, is if I see things in the horizon to let you know immediately so we can begin to, to plan together and to create a better outcome with that. This was one where, as I said, I thought we were quite effective. Um, fast forward, it's now 2023. That organization in Iowa continues to grow. It has its strategic areas where we created the baseline for it to be resourced. And I still think it's a treasure for the state of Iowa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Farnsworth, if you would present question three. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, Chancellor. Um, the president delegates a significant portion of the strategic management of the university to a team of senior leaders and others. Tell us about a time when you successfully developed and convened a team of leaders or experts to implement a strategic objective. What was the objective? Who were the leaders involved? Describe how you developed the team as well as any uh, challenges you faced. And then what steps did you take to overcome those challenges? And what was the outcome of their work? I laughed at the challenges. <laughs> so um, those of you that are a little uh, longer in tooth, like me, you probably remember in the 1980s and the 1990s, those were very difficult times for the agricultural economy around, across the United States. And uh, even into the 90s, it was still just very much a slow kind of recovery process. At that time, I was a community and business development specialist with Iowa State University Extension. And I kept hearing individuals um, that were out in these communities that were trying to find ways to farmers, farmers and communities that were trying to find ways in the case of farmers to add value to their commodities. In the communities, they were trying to look at different business opportunities, different business strategies so that their communities could be stronger and more viable. And so as a true land grant professional, what we do is we listen, we hear what our clients are telling us and then we take that power of the university, we take the power of the experts and go back 
to our experts, go back to our university and say, what can we do? And that was the situation uh, where I really started a, a program called the Value Added Agriculture Program. So I was hearing these farmers, I was hearing communities, and started to talk to my, my colleagues at Iowa State. Started to look in the literature as a good scholar, and there was not a lot there about how we could help and assist these groups. And so I reached out to colleagues across the United States. We started to have conversations over a year's time period. Um, and in a true academic fashion, I said, we need to get together. We need to talk about ways that we can support these efforts. Because many communities, as I said, they're looking for opportunities to bring their young people back to prevent and provide opportunities for the, the brain drain. We had a lot, of, a lot of new populations that were coming in. How could we be supportive as the land grant to help them with research-based information so that there weren't just a lot of throwing darts out there and seeing what you're getting, but that we were actually providing value to, to our customers and to our, to our clients to our communities. And so we convened this group. Um, I remember it was in Perry, Iowa. I'll tell you that's, that, that community for a reason, because I'm gonna talk about them a little bit later in one of my, one of my experiences. Got that group together and we had bankers, we had um, economic developers, we had entrepreneurs, and we had university professors, we had university experts. What can we do? And we came up with some strategies. We all kind of sat there and go, this is great. What are we going to do? And we left. I remember sitting there, called a few people, a few, a few of my colleagues up and go, we said, we see a need. What are we going to do? And uh, so being one of those people that can sometimes be a little bit impatient, it's like, okay, let's do something. And so let's go forward and let's take what we can do and help these students. So I started with as, you, as I always do with every problem, and that is, what problem are we trying to solve? The problem we were trying to solve was profitability for farmers, viability of communities, and helping to represent and help provide business-based decisions for all groups going forward. What do we currently know? That was the inventory phase. I always call that the inventory phase. And so in this case, our inventory phase was when we convened as this group. We're finding out what everybody knew what our expertise says, and also helping to define what questions do we need to answer. What are alternatives? It's something I always use in my problem solving. And then what is going to be our reality? What are we going to do? What's the outcome that we're going to come from that? My staff has heard this so many times, I bet they can even repeat for you that process. And then, then the last question is, it is what it is, and what are we going to do about it? And so that is always the sort of grounded the way I go about problem solving. So in this scenario, we had to work so we could develop successful and profitable businesses that add value, as I said, communities to prosper, to bring those next generation of people in. And this was an area where I can't say it any better than to say there were some people that weren't really necessarily scrupulous about how they were going about presenting opportunities to individuals. So how did we separate the wheat from the chaff? How do we go about having, as an academic, research base information and keep the rest away so that our people would not be victims of some of that? So during that process, as I said, uh, we continue to really be grounded on, on trying to keep that. And as an academic, we're always seeking a search for truths. And so as we went forward, I looked about that problem. It was really a twofold problem. The first one was finding the human resources, finding the people who have the skill sets. And then a tenant I do believe in, and that is resources follow good, competent people and good ideas. And so with that, I went about myself at Iowa State creating my own team of individuals who could help there. And by the way, I had one FTE, me. That was all the FTEs that were allocated for this effort at that time. And so I had to go about finding individuals first who want to be, and I use this also when hiring everybody, to find people who want to be part of a greater good. And fortunately in education, that speaks for itself because that's the type of people that we attract. 
we have to create a culture of partnering. We couldn't do this by ourselves. We are always stronger when we work through others. And for my own staff, they didn't necessarily that I was hiring and bringing on, they didn't necessarily have all the tools, all the education that they needed. And none of us do. And that's part of our wonderful experience as educators is to provide professional development and assistance and help so that people can be better at their jobs. Something I hold very true as a tenant. And I also encourage my staff to really think about it from a balanced approach. We hear it, but I actually, as I come older to believe it, the work-life balance. There are times, of course, where we had to pull all-nighters to put a grant together or to help finish a feasibility study. But we've driven at times, but we must always honor and respect our people, all of our employees. And one of the things which people know about me is I have fun and I like to celebrate our successes and encourage people to better themselves. Sometimes, actually, that means some people need to move on. When people leave, I say, that's great for them. And what a wonderful testament to our institution because we were part of their development process and then try to hire them back later. And then provide opportunities for growth for individuals. So those are the aspects that I look for when I'm hiring people. Those were the aspects that I look for when I brought on my team of value added. We ended up uh, hiring close to 30 people uh, over a couple year time period to meet this demand and need. And then we went and found resources. Part of those resources came from contracts and grants. A lot of those came from our state legislature, it came from Iowa legislature. I think Minnesota also uh, allocated some monies towards that effort. As our legislators saw and heard the good work that we were doing and the impact that we were doing, the resources followed. At the same time, the federal government was also, in this case, US, US Department of Agriculture, were also seeing what was going on. And so they put out a request for proposal, an RFP, uh, for creating a center that would be a value-added ag center across the United States. So this RFP came out and, you know, those of us that have been in, in the area of working in research, sometimes, you know, RFPs are meant for somebody and this one was not meant for my consortium. I'd had a 30 day window, which is almost impossible when you're bringing together multi multi campuses. And uh, we kept hearing, eh, no, that's that's meant for blah, 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 university. I call around and talk to some of my colleagues and they go, well, it sounds great, but we're in this other consortium. We're in this other one. So we put together a group from Kansas State University, University of Oklahoma, University of California and Iowa State uh, for this consortium group. In one month's time, um, we really had a vision, but our vision needed to be articulated in a document that turned out pretty fat because we asked our partners to be part of that with us and our partners provided us so many letters of support and we're part of our advisory group as later on when we receive that. So we got one month to get all of those commitments together. And um, at the end of the day, we submitted it. Um, fingers crossed, got the phone call um, about I think 30, 50 days later and said, congratulations. And I remember my president in Iowa State called me. At that time, I was not a faculty member. I was an extension member. And he said, he goes, I think you just received the biggest grant that Iowa State has ever received, at least at that time. And I said, well, that's great, but we've got so much work to do. Thank you for the, thank you for the good news, but we got to get going. And I think my role has always been to find leaders, help grow those leaders. In this case, nobody else said, they go, my colleagues in other, in other states would go, you know, that's great, I don't have time. And it's like, okay, I'll do it, because I believe in this. If you believe in a mission, you find the time to do what was necessary. We put that together. Um, so going forward on that, um, so this was a multi-institutional and very complex organization. Um, and, um, and it had funding for three, four years. So then it became strategically, okay, I just want this to be a one-off. This and the value of what we were doing responses we were getting as we were working across our states and across the United States and ultimately around the world was the impact was there. So how do we continue it? 
it was all sometimes, as we know, sometimes uh, the secret of, of our success is timing. And the secret for this was the fact that the uh, head of the Senate Agricultural Committee um, was from, from my state and I had some great support, I remember from Minnesota at the same time on the health side. Um, but what we were able to do was to have longer term funding put into the farm bill and a testament of maybe sometimes surviving is that this group continues tw almost 20 years later. And the impacts, you can Google it, it's called the Agriculture Marketing Resource Center. The impacts that we have made, and I hope the help that we have done, the businesses that didn't go forward, as well as the businesses that did go forward, because we provided them research-based information education, tools. And so that, if you looked at my multiple page resume, a lot of that was providing that to, to this very much based upon what the university, how the university, how the land grant university can be of assistance and help to all of its people. And it's been such joy for me to, to watch as this organization has particularly worked over the last, last several years of not only serving what we would say traditional agriculturists, but welcoming new groups and helping them be successful as we have new groups coming into our country and new markets in that area. So um, I was gonna say, I think that's about being strategic and uh, also recognizing the power of partnerships. Um, we could not and would have never been able to do what was what we did without the fact that our partners spoke for us, our, spark, our partners spoke on behalf of us. And as I look at where we are today here at the University of Minnesota, there's so many opportunities for us to build even stronger partnerships than we currently have. So, so as I said, today that continues, that group, is still there, they're entrepreneurial as could be, but they're always staying very much focused on their mission and value of who they serve. And so, you know, in our universities, just like that, could have been a short-term one-off. But what we have to do in our university cultures is that we create, and, and we create the bandwidth, we create the resources, we create the staying power so that we are there not just in three years, but in five years and in 20 years, and in this case, university, many, many, many years. And that's what we do, is to help create the, the framework for the future as we go forward. So thank you for the question. I love to talk about that because <laughs> it's my passion. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. Our next question will be from Regent Gulley. Welcome. Thank you. Um, the president leads a public institution that relies on deep legislative and community relationships. Describe a time when you had to navigate complex legislative or community issues. How did you go about building relationships with key legislative or community stakeholders to ensure the outcome met your organization's needs? Well, I just spoke with you about a, a federal legislative issue where we were able to create those long-term partnerships. Part of that, too, is that we worked very closely with the staffers. We would show them the impact of what we had done. And so when I went to the University of Connecticut as the vice president for economic development, um, we uh, were coming in a situation, again, this was 2012, many states had rebounded from the financial crisis, but Connecticut was one that was still pretty stagnant. And this is a place that had just been the, the, the home of innovation and creativity, particularly in manufacturing. And so when I arrived there, there were two individuals, you know, have those people in your lives who just, you know, you just still want to hug them every second you see them because they were so dynamic. And I was fortunate as a vice president of economic development to have the dean of engineering, Kazem Kazarunium, um, and the newly appointed provost who'd been the dean of engineering, uh, Moon Choi, who now actually leads the University of Minnesota system. And they understood manufacturing, they were engineers. That was not my forte, but my forte was working to try to figure out how we can develop partnerships. So we went to our major and minor employers across the state of, of Connecticut over about a five, six month period, listened to what they had to say. What are your needs? What are your concerns? 
And it's actually that process that we use is very similar. I replicated it this past year when we started the Next Gen Ag program here on, on this campus. We listen to individuals in an honest and very humble way. We don't necessarily know what they're going to say if we don't listen to understand. So that's what we did. We went about listening to understand. In a nutshell, in the summary version, what they said is we need more individuals who are educated in the STEM fields and we need more, more, definitely need more areas of research and expertise in additive manufacturing. That's where Connecticut saw their future. Why? So again, using that process, we went back, said, okay, what, what do we have? What's our inventory? What can we do? And what do we need to do? And um, through that process, working with our partners and our par partners actually speaking on behalf of us, although I did a lot of testimony myself, but we were able to secure an additional $1 billion over for the state of Connecticut, for, from the state of Connecticut for UConn over a five-year time period to work in the areas of STEM. They also provided us resources for our laboratories, which were even from my eyes that weren't trained horribly antiquated. And today you will find that one of the treasures of the University of Connecticut is their work in additive manufacturing. Fast forward a couple of years later, um, the same approach of listening and working. But because we had a strong working relationship with the legislature, we had a firm called Jackson Laboratories, which are very well known in genomic medicine, come to the University of Connecticut wanting a partnership. And through that work, working with them, putting together the plan, we then went to the legislature and they were very generous in funding a new hospital complex for UConn, as well as a genomic medicine research facility. So again, as I talk about partnerships, a theme, but it's there, it's that area where um, that experience is there. So that was, I was gonna say probably, I think that was the, the first part of your question uh, was on uh, the legislative. A uh, second one I wanna share with you is some work I did in community relations and community development and partnerships. So back in the 90s, um, many of our food processing um, facilities, food processing companies, were bringing in individuals from outside the country to help fill their workforce needs. And I and some of my colleagues were working with um, uh, several of these communities where a lot of the individuals who were coming to us as new citizens were from Mexico. So as a community development specialist, um, and I was part of a team, I certainly didn't do this alone, I'm always part of a team, but I was part of a team where we went uh, to some of these communities where the relationships were not good. There were horrible stories, you can Google them and read them, about how our new citizens were being treated, being treated by our communities. I said, this is divisive, this is not good for our state. So we started initially with looking at where are the trusted partnerships, in this case already, for our Mexican immigrants? And we had the hope and aspiration that hopefully we could at least get our existing communities to accept the immigrants that were coming in. Of course, the best outcome would be that they welcomed the new citizens, but we were just kind of putting the bar at accepting that they're here. Those, these wonderfully hardworking people are here because they also have the opportunity to realize the American dream. So we started with the Mexican groups and their trusted relationships were with their faith-based institutions. So we went to them and uh, my group of extension individuals who we went there said, could you help us, um, help us, you know, so that we can listen and hear what our immigrant, what our Mexican, uh, citizens are telling us that they need. And so we did that. They were very gracious to extend their relationships to us. And uh, we heard many different things. And so we just kind of triaged that on our team. And the area that I worked with was trying to help um, individuals uh, who were Mexican entrepreneurs, because that's my expertise, helping Mexican entrepreneurs start businesses 
in some of our communities. One of them was Perry, Iowa, finishing the circle here. So, um, so we worked in three communities, Perry, Storm Lake, and Columbus Junction, Iowa, um, and put to practice all of the research and the areas there. So working with, with the Mexican entrepreneurs, um, it was really a twofold. First, um, I had to work with those existing businesses in those communities. And I remember walking in, I was like, you know, I'm gonna say it. I heard words like, we don't want them here. We don't welcome that population. And it was very hurtful because I had individuals there, but just continually explain, explaining, hoping, getting people to listen. I said, you know what? I said, have you guys ever, this couple of these towns were near Des Moines. Have you ever been to the Des Moines, Iowa auto mile, which all of them of course had. I go, that is a whole mile full of, you know, GM, Toyota, Honda. I said, they're all in that mile. Every car dealership is in that mile. I said, and you probably shopped in that auto mile. They go, yeah, we have. And I said, would you see if we have our Mexican entrepreneurs here, it, you know, that thing all, so the ships raise all, all tides there, that we all are to better. And I think that was a moment when people understood that working together, you were stronger. I'm not saying there weren't a lot of hard times, but we got through that. And at the same time, I had to help our Mexican entrepreneurs both understand how it was maybe a little bit different to start businesses um, in the United States, helping again, use those tenants, to help them ensure that they were successful. And our, our Mexican um, population wanted those goods and services. They wanted to have the foods. I I'm, I'm love food, so I always say food is one of those things that grounds us, that we need to have those aspects that make us feel at home. And so that was an example of working with communities. It wasn't seamless. There weren't some hard times. But when we have the long-term goal and today in those communities, a population of uh, the minority population are people that look like me. And there's sometimes 50 and 60 to 75% of those communities. And, it, and the people that look like me did not leave. They stayed and those communities grew. And we grow together when we work together, when we learn trust with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Hipsch. Uh, hello, Chancellor. Uh, the uni uh, university senior leaders rarely act unilaterally. How do you ensure that those on a team or across an organization feel heard and valued during the during the de uh, decision making process? And share an example of a situation where you effectively incorporated multiple perspectives to arrive at a successful outcome. Thank you for that question. So, well, I've been giving you a few examples of, of other states. I'm going to back home here to Minnesota. <laughs> so um, situation for our campus at the University of Minnesota Crookston is we joined the uh, NSIC, which is a division to sports um, uh, Northern Sun Intercollegiate Conference Division Two, back in 2006. Obviously that was before I became chancellor there. And um, the bylaws for us to be a member of the NSIC, which is a very competitive conference, requires at that time that uh, we had to have a football team. And so at that time, chancellors, presidents, you as a board have to make dif difficult decisions. And at that time, our chancellor had to make a difficult decision whether to join the NSIC, which he felt at that time was the best way for us to um, increase enrollment, show our competitiveness uh, with that. But he had a hockey team at the same time that he had a football team. And as you know, those are both kind of expensive sports to have. So he had to make a very difficult decision to drop the hockey and to join the NSIC and have a football team. So fast forward 2017, I came in as the chancellor in Crookston and um, I came to immediately hear from my, my team that um, our athletic program and our football team was not particularly strong. So several reasons, um, we didn't have enough money to really hire multiple coaches for most of the sports. 
And we couldn't fund all of the scholarships that were allocated, were allocated certain numbers of scholarships. So we didn't have enough funds to allocate all of those. And our facilities were shaky at best. And um, our football team was especially hard hit because of those realities. And of course we have people who our athletic um, director, all of our athletic coaches want to be a strong advocate for every program, but the reality was, as I said, we didn't have enough money to fund those scholarships. Our record was not very good. Oh, you can Google it. Two wins out of 69 games. Uh, and the students didn't have a good experience. I remember going to one of those football games afterwards, watching the students as they came off of there. You could see it in their faces, because I knew that feeling. I used to be a long distance runner and I remember getting lapped. That's the feeling, just defeated. It is not a good student experience. And that was not good for our students. As I said, it was an expensive sport for us. Our Title IX was in balance, but we really desperately needed to upgrade, particularly some of our female um, facilities to equalize our Title IX issue. As I said, it was a risk management issue too. I would just hope after at every game that nobody was going to be hurt badly because we were outweighed, we were outmaneuvered, we were outmuscled. It was not a fair game and it was a reputational issue. There were a few media that were very tough on us. They made fun of us after every game. It's not a good reputational outcome for the University of Minnesota. And you can Google all these. So, so recognizing this, I brought our team, a team together, a team that was made up of my communications director, our vice chancellor, director of institutional effectiveness, head of the budget, and the athletic leadership, because they needed to be in that conversation. I said, okay, these are our, this is what I'm seeing as our realities. So what should we do? You know, how do we go about this? Everybody advocated for their aspects and the pieces there. They said, okay, well, how about if we, first of all, just reframe this issue? So let's bring in teams that best fit Northwest Minnesota. So we created a trap team for men and women. We were able to create a cross country team for men and women, looking at one that doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to bring in there. And we also brought in club hockey. So, and all of this was because we had the idea that at some point in time, it might be good for our organization to discontinue our football program, but we weren't quite ready to do that. And as I said, the second part of our strategy was we couldn't make any moves until there was a bylaw change in the NSIC because it was required. So I went about, for two reasons, visiting the other 15 universities. I got to meet some great people in those, in those visits. And during that time, I learned and helped us kind of frame what is our competitive edge, where we might have a chance, but most importantly, to develop relationships with the presidents of those other 15 institutions. So at some point in time, if we needed to make some changes, I would have those relationships and trust developed already there. So about fall night 2019, um, we just finished another football season. We had plans to maybe eventually have a conversation about discontinuing football, but it wasn't quite the right time for us. However, I got a call from a, another president of one of the NSIC universities. They were under a Title IX issue and they needed to make some significant changes probably in about 48 hours. Can you help me with getting some of those bylaw changes so that we're able to drop football? So as I said, sometimes you have your strategy in place and yet different times affect you differently. So I went back to my team and said, Here's an issue. They need to have this bylaw change. Think we have enough of a relationship. I can get the votes from my from those 15. Is this a time for us at the University of Minnesota to make this difficult decision? So we went around. We went around. Remember, probably three or four times, hearing, listening, weighing risk. We weren't quite ready. We didn't hadn't, we hadn't built our enrollment and these other sports up enough yet. 
and we are very enrollment dependent. And so do we risk it? Do we take the situation is a risk or the reward then too, if we don't have this program anymore, this will free up resources for us to do other things. And so uh, we slept on it. We did have 24 hours at least to sleep on it. Slept on it the next morning, the consensus went around the room. And this is one, not every decision can be consensus, but it was important that this one was, that all of, all of those people that were affected um, were in alignment with the decision that we made. We did discontinue the program along with another, another um, uh, university and um, took those resources, as I said, and repurpose those. So, you know, anecdotally, I was thinking, geez, it seems like we're winning a lot more. I know we have like multiple um, coaches um, in some of these athletic sports. Um, we certainly upgraded our facilities for our, our training facilities, but anecdotally, it's like, yeah, I think we're winning. So I asked our athletic director, and, and then of course, you always need to confirm that with the director of institutional effectiveness for integrity, said, are we? Is this true? And um, just um, so I went from anecdotally to yes, eight out of 10 of our teams have much improved records in the last couple of years. We reallocated scholarship money to almost every one of our scholarships now. We have the maximum allowable under the NSIC. Um, in the baseball and softball arena, in fact, our baseball team plays tomorrow, the championships. Yes. Um, we, but we also have a long, a very strong local partner who came and has participated with us philanthropically way beyond our expectation and dreams if that. And so sometimes you make a bad decision, sometimes you make a decision, and sometimes you make a better decision. And I hope this was a better decision based upon consensus with my leadership team. And oh, by the way, our club hockey team, we're one game away to go in the national championships this year. And the arena is full of individuals. So sometimes I hope it's a better decision that we make. So, But I think what's more importantly is, and I've heard this around, around this table, sometimes we have to be strategic to stop doing something so we can focus on areas where we can excel. And I think that's a real tenet of leadership that we have to always consider. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regent Ruth Johnson. I want to put question six to the chancellor. I do. Welcome. So tell us about your experience working with boards, and particularly public boards. What is your understanding of how public and private boards and organizations they serve differ? What steps have you taken to develop and maintain good working relationships with the board? And then give us an example when you uh, introduced a concept or proposal to board and it wasn't uh, support and what did you what steps did you take to overcome those challenges? Thanks for the question. So like many of you serving on a board, I've served on a number of boards, uh, most public or quasi public and NGOs. Um, I've chaired elected boards. I've been chair of the hospital board, uh, public health, mental health boards, and part of NGOs such as Red Cross and our service clubs too. I don't have extensive experience working on large corporate boards but I've worked with many small business boards, uh, both in my, our own family businesses, family corporations, as well as I have counseled literally hundreds of organizations in my value added egg time, uh, helping them set up boards and ensuring board governance with that. So uh, when I'm developing a board, I always, as I said, um, when developing a board, I recommend we go back to what do we wish to achieve? So we always begin with our mission, and our vision and our values, and then guide those by our bylaws and policies. Now, certainly this board has very well established policies and bylaws. Um, and uh, these, I think, also help really outline what are our responsibilities as board members, or in my case, as staff, and my responsibilities to you as a board or the boards that I'm serving. And then from there, in development of relationships with boards, if I were in this interim role, I'm going to sit down with you right away. And I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you about the frequency, the mode, the content, high detail versus detailed, or high, high versus detailed that you want. And so once those parameters are established, I execute upon 
what those wishes are, and of course, all of the statutory requirements of that. But as I indicated earlier, I would always communicate with a board, with my boss, any long-term threats that I see, any areas where I think that our mission, our values, and our vision can be compromised, and that we need to act upon, whether it's long-term or short-term. And then the immediate situations must be communicated to a board. So one of the areas which I think is very important, and particularly when there's many multiple voices that are coming to boards, such as yours, which are very complex, and I have very much respected how President Kaler and how President Gable have done this, is that the communications comes from the president of the University of Minnesota. So all of those communications come to the individual and then we pre present them to you. So you don't have all of these cacophony of, of different voices from faculty and from staff, that those come and then are, are given to you. And then uh, when I work with a board too, I work with the officers and others as appropriate to set our agendas at those areas, those reports that you want to hear it from. So, and as I said, I really feel that most of that should flow to the leader and then to you. So again, in your multi-part questions, <laughs> so another one is, have you ever worked with a board that didn't want to hear what you were proposing? And uh, they're not very supportive. So yeah, it happened, well, not in this room, but in the other room. <laughs> so um, one of the very important elements of, of the student at the University of Minnesota Crookston is that many of them are first gen. 43, 44% of our students are first generation students. They haven't been to college before. Many of them come from school districts where they're incredibly bright students, but they haven't had the background, for instance, in chemistry. And you can listen to me Google one time, talk about my own experience not being successful in chemistry. As I came from a small rural school district, I hadn't had that, that background. And so looking at our students, we, they certainly have the reputation at the University of Minnesota of having a student who meets the rigor and hand can be successful. So we were looking at our own students. How can they be successful? We started to see something. This was about 2018. We started to see, you know what? The best indicator of our students' success is not ACT and SAT scores. It's their grade point average and the things which they were involved with in high school. That was the best indicator of success for our students. They graduated on time, usually early. They had less student debt, of course, of that. So that was that idea is called test optional. And it was not very popular, and respectfully so, because the University of Minnesota um, once wants and has students who receive high ACTs. We have a very high rigor, but for our students, there were other ways that really helped them and indicated their success. So we started talking with regents about that. Um, I think I did bring it up to the board and I remember uh, one of the regents just kind of looked at me and goes, you yeah, know, probably don't want to bring that up again. He said it much, much, much more gracious than that, but that was the essence of the story. It's like, okay. So quietly, um, when the opportunity arose in private conversations, um, we'd have those conversations with some of our board members and to the place where um, it appeared a couple years later that um, maybe I can actually bring that up. And so I remember suggesting that it was President Kaler at that time. And he goes, sure, go ahead. Uh, but, you know, see if there's an openness to that idea. And so I presented it such giving the data, database, always, always data driven about why and said, would you consider that the University of Minnesota Crookston could be test optional on a pilot basis. Give us a few years because we need the data to show are we really just really making a difference with that. And so this board did change their mind and said, try it, as you say, see how it works. And then of course COVID hit and uh, everybody went test optional. But uh, with that, but 
what we were actually, and I was trying to re, trying to see, um, and uh, this is what I love about all of you as such engaged board members. I was going back trying to remember yesterday some of the essence of, of um, this story and this conversation, and I found emails um, from a number of our regions going, hey, how's that going? You know, you were curious, you wanted to know. So, Lisa, this is preliminary data. I'll share it with you. So uh, applications from our students in the top 10% of their class are up 42%. Um, more than half of our applicants um, did not submit ACTs or SATs, but the ones that did, we had a total number of applicants where increased by 56%. Their ACT was 25 or higher. And by 80% of those individuals who did provide us their ACTs were by 80 or higher, by 80% or higher. So, you know, we'll bring you the data, all of the data, that's the preliminary data, uh, but that's, we'll bring you the data in uh, 2024. Um, but that was an example of that. But as I said, what I really appreciated was then, how's it going? Because you're so interested and interactive with us. So it didn't start out well. I don't know if it'll end well, but in the meantime, we are in the process of, of uh, executing on allowing students in that can be successful based upon their high school GPA. So thanks. Thank uh, Regent Tan Johnson. Chancellor, um, welcome and good afternoon. Equity, diversity, and inclusion are extremely important to our university. With that in mind, could you describe examples of how you have fostered a culture of diversity and inclusion in your current or previous role? As part of your answer, describe programs or policies you have implemented and some challenges you have faced when promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you. So early in my career, much of my work, as you heard earlier, was with the Latinx uh, populations that they came through. But I've also done significant international work um, and have fostered, has really fostered in me a very deep, deep respect or honoring and respecting every individual. So I'm going to first talk about an experience at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, it's in Southern California, where I was a Dean of Agriculture. And more than 65% of our students were BIPOC students, with the majority of those students were also Latinx uh, heritage. So when I went there, I immediately reached out to those students to be supportive of their work, supportive of their clubs, and started to go, what are we doing to specifically support this group? It's like, well, that kind of a tepid response. I said, okay, guys, it's time for us to really put to practice what we all talk about when we talk about DEI. So one of the first things we did was to help the students, we didn't organize it for them, we helped the students organize for themselves a manners, uh, a manners chapter, which is a minority and agricultural chapter, um, and provided them initially seed money, although I remember them out selling sunflowers as a way to help sponsor, because I always think we'll give you some, but you also have to have something in the game with students that so we all have to work together. They were, and so we provided them that opportunity to be very involved in going to the first manners conference. It was somewhere in Florida. Uh, I remember going with them. Um, and from there, that group just uh, continued to blossom, no pun intended, and, and flowered as, as they went forward to really see and hear their voice as uh, students of, of a BIPOC population. I also helped start a group, it was called Estudiante Dieteticos, um, which was a group that sponsored our dietetic students over and over again by providing them some seed help and are and also giving them the guidance through our faculty and staff to be their advisors and help them carry that. So I found some of these um, some of these resources were from central administration. There's never enough, and so true to entrepreneurial spirit, we found more through uh, those individuals who really bought into uh, to helping us and helping that that groups so those groups be successful. And um, so beyond that, though. Um, I think I really tried to get beyond just the support, but try to get to the essence of understanding culture and how can we really help. Not just, I'm kind of a cheerleader, so not just the rah-rah, but how can I make a deep systemic difference in people's lives? 
So one of those areas that for me was a real eye opener, because I thought I knew some of the Latinx population and, and the culture, but I was sitting there at an orientation talking to fathers and mothers about internships because they were so important for our agriculture students to have those internships. And I was going on and you know talking about those and I was sitting there and I'm watching the moms and the dads just kind of sitting like this in the back. It's like, ooh, this is not going well. So I went back afterwards and I said, um, you know, my Spanish is not great, but I tried to be respectful and speak in Spanish. And um, so as I was speaking, Suddenly they go, you don't understand. Again, you gotta listen to understand what are people really telling you? They go, oh, it's not that we don't want our particularly daughters to have internships, but we don't want them to go alone. It's too risky for them to go into these little communities by themselves. So we went to our corporate partners. We went to those that sponsor internships. And I said, would you take two, particularly of our female group, would you take two or three of our students? And they go, of course, because they were very interested in having more diverse populations, more diverse students come work for them. And so listening to understand a culture was just so impactful for me um, as, as we went forward. And that really has always grounded my understanding and trying to understand, listening to understand what people are saying. Another area where, again, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. I'm sure. sorry to do this. We have less than a half hour. We okay. have five more questions okay. to get to you. Okay. And so you, you can spend your time giving us another example, or maybe you want to let us go on with the next set of questions. We are hoping to give you time as well to be able to answer your Perfect. Question. Thank you. I just apologize wanted, for interrupting. No worries. So I just wanted to, uh, just one, one quick one quick other example, a lot of our Latino students would work for a while and then they would drop out of school. Anytime a student drops out of school, there's always a risk that they're not going to come back, but they did not want to assume debt of any kind. That was part of at least the culture of that group. And so uh, we would sit down and work with them and show them, and I don't really want to encourage student debt, but in this case, it made sense to encourage student debt because that the as we would run spreadsheets with them, they would see that, yes, you could make more money as a college graduate than you could working in an hourly area. So, of course, they got that. And then look at you go, but where am I going to get the money? That's the second part of systemically, you have to sometimes change things. So we worked with our funders, um, our philanthropic individuals to provide more scholarships. Some of my advisory group members were bankers, and they actually provided loans. Sometimes we have to go beyond just the obvious to get to a systemic way to change things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chancellor, um, early in maintaining strong relationships with faculty, staff, and students is essential for a president of a large, complex, decentralized university with a shared governance model. With that in mind, please share examples of how you have approached building relationships with various groups and stakeholders. How did you engage with each to understand their needs and concerns? So. Well, as a chancellor, I live that question every day. <laughs> so on our campus, uh, I work with our student groups, obviously. I meet with student leadership always. We have both a student formal leadership. and uh, But then I also have lively exchanges. I like to get my 15,000 steps in every day, so I walk. I walk and talk to students. I hear from them. We have lively exchanges. Um, and so using both for the, the formal shared governance as well as the interaction with students. I show up at their events, a part of their lives. And the same with faculty and staff and our Ask Me and our Teamster group. We do have our formal governance procedures. We meet several times a month. We talk about issues. And my door is always open. But we truly have shared governance because it isn't just in a formal meeting that we always have that. People come to my office, meet with them if they have concerns. I meet with them when they don't have concerns. I'll just ask people, what's going well? What's not going well? How can I be helpful to you? And as I walk around with our faculty, staff, students, with all these relationships, I hold these tenets dear. And I've said it before, I listen to understand. I don't normally ever talk this much. I ask questions and generally want to be helpful. And when possible, I act. I act upon what they're saying. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Tarabi. Thank you, Chair Mayra. 
Uh, Chancellor, um, please describe the time when you were faced with an ethical dilemma in your professional career. Why was it an ethical dilemma and how did you arrive at your decision on how to handle it? What was the outcome? Thank you. So the situation was one at the campuses where I was an administrator. And early in my tenure, I began to hear rumors about an employee who was close to retirement, who was using their power and putting students in very uncomfortable situations. As I learned more, it turned out that this had been going on for quite a while. And I told one of my colleagues, I said, well, you know, this is going on. And that colleague looked at me and they go, yeah, we all know about it. But you know what? Don't raise it. They're going to be retiring soon. And if you raise it, you won't be here very long. OK, thank you. You'll be out the door. So of course, that was the ethical dilemma. Yeah, maybe a year or two left. It's been going on for, from what I could tell, from what I heard, maybe five, 10 years. So do I let it go? Or bring this issue to light. So I brought the situation to light and the response was basically just what my colleague told me. <laughs> you know, just keep it quiet. It's okay. It's going to be gone pretty soon. It's like, no, I didn't. I elevated it. I had to elevate it higher because there was no action. And so eventually <coughs> there was a resolution. And these are HR issues. So that's why I'm talking in, as I am here. But after it was resolved, I had people come to me, thank me, said, thank you for having the courage to do that. You could have let it go, but you didn't. So I hope I helped to change the culture there a little. This is not acceptable. And no culture should ever condone breaches of ethics. So while I was at that institution, then we also began training and began education to support those individuals <coughs> to make good, strong, ethical decisions. So whew, it's not at the University of Minnesota where this occurred. <laughs> so we have a strong culture of ethics. We provide everyone training and tools so they have what they need to address situations. And when there are breaches of ethics, they're quickly dealt with. I've seen that happen. It's really good to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Turner on the Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> Chancellor, the president has to navigate political realities and external pressures in managing controversial issues. Please give an example when you had to make a tough decision on a controversial or high profile issue. How did you handle it? What approach did you take managing that issue that was polarizing or divisive among different groups? So, there were a set of murals in our, editor in our auditorium, Keele Auditorium on the University of Minnesota Crookston campus. They were, paint they were painted in the late 30s. Uh, they were part of uh, a WPA work. They were painted by a protege of the famous Mexican artist, Diego Rivera. Um, these murals depicted the artist's ideas at that point in time of really the settling of the nation. And these murals also being, in addition to being part of the WPA, were paid for also in part by some of our alums, our Northwest School of Agricultural alums. So they'd actually helped to pay for them. As I said, these murals predicted excuse me, depicted the artist John Socha's idea of settling the nation, including two that depicted a treaty signing where Native Americans had to succeed their land to the U.S. government. The depiction of our Native Americans showed exaggerated features and very disrespectful and painful for many to look at. And they had to look at them anytime they came to a public event because there they were, 20 feet on both sides. So we needed to do something. We had one side was saying, these are my murals. This is my version of history. And that version of history is painful for many other individuals. Now, oftentimes when we look at art, we have the choice to look at art. But when we're in a public situation, there was no choice to look at that art. And so it was time 
to address this issue. Oftentimes I've had town meetings, as you could tell, I didn't want this to be a town meeting where we yell and scream at each other and each side hurts more, much of that hurt that's already there. So what we did was we used a Native American listening circle where you hold and pass on when you're done speaking. So everybody had an opportunity to voice their thoughts and their opinions in a respectful manner. From there, um, that conversation really ranged from destroying art, it's like burning books, to others who said, I can't walk in the room without giving me just this gut-wrenching feeling because it hurts so bad. As I said, all had a chance to express their thoughts. So this is that one of those situations, a very divided group, both sides. Sometimes there's a third way. So what I did is, first of all, we explored, can we take down these murals take, and move them? But taking down the murals and moving them when the facilities people came would structurally destroy the, uh, uh, this 100 plus year old building. So that wasn't an option. So the other option is to paint over the murals. And yet there is an element of education and a past that we must continue to educate people about. And so we made the decision the third way to cover them up with drapes. And prior to, um, prior to this decision, um, we, it didn't work, it didn't happen as quickly as I'd hoped it was. It was during COVID. We had some supply chain issues. We had some people who weren't available. So it didn't happen in, a, in the way and as quickly as I like to act, but it did happen. And recently I had one of the Northwest School of Agricultural alums who was so opposed come to me and he said, he goes, you know what? I disagree. I better make sure I get his quote right. I still disagree the reason that you were covering them up because that's my version of history. But you did a nice job of making those murals disappear. You threaded the needle. No decision is perfect because perfect is a fiction of everyone's opinion. I did what needed to be done and the waters came out calmer. Thank you. Regent Verhalen. Good afternoon. Uh, the president is charged with leading one of the world's largest public research universities. In your experience, what is the role of the chief executive in sustaining and growing the university's $1 billion research portfolio? Well, the number one job of a president is to hire great and competent people. And I believe that we have such an individual there right now in Shashank. Leading the role for us now is our VP for research. The president must understand and champion scientific discovery and always be an advocate for their faculty and their staff who are actively engaged in that endeavor. President extends relationships for potential collaboration and where possible allocate resources to aid in that collaboration. When I was um, helping to build and design the tech park at the University of Connecticut, one of the things which I learned is intentional collaboration fosters greater outcomes. So, you know, every era has had its problems. Some are thorny and they're complicated for their time. As we know, we have our thorny problems. Today is no different. But the role of the president is to guide the culture. And the culture here is built around many strong, broad and deep perspectives. This gives us the strength to move forward in a way that's focused and understanding a true nature of each of these problems. These perspectives are really the key to our greatness. We have strong minds and experience here. And then like also at the end, it's assumed, but we must also assure our processes and our oversights and our sponsor programs are rigorous. And we have very effective technology commercialization incentives in place for our innovators. Thank you for the question. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Regent Mayron, for making me speak more closely and a little more succinctly. All right. the time now. <laughs> You've done a fabulous job, but that leaves you about 15 minutes. So, uh, Regent Wheeler, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, good afternoon, Chancellor. 
Um, that brings us obviously to the, to the end of our list of questions, but what questions might you have of us or what else might you want us to know? Yeah, so thank you. Well, I guess I ask you jokingly, where's question 12? <laughs> because because uh, I think it's a really important question. And I think so much important to the success of a modern university president is talking about your experience in philanthropy. So do I have examples for you? Yeah, thanks for asking me that. <laughs> so yeah. So um, one of those one of those situations uh, was at California. Um, my uh, university that I was at had not been very supportive of the college that I was recently dean of. So I had a, an individual who um, my philanth or my uh, development officer said, "Hey, I'd really like you to meet like you to meet Mary." And he goes, "I'm not gonna meet with her. I'm not gonna meet with her." So finally, she got me a meeting. Remember, we went up to Salinas, and he just looked at me again after I listened all afternoon, listening to understand. And the the gist of what he was saying was, "They're trying to close my college. My college being the College of Agriculture. This is where I went to school. They're trying to close it." And it doing anything and I need somebody who's going to work hard to make sure that my college is represented. So I heard what he said. I was new. I didn't have any examples ready to fire that I was going to do other than I assured him I would work hard. Words are easy. They're easy to say. And I think he looked at me and he goes, yeah, you and the other ones. I mean, that effect, I could tell what he was thinking. So later on in the evening, uh, right before dinner, he had this group of cattle and, and uh, his employer employee was out haying the cattle and he got called away to, uh, to a telephone call. And there's all these cattle that are coming by us at this, uh, this four wheeler and mooing. So I picked up a bale and I started haying his cattle. And I got to that for you know a couple of minutes till the employee came back and finished up. I looked at him, I go, I'm not just saying words, I'll work hard. This is an example. Of, I will work hard to make sure that this college is strong and viable. So fast forward with him. Um, his name is Butch Lindley. I asked him if I could talk about him today and he goes, sure. He still texts me, he still calls me. He still says, thank you for saving my college. And he's been very philanthropic with the college. Um, the term multi-million dollars because he had to believe that his college would stay open and go forward. And then another situation I had working with my development officers are we kept hearing about this individual who had a great affinity, but we really hadn't paid much attention to him. A great affinity for us. And so I went and spent time uh, with Don Huntley. And part of that too is when you're working with your development officers, they oftentimes have long histories and understandings of relationships. So I worked with, with Don for a number of years, a couple, actually I was only there for three, so about two years. Um, and again, he, our individuals in our leadership roles have to believe and have belief and trust in the leader that they can do, that they can perform as well as the university itself. So fast forward for that, it is now the Don Huntley College of Agriculture. It was a $40 million gift. Um, and uh, some are able to give in large sums of financial. Many are able to give us their treasures. And being able to find the ways that our alumni and our donors can give back to us and that we honor and respect their gift, regardless of what that be. So. Thank you for question 12. <laughs> so. Anything you want to ask of us before? Yes, go ahead. Absolutely. We've got a few minutes left. So, okay, well, you as a board have articulated very well what you want from an interim president. But what are you looking for in the next president? Because, of course, this position lays the groundwork for a seamless transition onto the next. So, what are you looking for in the next president? Well, let me preface our, our remarks by saying this. Um, at some point, we after we complete this process, probably the following week, we will begin the process of putting in place um, what we will do to find a permanent president. And that will certainly be part of the dialogue that the board will uh, engage in with input from all the different constituencies collaborating with them to define what it is we are looking at a future president. So I, I will say for starters, it's gonna be a group discussion, but that said, you're certainly a willing, I, I, my colleagues are willing to jump in and say what they're looking at, at least individually, what's on their mind for a permanent president. 
um, they are certainly free to share that with you. So anybody want to jump in? All right, you're hearing a reluctance of uh, so, hiding okay. individually <laughs> and wanting the value of a group discussion. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Look forward to that as, as laying the groundwork. I have actually just one more question. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to ask one more just so I can uh, have a few moments at the end with you. So those of us who have been in higher education since the pandemic have seen a different type of student than before the pandemic. Many of these students face many more healthy mental health issues than they had in the past. A lot of them have experienced online and are looking for different ways for education to be available to them. And I'm actually looking forward to sharing one of those ways uh, with you on Friday through the next Gen A. Um, and then a lot of students have a lot of financial concerns. Uh, we always know that student debt is important, but uh, a lot of these families are under extreme pressure. So what do you see as the priorities as the, and the role of the board to address these unique aspects of the post-pandemic student? Go ahead, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just say one, I really appreciate um, your question being really student-centric. I think that's important. Uh, I'll just say two things kind of off the top of my head. Um, one, uh, as we are going to be hearing later this week about some uh, new innovative tuition modeling and affordability items for our system campuses, I think that speaks right to the heart of everything that you just talked about, affordability and access, understanding that students are under students and their families are under different or more unique financial pressures than maybe existed before. Um, and so I would add that. I think that's going to be really important from a board perspective. Uh, the other thing uh, directly related to this role that we're here talking about today, obviously, um, is the work that's already been started with the President's Initiative for Student Mental Health. Uh, I think that's really important and clearly work that's not going to or work that's going to continue um, in this interim role and pass there. I'm always working on how do we support our students and I think one of the you mentioned this, but one of the most um, you know, unique areas or areas that have developed since the pandemic is around mental health and supports for students. And so I think seeing progress and continuation of that really collaborative work with the president's initiative from, for student mental health is going to be really important. And that's, of course, led um, by the president, but it needs to be, you know, in partnership and supported uh, by resources or otherwise with the board as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, Chancellor. Um, I, on your first question, I think we just haven't had time to think that far <laughs> beyond this president. No, you haven't. Search, You've had a lot so. going on. You next, know. Yeah, yeah, next, uh, yeah, uh, next week. Yep. Um, but uh, on your second question, again, great question. Um, you know, I, I think as you were asking it, I, I thought back to a conversation we had uh, in March at the Morris campus um, with, with some of the staff there and we were talking we're talking about mental health and you know we're talking they were telling us all the resources and and, and, and things they've you know they've put out there for students um, and I asked you know what are we we're throwing resources but are there things we're doing to create some of those you know some of that stress or, or what can we do on the front end and um, one thing one example that was given is, is some faculty, are reevaluated their their deadlines, right? Sunday night at, at 11:59. What is the value of that, right? And it's not being graded overnight. And if if you set that deadline, people are going to use it. You know, they're they're, they're going to stay up till that time. Um, and, and and that example kind of got me thinking um, of of how we can think more of the front end. What are we What are we creating? What you know? What stress or, or issues are we creating? And I think that's an area the board um, could definitely think about. But also, just as 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 different things come in front of us, um, it, it'll be helpful for us from the chancellors, the the um, just the team. I mean, whoever's presenting that given topic to to kind of help us think about what what are some uh, unintended consequences that, that that may be happening here. And I think. As you, you know, as you described that change of student, I've, I've, I've heard that from faculty members, you know, I, I've talked about lately and um, I don't know how, but we have to understand what we know there's changes, but I don't know how to capture that, how that student profile is different. And that's probably another valuable conversation. To have. Thank you. Yeah. Any final question? We've got a couple minutes left. That, that clock 
to my colleagues is not accurate behind us. So uh, I'm we're using going my mom official... eyes. I can see what time it is. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're going with the official <laughs> clock. Uh, so any final remarks you want to make? Yeah, so, well, you know, every day I try to bring hope, trust, and respect to others so they believe in themselves. I hold high expectations of people who are in positions so they can exceed beyond what they think they can do. Everybody leading in their space. So we know the challenges are gonna come on their own winds. We can't pretend to know them. How could we have ever predicted COVID, but it came. So, but what we do know is that our determination to make the University of Minnesota even greater is there. Do any of you on this board see the University of Minnesota limited in any ways? Time, circumstances, recent or past histories? No, I don't. I'm not here to talk about constraints because there aren't any. Strategy is how we frame it. And I see endless opportunities. I'm ready to go to work for you. Thank you for the time today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we will take a short recess and we will resume at um, two o'clock.
Thank you. At this time, we will welcome Tom Sullivan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much. As you know, the board has a series of questions that have been prepared for our time together today. You've had access to those questions, so you know what's coming. Each candidate, like yourself, has received the same set of questions from the board. And our hope is that at the uh, end of our questions, which are 12 of, or 11 of them, that we will have sufficient time to answer any questions you may have of us. With that, let me get started with the first question, which is as follows. What specifically interests you about the interim president role at this moment in time? And what do you see as one key strength that you would bring to this role? Thank you very much, um, I'm delighted to be here. It's uh, familiar for me to be walking into this wonderful McNamara. Um, and first, I want to thank all of you for your public service. Um, having spent a few hours and days and weeks with boards on both sides of the table, I know how much contribution you're making to the public good. And I want to thank you for that service. Um, all volunteers, uh, and the pay is all the same, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the pleasure to be back here at you. Right. All right. You want to tackle our question? Sure. Then? Your all first right. question has to do with my interest. In this um, position, and what strength, and what, what's a key strength you bring to that interest? Yes, to that thank role? you. Well, I'm, um, as I said, a real pleasure to be back. Um, I have such respect and fondness for the university given my 17 years here. Um, I also guess I might be considered for you, uh, and for myself, an insider and an outsider. I have 17 years here, I was recruited in 1995 as dean of your law school, and then later as provost of the university. I was um, very much a part of the community here. I, I married here. We had our wedding reception and dinner right here at the student union on the fourth floor where a lovely reception and dinner in September 15 years ago uh, and a beautiful full, full moon, I remember that night. So the U is uh, very important to my life and my background. Um, let me share with you a bit to your question about interest and experience. As I said, the uh, inside and outside perspective that I bring. Before I came to the U in 1995, I had been associate dean at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and then dean of the University of Arizona Law School. So I brought some experience to the deanship here uh, at the uh, University of Minnesota. Um, the experience, and I want to mention a couple of examples at the law school because it so informed and shaped my understanding of the university um, and being a, a citizen of the university, which is very important for me. When I was dean um, in my first year, um, your, some of your questions go to challenges and, and uh, controversial topics. I was called uh, one Tuesday evening, rather late in the evening in my first year by President Mills Hasselmo, who had hired me. Uh, there was a debate among the board that time and the faculty about tenure and there were certain members two or three on the board that were earnest and serious about either removing tenure or substantially changing tenure for the faculty well you can imagine in terms of uh, an issue a controversial issue and and the president asked me he said um, Friday morning um, the board is meeting and this tenure decision question discussion is on the table uh, because of certain Minnesota labor laws and so forth, and there have been some petitions to um, actually unionize the faculty in relation and uh, in opposition to the, some of the board members' uh, tenure approaches. Um, um, the target of the first conversation is the law school, and we were outside of whatever the Minnesota law was on the labor unions at that time and petitioning. So on Friday morning, I appeared before the board, and. Um, the issue was uh, to eliminate tenure for the faculty or to substantially change that. And what I brought for that meeting, uh, uh, and you can imagine I walked, we weren't in McNamara at that time. We were over in the uh, Morrill 
little hall in one of the larger rooms next to the president's office. And the room was standing room only with faculty, picket signs, with strike signs, TV cameras. And I was new to the university. Um, this was my first year, and a lot of people didn't know. Well, new dean at the law school, Tom Sullivan. Who is he? Where is he? The room was packed when I arrived. There was a budget conversation going on before my arrival. And uh, Chair Regan asked, uh, uh, at that time, the president of the university, um, I'm not sure whether that's still protocol, uh, uh, ran the agenda. And the chair sat next to him. And uh, President Hasselmo asked me, introduced me as the new dean, and would I come up and respond to and if I had a plan for the tenure resolution. Um, so I made my way through the very crowded room to go up. And we began to discuss. Uh, what the regions were talking about, what they wanted, where there was opposition. Uh, of course, the, lots of tension in the room, as you can imagine. And to, to cut through that meeting, um, after about 45 minutes, I presented a plan, perhaps a compromise. Uh, they wanted accountability. Um, they wanted to, how do we measure productivity and accountability of the faculty when we give them lifetime tenure? And of course, um, um, having been a lawyer uh, um, and, and one, um, knew well the due process clause of the United States Constitution, which talks about fundamental fairness, uh, notice an opportunity to defend and respond. Um, uh, and I knew the tension on the faculty. I decided that we would start talking about how you balance and reach accommodation with accountability and measurements for productivity, and at the same time make sure that there was sufficient due process for faculty. Um, because there were also going to be conversations about post-tenure review, after your tenure review of faculty. And if the faculty were not being productive, perhaps it was time for a different plan. So you can understand the controversy, the tension. Um, and shortly after my presentation, one of the members of the board, former governor of the state, immediately moved to um, refer this to the faculty senate, to the FCC, in consultation with me to see if we could bring back a resolution, a formal resolution to the board in 30 days. I worked very closely with the Senate faculty and the FCC to, to accommodate that. 30 days, we brought it back to the board, and the board um, overwhelmingly uh, approved the recommendation I made. Uh, now, subsequently, a couple months later, we had to go back and tweak it a little bit because there had been a change that we didn't know about. And so we came back, and the board approved that amendment as well. And um, the history of the university calls that Sullivan one and Sullivan two with regard to the tenure. Um, so that was a, quite a start for me in my first year as dean of the law school. I got to know a lot of people very quickly, particularly in the shared governance structure, which is so important here at the university. I also want to share with you um, a couple of things I did while I was dean that helped me help inform my experience and hopefully judgment as I became provost later. Um, um, after the tenure debate was resolved, uh, I was asked by um, Professor Tom Clayton, a very distinguished professor of English, who was chairing uh, one of the principal FCC committees, if I would help work with him to write a, a, a code for the university, so to speak, on academic freedom. This following, of course, the tension that came out of the tenure discussion, I believe and what it meant to have open and free speech and debate on campus, but be protected under academic freedom uh, uh, norms. Um, and so I worked very closely with Professor Clayton, and two of us uh, came up with and wrote the use academic freedom policy, uh, again, in my first year at, as dean. I went on to have the great privilege of um, following my predecessor, Bob Stein, who's one of the most distinguished deans at the law school and um, was able to build on the wonderful building complex that Bob and his predecessors had done to build a huge new addition to the law school, which we were in May 2001 able to dedicate as Mondale Hall after Vice President Mondale. Um, I also just would mention that I was the first dean then, I don't know the history since, to be able to, uh, as part of that Mondale Hall building fundraising, uh, to go out and win a Kresge Foundation million dollar award. No, no member of the university or the university itself had ever won a prestigious Kresge Foundation grant for a building project. 
Um, I also might mention um, Mark, Mark Udoff um, was president at this time after President Hesselmull. And um, I went over to Mark and said, Mark, we need to build a really modern contemporary building for our strategic plan and, and building the reputation of law school. And uh, he said to me, you're not on the list. I was nowhere on the priority list, not even on a list. And I said, if I'm able to raise all of the money, we were talking about 15 or $20 million, which at that time was a lot of money in 1995, 96, 97. He said, well, if you can raise it all privately, fine. Thank you, sir. And uh, we went off, and I believe at that time, I don't know the record now, the first college at the university ever to raise, build a building, all in private money. No tuition money, no state appropriation money. So those are some of the early um, opportunities I had at the dean level. And then, of course, um, I went off to become provost later after seven years of being the dean. And uh, this point about experience, Chair, um, I think with seven, almost eight years as provost under two presidents, Bob Brunix and Eric Kaler, um, I bring a, a certain amount of experience and understanding and familiarity to this university and to this community. Um, 30 years in higher education administration, assistant dean, <coughs> twice a law school dean, provost, president of a university later uh, after the U, um, and four decades of being in the academy, teaching, writing, publishing, and being an administrator. And that's the experience, I think, uh, Chair Marin, that could come, and my particular interest in talking with you today about this interim position. You know, uh, and we've had a conversation through the chair and uh, executive director, uh, that this is an interim appointment. I have said clearly that I'm not going to be a candidate for the permanent. And if this were to happen, uh, it would be a one year or whatever period you, de you decided, given the, the range and sweep of your search. Um, I would come here and I would focus particularly on the two things that are pretty clear from all of your conversations, I think. Number one is positioning the university to get itself to have a very highly successful search for a permanent president. And there are things that you've been talking about that will enhance that success. And I would uh, hope that I could be a part of helping through my 30 years of experience on both sides of the table interviewer and interviewee, how that can be very successful. It's a critically inflection point in the history of this university, a successful search for a presidency. And second, to move along with progress, your um, very well designed and thought out um, impact plan of 2025. I know you're on that journey already. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're thinking deeply about the progress, what comes next, how, how it happens or not through an interim. But I would be committed for both helping position you for a successful search, as well as moving along the priorities that you as a board have established, particularly the impact 2025. Uh, with those opening remarks, I, I hope um, the interest, passion, and the experience is helpful framing. Thank you. Regent Davenport. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Sullivan. As a large, complex organization, the university faces many complicated and multifaceted issues, including such things as cost of attendance, employee wages and benefits, public safety, and many others. At times, a solution for one issue puts pressure on another. Please provide an example of where you had to address a complex issue, what was it, what made it complex, and how did you approach it, and what were the outcomes? Thank you, Dip, Regent Davenport. If, if I may, to respond to your question, uh, share with you kind of my uh, thinking, my, my framework of how I would begin to approach that, that question. Uh, we don't always have the opportunity to pick the timing for the crisis or the co complexity that comes along with it. Um, we like to sit around as, as leaders, I hope, and think about blue sky strategy and, and vision and how everything would be perfect for us. We also have to plan for the black swan that comes along, the crisis, the complexity that we never thought about before. So the frame that I would begin to look at confronted with a complex issue or opportunity that's complex is, 
I would first look at, and this would be particularly true perhaps as a, as a new president, I would look at the culture and the structure and the history of the university carefully. Have we been here before? How have we reacted? How successful was that? So I think your culture, your history um, is, is, is very important. And of course, the structure, how are we built to deal with this, so to speak? Um, I would also look very carefully as we're approaching that complexity or that crisis. Do we have the personnel competency and capacity? Competency and capacity, capacity to really manage this. Uh, it's one thing to be able to set up a plan to attempt to implement, but if you don't have the capacity and the competency on the ground, um, then that has to be fixed, I, I think, really first. Um, and then you turn immediately, uh, Regent Davenport, to the nature of the, of the issue, the complexity or the crisis, and figure out what's in front of us. How do we build a team? How do we get the very best people around us? either in the organization or bring in to help us with that complexity. So the nature of the question, and that of course varies with the reaction, uh, with, the, with the plan, I think. Um, um, and, um, and then of course, at a university like this, or University of Vermont where I am now, we have strong shared governance, both institutions. And I think you immediately turn to the shared governance colleagues. Of course, starting with the regions, or the trustees in the case of Vermont, and beginning to share with them the complexity or the challenge. Um, this is where policy and governance is made. This is where the expertise from life exists. Bring them into the conversation as early as possible. And then, of course, you turn to your internal shared governance mechanisms, which are very strong here. Um, the faculty senate, the FCC colleagues, who are the executive board. You turn to your dean council, you've got 2021 deans, the academic leaders of the university. Uh, you turn to uh, staff council. Uh, I'm sure there's such an organization here. Uh, when you have tens of thousands of staff, they have to be part of the solution as well. And of course, student government, undergraduate, graduate, if, if that's relevant to the, the issue of region Davenport and you build the communication, you share, you ask, you listen as you approach that complexity or that crisis. And that's, that's your big team. And then you start trying to apply best practices and best advice you can. And at the end of the day, it's a conversation that you have to bring together all of the facets, the, the pros and the cons. The, the, and a leader uh, facing that kind of a complex issue um, or crisis has to ultimately make the decision. Uh, this is about sharing conversations and information and knowledge and experience with leadership. And at the end of the day, that leader has to take all of that and make that decision along with the board, of course. Um, and there will be people who will celebrate that and there will be people who may still have a lament or a disagreement. It's important that the process be transparent, have credibility, so that even the ones who may have been disagreeing with you along the conversation might say, I think I still disagree. I want to see where it goes. I respect the process. That's how I would look at a complex uh, issue in that regard. And I think you asked an example. Yes, please. And uh, there, there have been many in my life. As, uh, 30 years in higher education administration. Um, um, that's a book I will not write. <laughs> um, many good memories, though. The issue, of course, I, I think here is uh, when Bob uh, Brunix asked me to be provost, the very first thing I said, Bob, what do you need? What do you want? We had been fellow deans together. I knew him well, and, and he was my provost, and of course, president. What do, you, what do you need? What do you want? Why me? And Bob, President Jimmick said, we need to have a significant, thorough strategic plan for the university. Uh, we have been uh, receiving, uh, just starting about that time, some very severe budget cuts at the university. Uh, legislator, legislature cut the university back about $185 million, some 20 or 25 percent of the budget. This was huge. And we had to take that crisis 
that critical moment, that inflection point in the university's history and figure out how can we be more efficient and effective and still increase quality and, and uh, contributions to the university. And so we began a strategic action plan, starting with the shared governance processes that were here at the university. Uh, very complex, as you can imagine, a university this size. Um, but we had a, a particular focus. The, the legislature was demanding significant cuts, 20, 25% of the budget. This is enormous. Uh, but from an academic standpoint, which was my lens, uh, we had an opportunity, rather than considering it just a crisis, we had an opportunity to think about how do we enhance the academic synergy of the faculty and the university? That is to say, how can we improve interdisciplinarity across disciplines and make sure that we were getting the most productive, efficient, impactful research and scholarship and not sitting in academic or intellectual silos. So academic synergy and, um, and the whole notion of we've got to improve interdisciplinarity between disciplines in our teaching, in our research, in our service. And so we began to look at the structure point I was making a moment ago. And colleges and departments and how they are organized. And it became clear that we needed to do some integration, um, so, some mergers to increase the efficiency, reduce costs, and at the same time have a win win with academic synergy and interdisciplinarity. So we began to look across all the structures for integration. Uh, and, and that was the major uh, challenge and opportunity, I might say while I was provost was the strategic plan and how we implemented it and how that came out. Um, I'll just jump the story a bit so that we can move on because I know we'll come back to this later with some subsequent questions. Um, how did it come out? Well, we, we had multiple years of conversation, of course. Uh, uh, faculty Senate, FCC, the president and I met every single month with FCC. Uh, we both went to every faculty senate meeting. The president, of course, spoke, took questions. We worked through all of the committees. Each college had its own strategic planning committee. Each department had that. Uh, student government was very much involved, undergraduate and graduate. And it was a huge conversation at the university. Um, how did that come out at the end after years of discussion and, and a good, good many back and forths and cons and pro, con, pro cons, uh, point and counterpoint? and some disappointments, quite frankly, along the way, and some disagreements along the way. This board, at the end of all of the debate, approved the university's strategic action plan and its package, 11 to 1. And the faculty senate, where we had very robust, rigorous debates, passed it by over 95% of the voting roll call vote for members of the senate. So the outcome was positive. The, the, the journey was informative. Uh, and um, I think it led to, I followed the university for a bit since, I think your colleges and departments are doing fabulously well. And I hope and I'm sure that part of that was this increased academic intellectual exchange synergy as well as interdisciplinarity. And there's no better example, I'll just leave one and then we move forward. There's no better example of the importance of academic synergy and interdisciplinarity when you think of where we are today in higher education and society at large, when we have uh, uh, um, all of the technological and, and scientific issues um, uh, facing us, uh, A1 and chat GPT, and how are we as a society going to understand how the technology and the machines and the robot um, are going to affect our lives, humankind, society, um, that's where that interdisciplinary and that intellectual uh, academic exchange really helps us to get the humanists and the social scientists together with the scientists and, and the tech, technicians of the world to help us inform how AI moves forward, where we may have to pause, um, and understand the human consequences of where we're going. That's a today's problem, but that's what we were thinking about could be helpful earlier on. We can come back to it uh, a bit later as well and, and I talk about some other issues around that uh, strategic plan. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, moving on then to question three, Regent Farnsworth. Um, thank you and good afternoon. Um, the president delegates a significant portion of the strategic management of the university to a team of senior leaders and others. <coughs> Tell us about a time when you successfully developed and convened a team of leaders or experts to implement a strategic objective. What was the objective? Who were the leaders involved? Describe how you developed the team as well as any challenges you faced. And then what steps did you take to overcome those challenges? And what was the outcome of their work? Regent Brinsworth, have you probably asked a question that I may have just answered a bit. <laughs> I would. And I think it would, in the interest of efficiency and lightness in the day, let me uh, let me just say, I'll, I'll repeat and summarize a bit. Uh, whether it was strategic planning, something as large as that, or whether it's um, a, a smaller but very important issue at the university. The team, your colleagues, the competency and the capacity, I mentioned it earlier, around you is critical. And so again, the scale, small or large, it's about a university-wide conversation, bringing the colleagues together, your word team together. Uh, again, starting with the regions, informing earlier where there are opportunities or possible problems. Invoking the shared governance structure, talking with faculty senate, FCC, of course, dean's council, staff council, and if, and if relevant, the students, of course pulling together that team, going back to what I mentioned before, do I have the competency and capacity in central administration to be able to work together as a team, collaboratively, collegiately? And so when focuses, um, I think, really uh, on that, whether it's a big uh, idea, a big, wonderful opportunity, or a crisis, you work with that structure and it, and it Minnesota, you have had a long-standing history of a very effective shared governance system. And you build relationships over the years, small issues, large issues, so that when that tough one comes or that grand opportunity comes, you build some trust and some credibility and confidence between your colleagues at the university, from the board all the way down to anybody who, who is really wanting to be engaged. It's about the conversation. It's about engagement. It's about listening, listening. Uh, that's the way I think that you build a team and you keep that cohesiveness together, the small issues or the big issues. But don't wait till the crisis comes to try to help and build those relationships. It's about building them early building the trust, building the confidence, building the rapport, building the empathy when that's necessary around that team. And of course, always thinking about competency and capacity to deliver. Yeah. So that's how I would think about team building and relationships. As you know, I've shared with you an op-ed I did after I finished my presidency, kind of reflecting on 30 years of higher education administration. And uh, I also teach a, a course now on U.S. President's, uh, presidential uh, leadership, all about failures and successes, how it all happens from Washington to Joe Biden. And one of the things I've learned in the first paragraph, if you had an opportunity to look at that up, it is I kind of try to summarize all the different discipline definitions of leadership. And then I try to share what I think is the most important leadership overall piece and that's relational leadership. At the end of the day, it's about working together and supporting each other towards a goal, towards a success, towards an opportunity, or even with a challenge. And if you haven't built up that relationship, the trust, the confidence, the rapport, the empathy, it's not going to work very well. And emotional intelligence plays a large role. You can be a brilliant scientist. You can be a fabulous manager. Those trains are running on time. But at the end, it's about relationships and personality <coughs> and temperament to work with people, to draw the best out, and together reach a solution. So that's how I would think about team building and rapport with and the hard work together. 
Thank you. Regent Gulley, you want to take on question four? that relies on <laughs> legislative and community relationships. Describe a time when you had to navigate complex legislative or community issues. How did you go about building the relationships with key legislative or community stakeholders to ensure the outcomes and would meet your organization's needs? Regent Kelly, thank you. Well, I've had quite a bit of experience both in uh, legislative arenas and in the community that we live in. And how do you navigate? How do you build and navigate? Perhaps my last comment, it's about relationships. And again, you have to start early. You can't start when it's the crisis or it's the please help me. You've got to build that relationship um, externally with the legislature. I'm going to give some examples. And of course, again, back on campus with that shared governance, the Senate, the FCC, Dean's Council, Staff Council, all of a it is about um, relationships, authentic relationships, not spur of the moment ad hoc. That doesn't work. Where were you before when I needed you and now you're coming to me? With regard to the legislature, I, when I was, um, when I was dean in Arizona, I had a couple of opportunities, calls to go to the Arizona legislature where there were some crises in the state that I, that I was asked for. So I got my first experience way back as a very young dean uh, working with the Arizona legislature on some very hot button issues. Um, and then, of course, when I came here as dean, um, very modest amount with the legislature, of course, because of central administration's role. But when I became provost, there were often times when President Brunick had a conflict and he asked me to go down to St. Paul, whether a formal testimonial presentation of course, backed up by, by Donna, our, our legislative uh, liaison at the time, uh, and well prepped by her, of course. Um, and there were many times when I was provost here that Donna would call and, and say, um, Chair so-and-so has got a couple of questions. It's coming up in three hours on the agenda. Can you get down here? Well, you know, 20 minute, 30 minute drive. Yes, Donna, I'll be there on that spur of the moment, maybe it was even in the hallway. <clears throat> Often Donna would say to me, Tom, this thing's coming up next week. Would you come down and just kind of walk the halls with me in St. Paul, meet and greet. Um, and that's something I thoroughly enjoyed. I learned it here. Um, and then when, of course, when I became president of the University of Vermont, the president at the University of Vermont makes all presentations uh, to the legislature. And so I would go down every year, like Minnesota 12th, January to May, I would go down with the formal presentations, Higher Education Committee, Budget Committee, Finance Committee, Capital Improvements Committee, and make the formal presentations on behalf of the university. But most of my time with the legislature was really about walking the halls um, and talking one-on-one -on -one with senators or house members. In Vermont, we have 150 house members and 30 senators a large body for a small state. <laughs> um, um, and it's important, I also want to mention, Regent Gully, that a public university has to be nonpartisan, and its leadership has to be nonpartisan. Um, and I never participated in any local or state politics while I was dean, while I was president, while I was provost, for all the obvious reasons. Um, and in Vermont, I've had the opportunity to work with two very different governors, uh, uh, a very progressive Democratic governor and a very moderate Republican governor. And uh, Republican governors in the Northeast or in New England are very rare. Our governor right now is the only Republican governor left after the last elections. And again, it's about those relationships build early. Um, um, and, and so I spent a lot of time in probably two or three days every single week from January to May. And in Vermont, I, this is important. I want to talk about the architecture of the Capitol, which is 1791, one of the oldest capitals. In the middle of it, they built a cafeteria. And there's a reason for that. None of the um, 170 members have offices other than the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, and Senate pro tem. No one else has an office. It's all Chuck Peter. 
close in friendships. All of the business is done and the proverbial napkin in the cafeteria at noon. Where do you suppose I was at noon, two or three days a week, in the cafeteria having lunch? Whether I had an agenda, it was go down, meet and greet, see, say hi. I also had the great benefit of having nine of my trustees sitting legislative members. We have a 24 member board at the Vermont governor, three gubernatorial appointments, two students, nine sitting legislators, and nine self-perpetuating or private kind of alum members. A very diverse board. And I really relish that model because I had nine sitting legislators who were colleagues of mine as trustees on the board. And they would educate me problems, opportunities, and, and uh, I had a lot of lunches in that cafeteria with the legislators, getting to know each, building trust, creating those relationships. So when I needed something, or when I was formally asking for millions of dollars, it was a one-on-one -on -one first name basis. And I can tell you, while the food was modest, the cookies were great. And that, yeah. <laughs> I was known for Tom, just freshly, they're right over there. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that, and I should mention, when I left the presidency, the House, 150 members, called me down. It was a complete surprise. Um, and there was a proclamation unanimously approved to a standing ovation for my contributions. The speaker told me, never in the history of Vermont have they ever recognized a university president, particularly with unanimous proclamation. Thank you. With regard to community building, of course, and I think there's a real opportunity if I listen to you, I need your documents for community building here. The town gown, being close to city, county, state government, authentic relationships, social relationships when you weren't doing business. And of course, you have a marvelous, very marvelous community here. Corporate, when I was here, 21 corporate Fortune 500 headquarters. I don't know if that number is up or down now. Um, um, all kinds of wonderful people. A community external is so important to the reputation of the university, the predictability of the university in their eyes, the stability, and of course, ultimately, the trust. That again is an important constituency, not, not all the important constituents on campus but the external, starting with the legislature, starting with the political leaders in a nonpartisan way, the local political leaders and our business communities, that external, because when the tough times come or when you need more money, which we always do, if the relationships and trust have been established, you might get the benefit of that. So that's uh, how I've spent a lot of time on legislative and community trust building, relationship building. Thank you. Regent Hipsch. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Chair. You know, the university senior leaders rarely act unilaterally. <laughs> How do you ensure that those on a team or across an organization feel heard and valued during the decision-making process and share an example of a situation where you effectively incorporated multiple perspectives to arrive at a successful outcome? Thank you for your, your question. It kind of is directly related to some of the matters we've just talked about. Um, so let me just su summarize because I think it's so directly related. Again, uh, we start with um, um, that team, those colleagues, those everyday fellow leaders, shared governance structure we talked about, and the relationships hopefully that have been built internal to the university and the point just a moment about, about community relationship building as well. Um, the um, just a, a simple example that I learned so much from when I was dean at Arizona and then more importantly here at Minnesota. I would put on my calendar, literally on my calendar, a block once a week, about two hour block, just my administrative assistant and the here would always say to me, oh, that's his walking around time. Where I would get out of the office, and in this case, walking around Mondale Hall, 
and just literally walk the halls. We had faculty on four different floors um, and pop in. We faculty was very open door. Kind of this is pre pandemic there from eight to six every day, kind of engaged faculty. Pop in. How you doing? What's going on? How's the teaching going? How's that chapter four in your book going? I had no agenda other than connecting with the faculty uh, and letting them know that the dean was very accessible. Yeah, he comes by all the time kind of thing <laughs> to um, and that's your point about the team and the colleagues. How do they know they have access and can be heard and have been heard? Um, that was a, a small example of what I did. At, obviously, as provost <laughs> at Minnesota or president of Vermont, one can't do walking around and connect with everybody. But if you have that opportunity to do that regularly, word will get around, quite frankly. Um, I remember when I was dean, I taught both semesters full time. Pretty rare for a law school dean, but it's my passion in teaching and being connected with students. I would go down to the classroom and a half an hour, 45 minutes for, stay a half an hour. If you know Mondale Hall, it's down on the first floor, lots of large classrooms. And I would just stick around and 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 I frequently heard students coming and going from classes. Oh, well, there he is, just go ask. You don't need an appointment. Right there he is. And that kind of extra time for relationships, for access perception, and for an opportunity to learn a lot more than sitting in the office. I also, as provost um, and as president, when I would meet with with deans, a very important constituent on this campus, I would meet regularly, so did Bob Brunix, uh, with uh, dean's council once a month, the two of us, and then uh, regularly every other month, and certainly in, uh, each semester or more formal, I would go to their office, their faculty office. They're not coming to my provost or my president office. I'm walking the campus, I'm chatting along the way, I'm meeting people, and I'm giving them the respect of going to them. That I think is part of that team collegial relationship, trust and confidence building in an authentic way so that they will be frank and candid with you with information. And there's not a hierarchy of, oh, I can't tell them this. I hope that's helpful. All right, Regent Ruth Johnson, please. Afternoon. Tell us about your experience working with boards, particularly a public board. Your understanding of how public and private boards and organizations they serve differ. What steps have you taken to develop and maintain a good working rela relationship with the board? And give us an example when you presented a concept or proposal to a board and the board was not supportive. <laughs> what steps did you take to overcome those challenges? Thank you, uh, Regent Johnson. Um, well, I've had the opportunity to be on private boards and public, as all of you have. Uh, the list is long, I know, for all of you. Um, um, I was uh, on uh, my alma mater undergraduate as a private institution, and um, I was um, um, on the board as a, I think, for eight years as a trustee of the university. Um, but let me back up if I could just a minute. Um, it came early to me about the importance of shared governance. When I was a undergraduate student, and this is a, my, uh, Drake University, uh, um, I was the first student ever to be elected a full voting member to the faculty senate. It was a radical thing in the, in the 60s to actually have a student on the faculty senate with voting rights. I was the first student ever uh, elected. And I'll tell a story later about, about that when we get to um, some um, uh, ethical challenges and so forth. But what I learned as a junior and senior, and this, this by the way, was um, 1968, 1969, a long time ago, a uh, tumultuous time in the United States. Um, Vietnam War, Martin Luther King's assassination, Bobby Kennedy's assassination, um, Democratic Convention in August of 1968, where I, I was a worker there. Tumultuous buildings were being bombed and fired and demonstrations everywhere. And here I am in the faculty center. And what I learned, that this, this is the point I want to make, and we'll talk a bit later about another incident. 
I learned the importance of shared governance as this, whatever I was, 19 year old, and how the faculty senate worked there in cooperation with the central administration and the, and their private board that I later served on. So private boards also um, are so different, aren't they? Um, public accountability, transparency, uh, very different than a public board, as you well know. Uh, the selection process is very different, public versus private conversations and selections. And, um, and of course, uh, as we all know in public institutions, data practices act requests. Every document is a public document. People are entitled to know. And of course, in private institutions, there is none of that. It's private. Um, and so I've had both opportunities. I've, I've sat on, I work very closely with this board, of course, through my dean and particularly my provost days here. And then, of course, at the University of Vermont, uh, I sit on the board as a, I sat on the board as a full voting member of the board. So I've had lots of experience uh, with board, private and public, uh, and, um, and, and the importance of how they work and, and, and how they should work. Um, you asked um, Regent Johnson about um, sometimes they don't, don't support you. Well, when they don't support you, and, and uh, luckily I was the number two person here, the president had to take all of that acclaim or criticism and we were there to help back up but um but when i went to vermont of course it was the president who was the uh, sitting on the board drawing up the agenda with the chair of the board and and having um, the, the conversations that you have i was very fortunate i was very fortunate in vermont the board sits four times a year for three days at a time um, and um, in my seven years with all those board meetings, um, I only had one negative vote. That's a lot of work and a lot of luck. And I'll share with you the negative vote that still is such a joy to me. We have, uh, this institution is 222 years old, 1791, the University of Vermont was established same time as our Bill of Rights for those watching the Constitution, our lawyers in the room. Um, the um, board there um, has a lot of deferred maintenance, as you know here, we all do at universities, because of our historical building. We have buildings 1700, 1800, very old buildings, very expensive historical preservation. And we were redesigning, reimagining, and rehabbing a couple of the very oldest buildings. And we had one of my colleague trustees, a lovely, lovely person who is a, uh, an expert on energy and the environment. And he never believed that you could ever put air conditioning successfully in anything other than a new building. Well, some of us disagreed, of course. And uh, we had four or five of the 17, 18 century buildings that we wanted to put. One of them was a residence hall. And Vermont can be warm in the summer and fall. And so the plan was to put air conditioning in the residence hall. And he objected strongly. And I remember my board chair at the time was a woman. And she had two kids in college at the time. And she answered back with a very wonderful laugh and she said, have you ever been in one of our dorms in the summertime that is not air conditioned? The place broke up in laughter. Anyway, we voted, the vote was unanimous, but his vote. And, and, and I said at the time, that's my only negative vote. What a fun one that one was to discuss. So I was, I was lucky. Uh, we, had, we had a wonderful board, have a wonderful board and uh, um, and and let me, I might ask, well, why? I mean, it's not all luck. How, how come? One of the things I did there, and I think it's so important, remember, it's a board of 24 people. At every board meeting, week or 10 days before the board meeting, we had the full board book out, the entire agenda. I called, or they came to my office, depending upon if they were local, every board member one-on-one. -on -one. And we spent an hour or an hour and a half 
a week or 10 days for going every item of that agenda. So that one, they had an opportunity earlier to read thoroughly. And two, we had an opportunity to discuss where are the opportunities, where are the challenges, where are the problems, where are the ambiguities that I've missed. Help me understand how I can get you more prepared and have a successful board meeting. So I did every board one-on-one -on -one calls before for an hour or an hour and a half. That was enormously helpful and I think was the answer to our successful collegial board meetings. Because when we got to the board, Everybody had read it carefully. We knew exactly where the tension points were or opportunities. And it went rather, rather smoothly. And I always told if there's an ambiguity or a new thought between our conversations, let me know and see if we can talk about it. So there were no surprises, I hope, I think, at our board meetings. And I think that brought some success. Again, the relationship piece building that trust and confidence before you have to call on it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Regent Tad Johnson. Thank you for being here. Equity, diversity, and inclusion are extremely important to our university. With that in mind, could you describe examples of how you have fostered a culture of diversity and inclusion in your current or previous role. As part of your answer, describe the programs or policies you have implemented and some challenges you have faced when promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you for your very important question. Let me just be, be very clear on my, my view and my definition, if I could. When we talk about diversity and inclusion, um, I have always said, um, that when a university speaks about quality, advancing quality, it includes diversity and inclusion as part of quality. You cannot have quality without those components present and effective. Many people talk about quality and diversity. It's part of the definition. I don't want to separate the two because it almost makes the second seem secondary. It has to be central, core, and prominent. Quality incorporates diversity, broadly defined, and uh, and and the goals of uh, of inclusion and equity. Um, because it's so important, if we're leaving people that are that are diverse, that have different backgrounds at different opportunities or barriers in life, if we're not adding them to how we talk about uh, the university and quality, we are not going to be educated in them. Those experiences, those barriers, perhaps discrimination, we need to know that as we're making decisions about quality and enhancement of quality. So I, I want to make the point about how I define quality. It's not a separate, it is core to thinking about quality. And second, it starts from the top. It has to come from leadership and hopefully leadership modeling that throughout performance. Um, it can't be a one-off occasional conversation. It's got to be central to the conversation at every opportunity. It has to be pervasive through the culture and the operational part of an institution. Uh, it can't be a secondary thought. It's got to be core because we're such a diverse society and we should be. And those voices and those backgrounds and those experiences need to be part of the informing our decision making. Um, some examples, if I may, as you request, um, particularly I'll draw some some very recent ones. Um, when I was president of Minnesota, during my time as president, it was the first time in the history where the majority of our deans were women. That was not by accident. I would also share with you um, that one has to really focus on how do you build diversity and inclusion and different viewpoints. It starts at hiring. And we also used to talk about the well, the pool isn't sufficient enough. 
the pool is sufficient enough today, without question. Let's get over the pool conversation. The talent is there. Sometimes you have to use a little extra effort to find it, to reach it, to get, to engage it. The talent is there. So it starts with hiring and supporting those people when they join the, uh, the administration. Um, um, I think you have to build it into your strategic plan. It's got to be a central part. I, I see that in your impact 2025 statement. It's not an add-on. It's got to be pervasive throughout. Um, and so let me share some examples, if I may, with you from the Vermont experience most recently. When I came to Vermont, we had a, a, a relatively modest but thoughtful general education requirements of all of our students preceded me. One of those requirements was a mandatory two courses on diversity, history, culture, society, discrimination, barriers. Four, we have matured that into a broader perspective in the present general core educational requirements of all students, regardless of major. Um, second, um, when we did a major comprehensive campaign in Vermont, we set aside specifically a lot of opportunity and investment in scholarships. And we particularly said, we want to recruit students from lower income, socioeconomic, uh, underprivileged, disadvantaged students. And we set up special scholarships for that important targeted pool of talented students in scholarships. That was a commitment that was very clear in our comprehensive uh, campaign. I would also mention two, two other. Um, we were proud to say that the University of Vermont was the first university ever to have a black student graduate Phi Beta Kappa in the national Phi Beta Kappa. While we were proudly proclaiming that, Mr. Harrison, we also discovered in our research that we had our first African-American student graduate in 1862 that we never knew about. 1862, Andrew Harris. And uh, he went on to um, become a Presbyterian minister and one of the leading national abolitionists in the country. Unfortunately, he died relatively early in his late 20s. So when we discovered this, and, in, and as we're doing the campaign and trying to find scholarships to to really highlight the importance of this talented pool that we wanted to bring into the student body, I decided that we needed to find a space on our campus to honor Andrew Harris, our first black grad in 1862. And uh, we have a, a beautiful campus, a bit smaller than VU, a bit smaller, but a beautiful campus, considered one of the most attractive campuses in the United States, best college town in the United States, Burlington as the press said, tell us. Um, and there was a wonderful piece of greenery between our major student center and the library. And um, I looked at that and I said, what if we planted more trees? It's wonderful quad. What if we put in benches <coughs> and opportunities as students are going? Library student, I mean, it was, this is the main pathway. And we created the Andrew Harris Commons with appropriate banners and plaques and historical memory and so forth. You can't miss it on the campus. Um, and finally, I would say, um, and I can get to it in a question that may be coming up a bit later with challenges and opportunities. We set up a strategic plan on the campus in my uh, last, uh, second last year to strategic plan directed specifically to talking about race, history, culture, discrimination, uh, and how we talk on campus to students and educate and learn from students of color. Um, those were not easy conversations. We had a lot to learn. We had students complaining about microaggressions from fellow students and from some faculty. We needed to educate ourselves. And so we set up a special, and I will discuss a bit later, the process, how we got there, the tough times, the success stories. 
but the outcomes were that we, we produced, I, I think it was called later, a model for other universities to think about having those tough conversations. The strategic plan for talking about race. From a teaching opportunity standpoint, from, from collegial building understanding. And so that's at the university. So just some examples of Regent Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, we will, oops, wrong part of the page here. Here we go. Uh, at this time, we will move to Regent Tarabi. Just to give you a heads up. Uh, oh, I did? I'm sorry. <laughs> Where did I? Oh, I wrote I'll go. Oh, it's, it's Mike. I'm sorry. I wrote down Ruth Johnson twice. I'm sorry. Our next questioner will be Regent uh, Kimyanya. Just to let you know, um, Professor Sullivan, that uh, we've got 30 minutes left. And we want to make sure that not only we finish our questions, but hopefully we can give you time to ask us questions. So with that, Chair. Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Sullivan. Um, building and maintaining strong relationships with faculty, staff, and students um, is essential for a president of a large, complex, decentralized university with a shared governance model. With that in mind, please share examples of how you have approached building relationships with various groups and stakeholders. How did you engage with each to understand their needs and concerns? Thank you, uh, Robin. I, I probably answered a good deal of this before, so I hope I'm not redundant. Um, but again, it's 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 about when you're talking about relationships, colleagues, faculty, staff, students, regions, trustees, of course. Um, the conversation we had about relationships and, and their importance. Um, and again, it has to be authentic. It, it can't be an ad hoc, oh, I need your help now, and we'll work it. It, it has to be building those collegial links and, and relationships. Um, again, my op-ed, I hope, helps under, understand that. Shared governance structure is very important here. It's already there. You know the different layers of consultation, which can be helpful for you as you build those relationships with faculty, staff, um, and, and students. Um, I've said that quite a few times. I, I actually believe that. And I think uh, relationships are so important, internal on the campus and the external conversation we had earlier uh, about constituent groups, whether legislature and, and other political leaders in the, in the community. Um, I think you've probably answered the question and in, in the given the remaining questions and to give you time unless there's more you want to add I'm to not, it. I think we can move on to question nine. I don't want to the next question. I don't want to cut you short, but I know you've answered. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite satisfied if, if, if the region yep. can yeah, satisfy. All right, thank let's you go much. then to now region to <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you. Can you please describe a time when you faced, uh, when you were faced with an ethical dilemma in your professional career? Uh, why was it an ethical dilemma, and how did you arrive at your decision on how to handle it? What was the outcome? Thank you, Robbie. Thank you very much. Many, many, but in the interest of time, let me just share two. You mentioned professional career. If I could start a bit earlier, um, I, I mentioned I was a student representative on the faculty senate in my alma mater. And, and again, this is um, probably one of the very first times when I, I confronted it with whatever it was, 19 or 20, uh, what I considered an ethical issue. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll describe it for you. So again, uh, the, the time is the late 60s. Uh, very tumultuous time in the United States politically and on every campus. Uh, we had a resolution in the faculty senate to uh, throw off the campus our ROTC program. ROTC. Uh, we had uh, several uh, Army, military, Air Force, I think, at the time. And uh, this is the heart of Vietnam. We, we had demonstrations every day in, in Des Moines and on the campus. Um, and I was the only student on that Senate. And I think probably 90% of the students were anti-war and, and <clears throat> let's bring the troops home and anti-administration <coughs> in Washington. <laughs> And this was, this was a dilemma for me because while I shared those views as a student, 
many people thought that I was a student and I should be representing just student viewpoint. Well, that would have been easy if I, if that's all I thought. But the lens of the framework I was looking through was a, somewhat of a unique one. Um, the, the woman I was dating at the time um, later became my late first wife. Um, she had an older brother who was at the Air Force Academy, uh, two years ahead of me. And we talked a lot about our curriculum and where he was and where I was and what he was taking, what I was taking. And I got a good sense of what the military academies teach. And I'm this is not here to criticize them. They're, they teach a lot of military history, and, and, and then well, they should. But I was doing the humanities and social sciences and the arts, and philosophy, and really. And it struck me what a very different educational curriculum the two of us had. Um, and that was the frame I was thinking about. And I stood up and made remarks at the Faculty Senate uh, as, as, as a student. And I opposed the motion to throw Razzi off campus, even though all of my student colleagues, this was the ethical dilemma. Am I here strictly to represent the students? Or is it something more? If you, if you know a bit about uh, political theory, and of course you've heard uh, Edmund Burke from Ireland and England, uh, a great theorist about political things, and he also said, no, that's not the real world. It's about you have more information than your constituents. You need to use your judgment, even if it goes against what you think is the vast majority. And I was thinking about that, and I, and I voted against the resolution to throw Razzi off, even though my political sentiments may well have been very different, because that comparison between my to be brother in law um, was one of, I don't think we should be educating our military leaders solely in one way. And if we have a broader opportunity curriculum, the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, um, philosophy and religion, maybe they'll have a broader perspective as leaders in our country. And, um, and I still believe that today. And that, that motion failed, and Drake kept Razzi, I believe, up until this time. And to um, fit about, I don't know, several months ago, it would have been 50 years ago, I picked up the New York Times and on the front page there was a story about Harvard. Harvard, after 50 years, decides to bring Razzi back to campus. And I smiled and said, some of us kept him there to make sure that that broader liberal based education would be available to everyone, including our senior military leaders. Bringing it more up to date in terms of, uh, 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 of an example of, um, of a kind of a moral dilemma where I may have to go against, uh, president of the University of Vermont several years ago now, 2018 if I recall, we had serious legislative discussion about decriminalizing certain drugs and criminalizing certain drugs. And uh, I was not taking, as the president of the university, any public stance either way for obvious reasons. But I was hearing from my uh, science and, and medical school colleagues that they were having a hard time going to the legislature and getting an opportunity to testify about the health concerns of some of the drugs that were under discussion, particularly for a cohort cohort of 18 to 21 year olds, our, our students. Um, as you all know, and our neuroscientists have reaffirmed recently, the adult brain does not fully develop for a woman until about 25, and for a man, 29 or 30. Now, for some of you, that's not a surprise, perhaps, in the room. <laughs> but, and, and, it, and it's not well known. But here we have a cohort of students who, you know, 18 to 21, and let's experiment and on it, as all, we all probably did in college. And um, and my colleagues from the medical school and the scientific community were saying, we don't have a chance to go down and testify when it was such a, and as president of the university, my principal responsibility was the health and welfare and safety of our students in our community. And I thought 
it was compelling that the legislature should hear from the experts, science and data and medical research. So I went down and had a meeting with the governor. I spoke with the leadership heads and said, I understand I've got some colleagues. Would you let them come down and testify? And, and put it all out there, free market of ideas, but you have greater information. And uh, my colleagues got their hearing. Um, and I think it had a positive outcome. One, we opened up the conversation about the benefits or the costs of decriminalizing or legalizing um, certain drugs in, in our society. Um, the legislation got delayed for further research and conversation. Age changes were made in terms of uh, who had access or not. So, so the system worked in that way. But I wanted to protect, and it was this was a conflict because I had to really go and make the case for why, why science and medicine and that important data on health and how the young brain develops or what can interfere with it. And uh, so I was happy with the outcome. Well, I was happy with the process of the outcome. Um, but that was a real dilemma for me. Thank you very much. We'll move on to question 10. Uh, Mary Turner. On Zoom. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mary Turner. The president has to navigate political realities and external pressures in managing controversial issues. Please give us an example when you had to make a tough decision on a controversial or high profile issue. How did you handle it? What approach did you take managing that issue that was polarizing or divisive among different groups? Thank you, Regent Turner. I'll share just two examples. Um, I've alluded to one already, uh, the Minnesota uh, uh, question and, and then a Vermont question. We talked about the strategic plan at Minnesota. Um, I was provost and Bob Brunix was president. We talked about the severe budget cuts that we were facing, kind of exigent circumstances on how to rethink, reimagine efficiency and effectiveness while continuing to build quality. Um, and hence the strategic plan that we talked about a bit earlier about looking at colleges and reimagining structures and, and really trying to promote uh, the terms I used a moment ago. Um, academic uh, synergy between and interdisciplinary. Um, and, and so we, we set up a university-wide strategic action committee. Each college had it, each department had it. As we presented plans uh, to try to, to be more efficient and effective and really to improve the academic and intellectual discourse, teaching and research at the time when it was tough financially. And, um, and that went on for a good long time. The conversation, again, shared governance was so important. Structure here at Minnesota. Many conversations with Senate, particularly through FCC, the executive committee, Eanes Council, mon monthly meetings, student and uh, undergraduate and graduate students about the reimagining, redesigning, integrating, merging to increase those synergies and our disciplinarity and to try some find some efficiencies uh, along the way. Um, those were sometimes tough conversations. Um, uh, it went on as it should have been so that we had as full a consultation as possible. Um, uh, obviously, people who were sitting in certain places where they've been sitting for a long time didn't particularly want to think about change. I understand that. I'm a faculty member. Um, but ultimately, um, after many, many shared and of course reporting, reporting every month to this board about where are we on, on, on strategic planning, where are we on those reimagining and integration of colleges and, and so forth. Um, um, as I said, we, we came to resolution, the board voted 11 to 1 in favor of the university's plan, the faculty senate 95% voted in favor. So the end was positive, I believe, for the university. Um, and as I look now at, at your U, I see the robustness, the intellectually billion dollar research. And I've asked the questions recently in the couple last couple of weeks. So how are those colleges doing? How are those new re and all of the colleges effective, I told her, are robust and doing well in productivity and accountability. So, so maybe that reorganization conversation, that reimagining who could we be, who should we be, how do we improve academic 
synergy between and among how do we get people out of intellectual silos and working together and thinking together across disciplines. Per perhaps that was a portend of the future of how we have to think about higher education. Uh, moving to an example uh, which I alluded to earlier, I, I think with uh, Regent Davenport um, at Vermont, a, a conversation about race on campus. We um, had a group of four, four or five students. Um, um, it turns out uh, all four or five of them were uh, women of color. Um, really got quite upset um, with uh, Micro, um, microaggressions as they saw and felt them on campus. Conversations that didn't understand and respect race, history, culture, society. And they got very upset and they came to the administration and we said, we need to make changes here. And um, we wanted to understand um, it wasn't easy to begin because they were upset. and. So I had uh, my vice president for diversity who had been uh, with us for 30 years, an African-American woman, unbelievably spectacular. And my uh, vice provost for students, uh, another 30 person colleague, a woman, try to work almost daily with these students to figure out what are their real concerns? How can we work with them? How do we know what those concerns are? Do we fully understand ourselves an educational opportunity? Um, and, and when those conversations were not going as smoothly or as quickly as we would have hoped, I fell back kind of on my legal education and my teaching of, I've taught the new lawyers in the room, the rest pardon me, I've taught civil procedure for a very long time. Uh, how to try a case, how to put a case together. But I always taught them on the first day of class, literally. If you have to go into the courtroom, you probably fail as a lawyer, unless it's a matter of principle or morals where public issues are at stake. Alternative dispute resolution always can come in handy when you have conflicts. So I said to my general counsel, let's see if we can't go to formal litigation. Go out and hire a, a, a highly regarded lawyer for the students, one for us, We'll take care of the financial side, make sure there's no conflict of interest here. The lawyers need to know that they're representing the student. And let's see if we can sh have shuttle diplomacy between us to try to move forward in a, in a closer, better understanding of, of the issues. That went through for about a month and it was highly successful. And we were able to that spring come up with a strategic plan. That's what I alluded to earlier. Uh, Agent Davenport, a strategic plan on how to talk about and deal with race on campus. Um, how to really sit down in our classrooms, teaching and learning opportunities for all of us to work through history, culture, barriers, discrimination for all of us. To learn. And we reached agreement on uh, five or seven principles through this strategic plan that we created. I believe that's still in operation. And we have built on that by significant um, conversations, guest lectures, panel discussions, seminars throughout the academic year. These aren't just one-offs again. It's got to be pervasive at the university uh, by bringing in noted scholars, uh, noted uh, leaders in, uh, in our communities to talk about race. Some hard questions in the society. We all need to listen, to learn, and it's got to start with our universities and with our young people as they come in as undergraduates. And hopefully we can model as leaders and understand and listen. That was tough. It was not an easy first month or so for us to understand where are we, what are our problems, which we didn't see because our lenses were different. And um, that was a strategic plan that we built. I hope it's still in operation pervasively month by month with programs and lectures and seminars and opportunities and luncheons to engage and talk about race and history and discrimination and how we all learn to work together. Thank you. Last question and we'll see if we have time for any of your questions, but let's go to uh, Regent Verhalen. 
Question 11. Good afternoon. Um, the president's charged with leading one of the world's <laughs> largest public research universities. In your experience, what is the role of the chief executive in sustaining and growing the university's $1 billion research portfolio? Very important, Regent Drake. Very important. I've been a tenured faculty member at five major research universities. Faculty member, dean, provost, president. I've been a teacher scholar at those five and another five as a visiting faculty member who are all R1 research universities. I am deeply committed to the mission. And I think there are a couple of strategies that are essential to make sure that you're pushing the envelope on research at every opportunity. First, it really starts with hiring. When you hire your faculty, your scholar teachers, are they going to be a major significant contributor to the, to the research, the scholarship, and the creative activity of your university? Sweeping in all the way from nuclear scientists to your poets and your artists and your dance the creative side, the research side, the scholarship side. Uh, I understand that. I've tried to practice it myself as a teacher, scholar. Um, so it starts with whom we hire and the expectations and the productivity of those scholars. And we in the academy use one standard, impact. How much of an impact does your research, your scholarship, your creative activity make? And that can be measured regardless of the discipline, the arts all the way to uh, a neuroscientist. So it starts with a hiring and building a cohort of faculty, our university citizens who believe in the goal and the aspirations and how to, how to get there. Second, um, infrastructure. You've got to have the infrastructure for the scientists and the engineers and the technologists. And the, and the artists, their studios, to be able to support them. And you've got to be on the front of the curve. You can't be using 20th century technology or studios because that's going to stifle the creativity and the imagination. Um, I was here when the <coughs> university adopted the phrase, driven to discover. And I'm so happy you still have it because that's what it's about. Whether you're the artist or the poet, or Pulitzer Prize winner or the Nobel. It's about having structure and support in your institution and a commitment from your institution that this is the goal, this is the aspiration. So it's about infrastructure and, and, and support. Um, it's also third about hiring a top, very creative vice president for research. Someone who has the deep knowledge and respect and understanding on how you build great research scholarship and creative activities and how you support it. Um, and again, relationships matter. And understanding across the major university that has great science and great medicine and fabulous engineering and wonderful humanities and the arts, and dance and theater and, and, and so forth. So you've got to have an expert who's really aggressive and understand it and a great teacher to teach the rest of us the importance of scholarship and research and creative activities to have that impact, to be a distinguished major consequential university, leadership counts here. Um, and, and finally, um, to be able to go well beyond that billion dollar mark, which is fabulous, you've got to have the full support of, of the president, the provost and the board to know how important this research and the creative activities are for your reputation, your status, and how you're making a huge impact in humankind. Um, and again, that starts at the top. So your president needs to make sure the board understands, as you do, the importance of this mission. Minnesota is a public comprehensive land grant research mission driven with a great liberal arts tradition in the core. All of that has to come together for the teaching and the research to be successful, to be noted and to be impactful. 
it has to be a top priority. Thank you, Regent Wheeler. You want to ask the question of the laws? <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, <laughs> Professor. To ask is a question. We've got welcome and good minutes. afternoon. Um, we've obviously gone through our list of questions. Is there anything else you want to ask us, or anything else you want us to know? Well, I realize the importance of timing, and this has been a long day for you. So, <laughs> with with a bit of brevity, but but a kind of a global question that integrates a couple of major concerns and I know from all of them, <coughs> opportunity. As you think about the appointment of an intern, as you think about two different stages, the transition between the appointment and the negotiation and the announcement and uh, President Gable leaving, that critical transition period. And, and I am very mindful I am very mindful, having just gone through it. We have one president at a time. The transition period, what needs, what contribution can your interim make during this transition while President Gable is still here? And second, the responsibilities and the priorities, particularly that you see for your interim, the one year period or whatever it might be. I see that as too distinct. What are your priorities for the transition? What needs to be done? That handoff. And what do you want that one year to look like? We, we know we've talked about, I mentioned you've shared earlier, positioning during the interim to get the university ready for a highly successful national search. No question about that. And there's a lot of things that I've heard you say external relations, public relations, trust, confidence, stability, reputation externally, as well as, of course, continuing on the campus. Very important to get the university ready to be seen as a great university that someone will want to be, cherish, be your president. And second, to move forward the IMPACT 2025 plan with diligence, and whether or not you see changes as you're on this journey already to that plan that the interim needs to know about or pay attention to. And let me just finally say, uh, you see when I said a global question that maybe it's a longer conversation for all of you and your interim. I appreciate that very much. Um, having, having done this off and on for 30 years, even in the interim, things will happen Crises will come up on a daily basis. Just look at our, our, our national news every day. And your interim has got to be a president who is ready and experienced to handle the crisis of today that you never thought about yesterday. Pause for a minute and think about some of these crises that we, we've had. Free speech and expression on campus. Whose privilege is that? Where are the blind drawings? You can't pick up the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education today, without seeing a crisis on some campus about free speech lines. Berkeley, Stanford. Um, every university has gone through this. Can your interim be able to handle those delicate teaching opportunity and leadership points about free speech on campus? A great university is one, and I think Minnesota is exactly this, that believes in strong, robust discourse from every perspective. But there are free speech lines also. We shouldn't shut down, cancel, or inter interfere with speech unless it crosses certain lines. Um, I will tell you from my experience, probably the most challenging issue on any college campus today is the health, well-being, and safety of our students. The pandemic has created enormous mental health challenges, anxieties, depression, sometimes suicides. That is the number one challenge. And your interim, and of course the permanent president, must be able to deal with it. Wellness and health of the student body, which is at an inflection point today. I teach 150 students this semester. I see it every classroom. Somebody ready to step up and think about those medical those medical wellness challenges. And finally, I would uh, I, I would I would mention uh, 
all the other things that can come up and disrupt. Uh, this is a major, important, and hopefully successful uh, athletic program you have here at Minnesota. The NCA has gone through enormous changes, and with the new changes are coming lots of disruption and change. And the last thing you want is a crisis in the athletic department. A road coach, a road player. We've done it now. We're, we're compensating students as they should be. Free agents are running. How do we make sure that we have an absolutely honest athletic program? Finally, I would I, I would just mention Title IX, another serious problem on all of our campuses, where sexual assault claims can flip a campus in 24 hours. If you haven't the right processes, the appropriate due process in place, and a perception of fairness about that. And I would just leave with you in terms of your interim, he or she must be really experienced and understand those instantaneous crises that may come up well beyond positioning the university for good successful or or the strategic plan. I've had opportunities in every one of those. The NCA, I sat as president-elect of the President's Commission, and when I rotated off that, I became a member, along with your dear, wonderful colleague, Phil Maturi, as a member of the NCA Division I Infractions Committee to judge the jury on when there are violations. I've chaired, um, m most recently, for the lawyers in the room, the American um, um, uh, the ALI uh, committee, which is kind of the national committee for lawyers and judges and law professors, the ALI American Law Institute. We had a principal's project on Title IX sexual assaults on campus. Ran for seven years. I was on the council in the last year and a half or so. The senior reporter, professor at Harvard, was going to re retire, and they asked me to be the reporter. I produced for the body last May a 100-page report, along with seven years of conversation and contribution, the report on best practices, best understanding of what we think the law is on sexual assault and Title IX uh, cases. And um, I'm also, as you may know from my resume, uh, a co-author of, of a book on free speech, from core values to current debates. There are a lot of chapters on there about college problems, about free speech, and how we resolve. So in conclusion, I would just say it would be a privilege to be asked to come back one year <laughs> and, and know that 30 years of experience, hopefully, I probably had most of these and a few scratches on the backside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to briefly answer the qu two yeah. questions that were embedded there. Um, on the transition period between um, when we make the decision and when President Cable leaves, the hope is that the, the interim president will be able to basically uh, on board, take what knowledge she can impart to you in that limited period of time or to the interim president so that that person can basically hit the ground running as best as you can with a very quick immersion, which could be a month to six weeks. We recognize it's not much time, but we're hoping that the uh, president, interim president, will be able to take advantage of what President Gable is able to share during that time period. As far as oh, the priorities, uh, we anticipate we will be sitting down with the interim president at the retreat in July and together work on what the priorities will be for that interim president as part of a discussion we will have with that person to take that person through the year. So I think that's probably the quick answer to what are our priorities. It's going to be part of a, a larger discussion that the board will have with the interim president. Thank you. That's very and, helpful. Thank and with that, all. thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank all you right. All. Uh, that will we will take a fifteen minute recess and then we will resume.
Everybody get it? Mary needs to be louder. Oh, all right. Um, is Mary Turner there? Yep, she's in the waiting room. Okay. We're gonna, oh, I see. It says there. Regent Turner, are you there? Because we don't see you on the screen anymore. Oh, there you are. Uh, you're muted. I just want to make, um, let's make sure we've got audio for you. Yeah, I, I've been here the whole time. I just had to okay. recharge. All right. Them. All right. Colleagues, we have completed our interviews. I want to thank all four finalists for their participation in this process. I think each of us can say unequivocally that all four finalists are extremely talented, confirming I think what we all believed was the case when we selected them for interview last week, that we were very much blessed by four very uh, wonderful uh, people who bring different perspectives to us and could all make excellent interim presidents. I, hopefully you all have had an opportunity to complete your notes uh, from all four interviews and are now prepared to proceed forward with deliberations. The plan is this, we will discuss the finalists uh, and then hopefully we will take action to select our interim president today. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few guidelines. First, all of you have received private personnel data about these finalists. This information remains private, non-public data, and we cannot discuss it in this meeting. Our comments should be limited to the materials that are publicly available and the interviews that we just concluded. <coughs> Second, Given the highly public nature of this process, I suggest that rather than enumerating strengths and weaknesses for each finalist, that we focus instead on those attributes that attract us to one finalist over another. We want to be respectful to this excellent pool of finalists who have offered to lead the university during this critical time. <coughs> Third, I would ask respectively, uh, respectfully that Regents avoid jumping in with motions while we deliberate. It's my intention to chair our discussion until it's apparent that we've reached consensus or something close to consensus on a particular candidate. We will start with open discussion uh, time to get a sense of the board's preferences. And after everyone has had an opportunity to weigh in with their thoughts and we've had sufficient dialogue it's my intention to test with the group what I'm hearing. If there seems to be consensus at that point, or at least a strong leading finalist, I will then entertain a motion. The goal here is strong board support, perhaps even unanimous support to successfully launch our new interim president. So with that, we will open up discussion I think what would make most sense uh, if people are willing to do this is for us to just go around the horseshoe here one by one and if each of you would be prepared to share uh, with respect to those candidates that you are uh, interested in and interested in having become the finalist or the person we select to share those attributes that you think would best are attracted you to this candidate and best serve the university. And let me just say that this process that we're going through, this is one that I consulted with um, my co-chairs, uh, Regent Hipsch, Regent Kenyanya, and also with the our executive leader, executive of the board office to come up with this format. 
I'm not, we're not wedded to this. If you all think you have a better way to reach consensus here, happy to hear it. But I think that we thought that the best way is to open it up discussion, talk about those positive attributes, and let's see if, if we are beginning to sense that we are rallying around a particular finalist or perhaps one or two of them. Um, and ultimately that will lead to a motion. So there's no magic to this. We're looking for consensus and why don't we begin and I think what we'll do is start with my colleague at the far end. I'm sorry to put you on the spot like this. You can always pass and we can come back. But why don't we start with Regent Wheeler? I'm happy to start. So so I like you, uh, I feel like we have a tremendous pool of candidates who actually are really committed to the mission of the university in a substantive way. So I'm grateful for all of them participating. We had two candidates, uh, Mary Holtzclaw and uh, Myron Franz, who are in positions at the university already. And I think they're doing exceptional work in an exceptional way um, uh, for the university right now. I, um, so that, that I think is, is very positive on their side. So they could both hit the ground running with a lot of knowledge of the university. I, I do, you know, uh, think that their, their roles are so important and critical to the university now that I wonder what uh, putting in them in this position would mean. The two uh, external candidates, again, very strong uh, people. Um, Mr. Edinger this morning, I think very approachable, complex leadership experience, listens well to diverse um, positions is seasoned in dealing with uh, controversial issues uh, involved with the university and uh, uh, is uh, positive and he is a man of uh, clearly a lot of integrity uh, as well. Um, Tom Sullivan is an inside out candidate who I think has the, of the only ones uh, of the candidates who has sat in the seat of president looking uh, more broadly at uh, university issues. And I think for our needs, Basically, on in, we're, I know we're going to discuss this as a board. What are our needs? You know, as uh, as a week ago, I wasn't a regent, so I'm I'm uh, you know I have lot much to learn, but I think relational um, basis on trust, uh, progress in terms of our strategic plan, particularly with students as the number one um, priority on that plan, dealing with key issues, and then unknown crisis is he key. I will say that uh, my leaning is towards uh, Professor Sullivan in, uh, and I think one of the key things he mentioned was the mental health, well-being and wellness of our student population. And an emphasis there as well as somebody who has the knowledge and has sat in the chair before. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Todd, Tad Johnson. I don't know where I got this, Todd. I can't read that far. <laughs> So I, I was also impressed with all four candidates. I, I had the opportunity to work with um, uh, Vice President Franz and, um, and the Chancellor uh, in my previous job as Senior Director of American Indian Tribal Nation uh, Relations. And um, they are both very good at, at what they, they do. I, uh, uh, and as far as the, the external candidates, um, I thought uh, Mr. Ettinger had, had, was used to running a $9 billion budget, um, more than our current budget, and certainly has done an impressive job of, uh, of running Hormel and um, all the acquisitions and changes he's made there. And a lot of public uh, good as well. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, so I wanted to make a comment on uh, um, so, but ultimately, um, since this is a position that will be in place for one year. I think it makes sense to have somebody who understands the budgets, understands the legislature, um, and understands the leadership of the university. And so um, I would still say that um, Mr. Franz could hit the ground running, uh, as could um, Mr. Sullivan, um, who has been, as he said, professor, dean, provost, and president. 
and has a tremendous amount of experience. I have a lot of political friends who tell me Mr. Ettinger might be the easiest one just because he's an outsider and does not have a political track record. But um, anyway, I'm, uh, I, I think we have a good array of candidates, but those two folks who could hit the ground running are the most uh, come, come to the top of my list. So just so I'm hearing, so the, the, the two that are, are at the top of your list right now are Myron Franz and Tom Sullivan? Correct. Okay. All right, uh, Regent Verhalen. Thanks. Um, I'm going to keep my comments as short as possible. Uh, I, I appreciate all of the time for everyone. I can't imagine what it was like for them over the weekend <laughs> trying to process um, how they would respond to each of these questions. You know, we, we had to create the questions, but we didn't have to create the answers, um, which is sometimes the benefit. Knowing the conversations we've had over the last month now, um, and thinking through the responses from the candidates, I am currently leaning toward um, Mr. Franz and Mr. Ettinger as um, the two candidates that I think can fulfill aspects of what we're looking for in different ways, but understanding um, the complexities of a five campus system it's not just the Twin Cities campus, it is all five campuses that we're looking at here. Understanding some of the key initiatives around public safety, um, our relationships with the legislature in different ways, our relationships with the community, understanding um, really having their arms around the size of the institution, um, not just dollar wise, but um, are wonderful faculty, staff, and students that all equate in that. Um, and, you know, Mr. Franz knows where we're at with MPAC 2025. He knows what our process is. He knows where our status is. He understands that and understands what needs, needs to be pushed along in the next year to keep that moving. Um, on the other hand, Mr. Ettinger um, has run a large organization um, with various interests within it, like a foundation and a research in institute, excuse me. And so um, those two are the two that um, I would put at the top of my list right now. All right, thank you very much. Regent Ruth, Ruth Johnson. Johnson. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, well, they were all excellent, I think, and uh, I would say that the two I think are probably most qualified uh, to lead things forward would be Senior Vice President Franz and, in a different way, Mr. Ettinger. And I th my thinking on this is that we already have Senior Vice President Franz, and he's doing a good job, and he has things to do. and having someone else as an interim would in no way change that. He still will be able to do the kind of work that we want him to do. So I don't think, so I think it's an opportunity to, instead of giving him two jobs or finding someone to fill in what he already knows where he's doing, that it might be wiser to choose somebody else who's from the outside, who has skill sets that none of the others do. Uh, and in, my, in that case, that would be Mr. Ettinger, in my opinion. I think he brings um, an interesting background. I think he's very smart. He's very articulate. A couple of the things that we know we want to do are communication with the public, communications with the legislature. And I think uh, Mr. Ettinger might be able to bring some, new, you know, in a one year kind of thing, some newer ideas, some new ideas, some different ways of approaching things that could be very beneficial <coughs> to the university. At the same time, we could continue to have uh, Senior Vice President France and other leadership in place. I think it's it's a unique opportunity and it's just something I would like to give serious consideration to. So at this point, I'll put um, those, both of those out, but I guess my preference would be 
uh, Ettinger. All right. Thank you. Uh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, tempted to use that pass, but I won't, Madam Chair. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I would agree that um, we don't really have bad options here, and um, there's pros for different reasons, but maybe I'll just be focused on where I'm leaning right now, and then as, you know, if, if we go elsewhere, I can speak more broadly on other candidates. Um, I, I was particularly impressed by Mr. Edinger. Um, obviously, the executive leadership experience speaks for itself. Um, you know, and again, maybe not, certainly not in the same setting, um, but the, the, I think the experience is certainly transferable and, and the challenges um, that, that, you know, senior leaders at, at that scale face um, are not that dissimilar. I do think, um, obviously the, obviously the, the, the obvious um, or, you know, one of the one of the things that Mr. Enger obviously lacks is the academic experience. I do think that um, actually, as most of the candidates talked about, um, a senior an executive leader is really m most supported by a team, right? And I think we we, we have that team in place here um, currently as it is, and and I, I think the Mr. Enger would be able to work with them and lean on them the other, another comment on the on the academic part it's not that that's not a main priority for me it absolutely is in my assessment that's where we're strongest right now i mean that's the part of the university at this moment where i i i wouldn't say i have no concerns i mean of course there's always issues going on but you know i'd say we're really strong we have things that we obviously need to pay attention to and whatnot, um, but we're strong there. We have strong leadership, you know, in the provost's office. And, you know, for, I think it's certainly, it certainly makes more sense for me in this interim role. I think it'd be a different conversation if we were talking about the more permanent role. So if you're talking about benefiting from executive leadership, this is, this is the opportunity to have it. Um, but obviously still revert back to our roots as a as an academic institution. Um, yeah, I'll, that's what I have for now, Madam Chair. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Regent Turner. Boy, I thought I'd have the advantage of going last. <laughs> <laughs> You're right in the middle nice of the room here <laughs> for us. <laughs> All right, so... Um, I agree with the concept that um, they were all fine candidates too, and, and they and they kept me awake all day. So that that is really cool. <laughs> um, and but um, and my um, friends and Mary, what's her? Sorry. Anyway, from Crookston, Chancellor from Crookston. Um, both both um, admirable. Sound like they are doing fantastic in the work that they are doing and appreciate uh, both of them for the jobs that they are doing. Um, I have to I have to say that my, I lean towards Enninger for various reasons. I like the idea at the very end with, with um, when it was question 12, that he actually had questions for us in the sense of those questions had to do with, because he's from rural Minnesota, he very much understands. And I felt like he had an affinity for our other, our outstate campuses or greater Minnesota campuses, I should say. I appreciated that. I appreciate the fact that he is, he has been involved with workers and labor. I appreciate the fact that he demonstrated to us that he has done lots of diff different uh, roles in his life and been able to transfer one for another and hit the ground running. Um, I like the fact that he is at a point in his life where he, I feel like he genuinely 
doing this to be able to serve the public. As probably all of them are, but I got that that sense of integrity from him that this is just something that he just feels like he just wants to serve the university. I um, so and I, I just think and and most importantly is his way that he comes across in public speaking. It's very straightforward, very understandable. And if we are looking for someone who can put the confidence back in the public and with the legislature, then we need to have somebody that can communicate in a straightforward manner and also have the ability to listen. And I feel like that's, that's the man that we need. Thank you, Regent Turner. Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, any of the candidates could do this job and do it well, but they would do it different. And um, it may surprise some people that um, 10 years ago, I'd only gone academic somebody who's internal, someone who, who could just walk right into the position. And I think things would be maintained. And um, the experience we've had with Myron France, I think reflects what we can also have with Jeff Ettinger is somebody from the outside, from a different, a different point of view, different uh, walk in life who comes into higher education, with some base knowledge, but bring something bigger. Um, and so my my two candidates are Myron Franz and Jeff Ettinger today for what we need now for one year. And I wouldn't say the same thing for the permanent position. For one year, I think we can learn a lot about ourselves, learn a lot about how to address these student issues, which um, Jeff Ettinger has done in a big way in um, local communities, the diversity walking the talk. Uh, I just think we're ready for a very different um, point of view that embraces the mission, yet brings us something fresh and different that we can build on and have some insights into ourselves as we move into the permanent presidency phase. All right, thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I'll keep this uh, brief because a lot of colleagues have said really insightful things. And so I really uh, appreciate this discussion and also would um, echo my thanks and appreciation to all of the candidates who took time to go through this process and all um, would be clearly qualified and shared a lot of really important information with us today. I would um, add my uh, support and preference for Mr. Ettinger. Uh, I think for, I, I particularly uh, associate uh, my thinking with Regent Davenport and Regent Ruth Johnson um, in terms of um, feeling that Mr. Ettinger would bring a fresh outside perspective with a broad body of experience, um, which he, I thought, reflected on in a thorough manner and very well during our uh, interview process. I think he would be supported by a very strong senior leadership team uh, that's in place. And that's how I'm thinking about this interim position as we um, as we soon start thinking about and talking about um, what we're looking for in a permanent president. Um, so I think Mr. Ettinger would bring a unique sense of ex uh, sense of experiences and perspectives. Uh, I also think um, in terms of what's reflected in our board priorities and the position profile, uh, some of the highlights including legislative relations and external um, perspective on the university. I think Mr. Ettinger would really be in a unique position to help us with that. Again, um, relying on and being in partnership, not only with the board, but the strong team of, of senior leadership we have in place on both the operation side and the academic side um, and everywhere in between, because it's not two tidy buckets, of course, but and not to mention, not to forget to mention research um, and outreach and just everything we do. And so, um, again, want to express my appreciation for the candidates, but just thinking about where how I think of this um, as a regent and wanting to be receptive to the opportunity I think we have in the next year. 
uh, that would be um, benefited from uh, Mr. Ettinger's service. So that's what I would uh, indicate at this time. Thank you, Chair Mayor. All right, thank you very much, Regent Hipsch. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayor. Uh, so this is, <clears throat> the only thing I can equate this to is uh, interviewing my three kids and saying, ask them, try to pick one and say, who's the best? Because <laughs> you know, that's, it's that difficult for, for me. Um, um, this is my first meeting with uh, Tom Sullivan, and I think he's just a tremendously great individual. And you know, and he did the university great things. And then you have uh, Mary, who I spent Saturday with at Crookston, and you know, she just does a great job with the students, and she does a great job with Crookston. And I feel like she's just really, really a great leader. And then you got Myron, who's Myron. Everybody loves Myron, and he does a great job. But um, I'm going to have to lean towards uh, Jeff Ettinger for, for what's been said uh, so far. And everybody said it kind of, I don't have to re-say it. I just really like his deep ties to the state. I like his uh, fact that his wife and his wife's parents went to the University of Minnesota. His four children got degrees from the University of Minnesota. I think that's really important because as you're making decisions for students and, and everyone else, that's a that's a really important the University of Minnesota is good enough for his kids. It's good, you know, and let's and I like what he's doing in uh, in the Wilmer area and uh, everywhere with getting all kids to go to college that want to with uh, with the community college down there and with uh, the scholarships that he's bringing into the U. And I, I think the, the last reason is I think to have some outside eyes on it. And I think you would uh, to look at the situation and just have some outside eyes on things that we could improve on. And to, I think the whole state's going to really embrace, embrace him for obvious reasons. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Regent Tarabi. Um, thank you. You don't know how many times I've been flip-flopping between <laughs> all the comments. So, um, so I uh, just had to give it a lot of thought um, about what 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 is most important, um, given that it's an interim position, and what's the readiness that we need uh, for somebody to kind of step in and things like that. So I just to want to echo the sentiment of thanks for all the four candidates for um, being willing to go through this process and for uh, being here in front of the board to answer uh, some of these questions. Um, and I too agree that all of them could, could lead in this interim period. So there's not a doubt about um, whether they could do the job because in fact, I think they could. Um, so the things that I was trying to really think through are one, um, feeling um, like um, relationships seem to be something that has come up over and over and really important. And so who, who um, demonstrated, I guess, or um, had um, in their interviews talked about how they would create that, um, knowing that uh, there is a variety of um, uh, stakeholders who have to be engaged, even though it's not a the permanent presidency being able to, I think, bring folks <laughs> into the fold felt really important. And then also who understood the position in terms of um, um, uh, creating um, um, that field for the next president to be able to kind of step in uh, in the best way. And so I, um, um, for the, for, for me, I think um, that my, um, I think um, uh, Myron could do it. Um, my main concern is really about what that would mean for everything else if we um, appoint Myron uh, interim. And um, so it's one of these things where we just have to make a choice and uh, think about what that might mean. Um, but I also really appreciated the perspective from the outside candidates. And I too um, thought that Jeff Enger um, was really succinct in his response. He had a very um, uh, um, 
he was able to kind of describe or talk about the ways in which he had engaged various stakeholders and um, how he created kind of an environment for people to be able to um, share their perspectives, even though at the end of the day, there's still a process uh, and a way to kind of make decisions. And so, um, so those are the two candidates that I am, uh, that are coming up top for me. Great, thank you. Um, Regent Gully. Um, so I've been <laughs> a regent for a week also, <laughs> but I've been thinking about this nonstop for the past week and, um, you know, thinking about what it, what matters and bringing on an interim president. Um, and I've also talked to a lot of legislators, I've talked to a lot of faculty members, I've talked to a lot of um, folks who are uh, stakeholders in the University of Minnesota community, and what I've heard over and over again is um, we need someone to keep things moving, we need someone who will keep faculty and staff um, feeling good in their roles and feeling like things aren't going off the rails, um, and we need, uh, we need someone who's not going to make a lot of um, big changes right now, but is going to help us through this transition as we pick a new president. And I think that's all really good advice. Um, so for me, all of the candidates had so many strengths and I was so grateful that they came and spent time with us. Um, uh, I leaned toward the internal candidates, both of them, um, because I just felt like they both had the breadth of knowledge about the university that would help them to just jump in and hit the ground running and um, bring us through this next year while we pick a new president. And I didn't think that they would have to um, do the work to like learn the university in the same way that the external candidates would. Um, yeah, so for me, the if I get two votes, then it's for the two internal candidates for um, France and Holt Claude. Thank you. Um, for myself, um, again, I, we've all said this, I, and I said it at the beginning of the remarks, uh, all of these candidates are outstanding, and as Regent Davenport said, they, they each bring something different to the table. They each, could, they each could do this job, and they'd each do it differently, um, and I think that's absolutely correct. Um, where I come from um, in terms of what I want for the coming year is to keep the momentum going that we currently have and, um, and the initiatives that we have. And I'd like to see a president who could support uh, those initiatives and uh, keep that momentum going. And that for me then um, drives my interest in the external candidates, both um, uh, Jeff Ettinger and Tom Sullivan, because that allows the existing team, which I think is doing such an outstanding job, um, Senior Vice President Franz, um, Mary Holtz Claus, to continue the excellent work that they are doing and to bring in another set of eyes and energy to support them in everything they are doing. So I find myself gravitating towards the external, looking at our external candidates um, over our internal candidates. I'd like to keep them in place and keep supporting them um, to do the work that they are currently doing. Um, then I, I look at, um, so for me, uh, if I'm looking at Jeff Ettinger, I'm looking at Tom Sullivan, and for me, um, while their styles, demeanor are somewhat different in terms of how they presented themselves. In, in some senses, they were very much the same. That each one of them, as I looked at the attributes, what we are looking for, each one of them shared those attributes. They, they recognized the importance of collaboration of, of, uh, with a variety of different groups, of creating teams, of creating relationships. Uh, going to the legislature, working in the community, each one of them um, in some senses were identical in terms of what they offered. It was just a different style in terms of how they got there. Um, 
I am not looking for someone, unlike my colleague to the left here and a couple other, I'm not looking for someone to do it differently this year. Um, I'm not looking for, um, yes, it's, it's advantageous to have a fresh set of eyes, but that's not what's driving my desire for what I want in the coming year as we get ready for bringing on a new president. I'm not looking for a fresh, I, well, I shouldn't say I'm not looking. On the one hand, I like the idea of a fresh perspective and getting a different lens, but I think, but I'm not looking for someone who's going to bring something totally different to the equation. And so at the end of the day, for me, Tom Sullivan brings in something new. He brings in something different. At the same time, he just brings in a wealth of background in higher education at every level that you could possibly want, plus having been away from the university, but involved on the national scene as well to bring in that outside perspective in terms of best practices for a university of this size. So um, both of them I'm interested in, but I find myself leaning towards Tom because of his background breadth and to the extent that I have received, you know, we all receive information, phone calls, et cetera, I know. But I think that there is um, widespread support by faculty for Tom who know him, who spent so much time here. Um, the fact that he was provost here for seven years, I, from what I understand, um, before Bob Brunick was provost and ultimately became president, I think the average tenure for a provost here was two years. Then Bob Brunix came in, it was five, and Tom was here for seven years, which I think says a lot about his success here at the university. And I think he can continue to bring that to the table. So I find myself leaning towards him. So, yeah, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair yeah. Mayor. And I just want to clarify, because I think if there is some misunderstanding about what I said about um, different. I didn't mean to come in and do things different. I meant bringing in a different perspective to add to the strengths that we have. Understand. Um, other comments having gone around the table once? People want to add. Yes, Regent Hipsch. Thanks, Chair. Well, I don't. I don't, I didn't hear anybody say that they wanted to go in a different direction in the next year. And I think all the all the candidates uh, would move us in the same direction. And I and I heard uh, Mr. Ettinger talk about that. You know, impact 2025 and, and not doing anything radical and and um, keeping 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 things moving ahead, like with farm and and. Uh, you know, and, and um, that's the first point. The second point is, is if we want to keep everything ahead, you know, just keep everyone in their positions. And I think that the, the strengths that he brings are on, on the in the legislature and on the farm project and in the in the uh, Sanford Fairview merger that could be really helpful at this point in time. So, thank you. Yes, Regent uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, uh, Chair Mayron. I would also add, you know. Part of what I was getting at was exactly the point that you made, uh, Chair, around um, keeping folks in place to keep that momentum going. Uh, there's a value to that. I think what, um, you know, just to add a little bit on to what Regent Hipsch was saying, um, and just to clarify my own standing as well, I, although I think other folks have done this fairly well already, which is, um, you know, Mr. Ettinger offered, it was, uh, Mr. Ettinger would offer uh, opportunity in some specific areas. Um, that I think would be helpful to us, um, which I talked about already, as opposed to, you know, at the end of the day, the continuity and the leadership is here with the board in partnership with um, the interim president in terms of vision, in terms of um, things that, you know, board priorities that will be clearly discussed uh, in our July retreat, which I think will be a really important exercise. Uh, and so that's a little bit of, of additional um, clarity that I would add to this conversation as well along the lines of where Regent Davenport started. Okay. Yes, Regent Gulley. Um, 
just based on where this conversation is going, I there is one reservation that I want to add, um, and it's not a personal reservation. It's not anything about a you know a character or anything. So I want to say that, but I, I, I have for a long time been really concerned about um, corporate influence in higher ed, and um, and sort of like the the moving or like this sort of movement this trend toward moving and looking at higher ed as as sort of a business when it's it's absolutely public sector it's you know this is our land grant institution it's a public entity and um you know i want to say of mr edinger that i was extremely impressed with his interview but that 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 for me is a big reservation and um, and it's not about his character in any way i think he seems like he has a lot of integrity and if he's the person we pick I'll be extremely excited to work with him, but I do feel like I need to say that publicly. Thank you. Other comments as we people reflect on each other's comments here? Yes, yeah, Regent one, Johnson. Yes. Thank you, Chair Mayor. Just to really to add into <laughs> Regent Davenport Barnes and Hipsch. Um, I think maybe uh, when we uh, were talking about difference of it and with Ettinger, it would be potentially different. It isn't that he wants to take us in a different direction at all. It's that he has different skill set. Maybe that's one way of looking at it. He has some skill sets that aren't really maybe in, in academia in the same way he's been out there doing things. And we think, I think those skill sets might be really useful to us in this time period as we're looking to uh, affect the, again, the, the public uh, discourse and the relationships in the legislature could just be helpful. And uh, not that he's going to take us in a different direction. And he, don't, he has already, uh, as Regent Hipshet said, to some research things with farm and other things where his experience has inter intersected with some of our research and ag and CFANS and other things that are actually kind of exciting. But I don't think that's what he's going to be driving. It's a corporate thing. I think he's just going to, we're asked, we're asked going to take his skill sets and help us do some things maybe better. Thank you. Other comments? People want to add here? All right, well, I'm, I'm listening to what I'm hearing here, so let me try this out on people and see. Um, I'm hearing um, strong support for Jeff Edinger from a variety of um, most of the regions here. In fact, um, I think all but one, so I'm seeing strong either in conjunction with another candidate or alone. Um, I'm hearing uh, there is some support um, for uh, Myron Franz as well, um, but not as strong as what I was hearing for uh, regarding Jeff Edinger. I'm hearing um, with respect to Chancellor Holtz Claus, I'm not getting that, I'm, that kind of support. I think that we all agree that she is an outstanding candidate. She's doing fantastic work, but it doesn't seem to be the right person for this position at this time. And I'm hearing a little bit of support, but not a lot of support for Professor Sullivan, um, um, not in comparison to what I'm hearing with respect to Jeff Edinger and to some extent with Myron France. So I, I, I'm trying to reflect back what I wrote down here and, and what's being expressed by everyone here. Is, am I reading the tea leaves right here? Do I have this wrong? Um, trying to get some sense from, are we be beginning to build consensus uh, in particular around Jeff Edinger? Yes, Regent Hill. I would say that's correct based on what everyone just said and what I heard. Anybody disagree, want to take a, um, let me, let me just ask a question. Obviously, I came out in favor of uh, Tom Sullivan, um, but I'd be interested in hearing with from my respective colleagues here. At least my concern, um, my main concern about Jeff Edinger is that um, his role in academia is lighter than the other candidates um, in terms of his connection to the university, or it's certainly different. Um, I might use the term lighter. And my concern is how well he will be accepted by faculty here, um, as opposed to 
the other three candidates, which clearly have ties to academia and the university, or both. Um, yes, and that that's a big concern for me, or I should say it's a concern. Yes, Regent Tad Johnson. Thank you. Um, yeah, in another life, I, as a congressional staffer, and there frequently would be business people elected from, uh, would come in expecting that the government, in this case, a university, could run <clears throat> as smoothly as a, as a business entity. And it doesn't quite work like that. It's, it's kind of like everything is built on relationships, which is what I heard from Mr. Sullivan. And we seem to be in a distinct minority there. Uh, but you know, I think as far as hitting the points of um, experience in leadership, experience as a scholar, and also um, you know, experience in, in uh, being a university president, I thought he had a lot to offer. Um, he kept his interview rather simple, and uh, to me, he, he falls into the category of um, one of my favorite books. It's called The Wise Men, and it's uh, people who advised, uh, they were sort of outside the government, but they advised presidents uh, from Harry Truman to LBJ uh, and on foreign policy, mainly the, between the World War II and the Cold War. And um, they were just sort of seen as elder statesmen who were not in it for um, any kind of glory, any kind of, uh, they've had a career. Um, they could simply be good stewards. And that's what I saw in Mr. Sullivan. He's, uh, doing this as, as I think everybody is for for public service, for the good of the state, et cetera. But um, he seemed like, uh, and I, I know I'm fighting a losing battle here, but he seemed like uh, uh, the sort of person who would be a good steward for a year. Regent Wheeler. Yeah, I'll just uh, say that, first of all, I couldn't think more highly of uh, Jeff Energy. I think he's he's a fabulous leader and a man of incredible integrity. And I think for the constituents involved, the faculty, staff, students, that the experience of, uh, of um, uh, Professor Sullivan would resonate with them, to your, to your point, significantly. Just want to emphasize, too, it seemed to be a... a uh, held belief that, you know, um, Mary Holtzclaws and Myron Franz are doing exceptional work in the jobs that they're in, and we actually concern about moving that, so I'll say that too. So, but as I'm looking at external um, uh, candidates and the constituents uh, involved, and also that there's not a, you know, this is a short time period relatively, you know, in higher ed, so there's not a significant ramp up for somebody like this and a uh, gentleman like uh, Mr. Edinger, and I think you made this point in our last meeting, might be suited for a more permanent role where there's more, more time and more runway. Uh, the runway here is relatively short, which is another reason why I would support uh, Professor Sullivan, um, although uh, Jeff Edinger would be a very close second. Uh, Regent Turner, thank you. Thank you, Regent. Regent Turner. Um, I, I, I believe um, Edinger made it very clear that he knows that it's just a year. Um, Penny just said it, uh, Regent Wheeler just said that it, that year goes very fast. I think from our experience, um, the new regents on the board with our experience um, hearing from many stakeholders leading up to this process, that there's a specific a specific task, and I have to just reiterate back to what I was saying before. There, there, in the eyes of the public, there appears to be a little bit of a disconnect right now. Whether that's true or not, um, that I haven't been on the board long enough to know that. But I do feel that Edinger has the skills with the community, with the corporate world, 
in a corporate world in the good sense, as far as bringing in um, new business interests, new, I think he talked about new research interests. Um, and he, he is definitely kind of at the end of his career where I don't feel like in any way, shape or form, his business background is going to, uh, I think he truly, truly wants to do this as a service to a system that he, lo he truly loves. And I just think that um, with the legislature, you know, he, ran, he, he was, a, a, he was a endorsed by the legislature, uh, one of the parties uh, to run for a congressional office. And so, you know, right there, he's got lots of relationships that we need right now. And so I just think in this interim, and I also feel that he would very much be on board supporting our, our new president be an academia for sure, you know, and have all those characteristics that are so, so necessary. But I think he's, the perfect choice for a transition for the, the specific task that we saw out there on the, for want of a better word, campaign trail, you know, leading up to this region position. Thank you. I just want to uh, pick up on something that um, Regent Wheeler talked about that I didn't mention, and that is the um, given this is such a short time period that this individual will hold this position, that part of the other, there were there are two other reasons that I found um, Tom Sullivan was good, my first choice on this. One is he will uh, require very little wrap up, uh, not only because of his former ties to the university, um, but because of his role uh, as um, as a president of another university and continued involvement in education. And he's obviously very knowledgeable, you could tell, as he gave answers and talked about Impact 25, et cetera. Um, and the second reason is, um, as I thought about at least my goal or my interest of keeping our current team in place, I think that the synergy between Tom Sullivan and in particular Myron Franz I think it would be just a dynamo team um, to advance all of the initiatives and to be involved in the legislature. I think Tom was very strong in outlining not only his role with the legislature here, but in Vermont, uh, where he was called upon, as he talked about, to all of the presentations to the legislature were by the president, by himself. So this is not a person who is shies away from involvement in the public sector or knows how to talk to the public sector. And as he emphasized, he knows how to build relationships and that that's number one and foremost. So he may not have current relationships with uh, individuals here at the legislature, but I think he, in connection with Myron and our team, could just be doing an outstanding job over at the legislature and he could absolutely support him, uh, what Myron is doing over there. So that was uh, a couple other reasons that I wanted to share why Tom is my first choice uh, for the president and, um, and um, Jeff would be my second choice. Regent Davenport. Thank you. I want to go back to, I think, an important element that uh, Regent Ruth Johnson talked about, and that's transferable skills. And I want to also say permanent position, academic experience in academia, hours spent in academia, yes. One year interim where we have some pressing issues going on, Fairview Sanford, um, relationships. I heard listen, listen, listen um, from, from all of our candidates. And I heard that really strongly um, from Attinger. But I want to address the term light in academia. Light in academia, hours spent, not a tenure faculty, didn't go through the traditional pathway to a presidency uh, is okay 
come and and I'd say come it for me, who's pretty traditionalist in terms of career paths in higher education. Um, I, I'd say he's certainly not light in the skills that he brings to us and in terms of what we need right now. And the ramping up piece, um, and I've had ramping up time in the traditional career pathway. Um, it's important, but again, looking at um, longer term versus short term, I was an interim, and that was a short defined term. I knew what I needed to do to go in there to get the place ready, um, and our place, I think, is ready. When you look at academics and you look at where we're headed toward in our finance stability, but we're not ready in perhaps public perception, public confidence, public trust, and I, I see that as a top priority um, with, we, we have really strong leadership, so. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, Regent Kenyon. Uh, thank you, I, I will pick up where Regent Davenport um, left off. Um, I think earlier I said, you know, our issues aren't in, in the academic side, which I still generally believe, but I. I do want to acknowledge we obviously have challenges there, right? We talk about enrollment and, and, and some other issues, but just to echo, you know, my previous points, um, you know, that's where the full team comes in, you know, from the provost uh, to the to the chancellors, to the to the FCC um, and, and all the other stakeholders. And I, you know, I would just say the, the president, interim or permanent, acts on the direction of the board and under the authority of the board right and um you know when we talk about direction or vision or change i mean all that will be at the direction maybe maybe the way they go about it but what they're doing um for the most part especially when we're, we're, we're thinking high level directional thematically i mean that's at the direction of the board um and and that's why you go back to 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 the ability to you know, it's more that to lead a team, deal with conflict, deal with complex things. And as Regent Davenport pointed out, when we talk about some of those pressing issues, um, they do lend themselves to, to having someone like Mr. Edinger. And then I would comment on the legislature point, not really specific, not even talking about any specific candidate, um, but, but overall, you know, that's a priority maybe not the highest one for me um and that's because not because i don't think we need to improve that relationship but because i think we need to improve that relationship right i mean that, that'd be a lot to to base your one year interim off of um when uh regent gully will be here for the next six years um, <laughs> i don't know my fate but um <laughs> but, uh, no i mean you know i we have to we have to take a more active role in, in improving those relationships we certainly can't have a candidate that would hurt them um you know they, they need to be we need to feel confident that they can represent us in those settings and and build those relationships to a certain extent but that wouldn't be the driver um for me i fully agree that um i think i'll be here long enough for the permanent search um that that has to be an academic right that that has to be someone with that deep knowledge and experience and right or wrong i mean there are people um there are stakeholders who specifically and purposely want what we've characterized as an outside look right and and i think there's there's pros and cons both ways um i i'm not i'm not one who believes that um academia is i don't know way out of way out of line and, and you know needs to be completely fixed uh that's not I wouldn't characterize myself that way, but we there's room for improvement. And I think if if we were to and we don't have to whether now or later, but if we were to consider getting that outside perspective, for me, it would it would really have to be in that short defined one year period. Um, and I think that's the opportunity here. Thank you. Any further comments by any regents here? I'll just make a comment. Yes, Regent um, Hipsch. Chair Mayor, 
I think we have to look at, you know, the mission statement of, of the state and, um, you know, we, it's here to serve the whole state, you know. The faculty do great things, our students are very important, but also we need to serve the whole state in terms of extension and research and, and I think that that's, uh, I think that that's really important in this day and age because as, as more and more uh, higher education costs are, are paid for by philanthropy versus government, we're going to need to we're going to need to have those relationships, and I think that that's a that's another area that uh, Mr. Ettinger can really help is with is with the philanthropy over the next year. He's proven success in that area. Okay, thank you. Based on what I'm heard, continue to hear, I, there seems to be some strong support for Jeff Ettinger. Did anyone hear anything differently or wish to make any additional comments? Well, uh, appearing that I'm reading the room correctly, then I would entertain a motion to approve the resolution contained in the docket with uh, Jeff Edinger selected as the interim president of the University of Minnesota, subject to reaching agreement on contract terms and approval by the board. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? It has been moved and seconded that Jeff Enninger be selected as the interim president. Any further discussion? If there are no further questions or comments, we will vote on this via roll call. Mr. Steves, if you would please call the roll. On the resolution, Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. Yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Gully. No. Regent Gully votes no. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson. Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson. Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Tayurabe. Yes. Regent Tayurabe votes yes. Regent Turner. Yes. Regent Turner votes yes. Regent Verhalen. Abstained. Regent Verhalen abstains. Regent Wheeler. Yes. Regent Wheeler votes yes. Chair Mayron. Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. The motion passes. It is 10 yes, one no, one abstention. I want to thank all four of our finalists, and I will say we look forward to an opportunity to visit with the interim president, Jeffrey Ettinger, in the very near future. Thank you, everyone, for your participation in the special meeting. There being no additional business before the board today, this meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned. Thank you.